Okay, guys, um, we're going to get started. We were having a little few technical issues. Sorry for the delay. Uh, we're going to start our bill hearings today with Senate Bill 634, Senator Mouts, who I know is here. We've got actually three Mouts bills in a row. Uh, Senator 634, I've got um, a few sp sponsor panelists I'm going to bring up if that is okay with you. I've got um, Captain Robert Newberry. Is Captain Newberry here today? Okay, sir. That's the only designate. We do have some other uh, witnesses who signed up favorable, but I could bring them up if you don't mind, just to, for efficiency. They're all signed yep. up straight favorable. So uh, James Mullen, Mr. Mullen here, uh, Herman Harrison, Robert Brown. I'm sorry. He's got oral. He's here. He's very switched, yeah. Um, okay, those are the only witnesses on this bill, Senator Mouts. Um, it's all yours. You've got the time you need to present Senate Bill 634. Uh, Chairman and Committee, uh, Johnny Mouts, uh, Senator for District 37. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you for having us. We're gonna, this is a this Senate bill I'm presenting today, Senate Bill 634. Uh, this is not the first uh, introduction for Senate Bill 634. It's been introduced on um, multiple occasions, um, multiple sessions in the past. While I was in the House of Delegates, um, right to the point, this legislation would update two taxes. It would increase something called the inspection tax, which is levied on oysters. This is a tax on oysters. And the inspection tax is, is levied on oysters that are taken out of the state of Maryland. It's currently 30 cents. Um, this bill would change that to a dollar. And it would also um, change the severance tax. And the severance tax refers to the fee that's or the tax is charged charged when you remove an oyster from the bay and put it in a basket for sale or consumption and that would raise that from one dollar to two dollar um, the money that's generated for this tax is used to purchase oyster shell the oyster shell is then used in the bay to repopulate our oyster population uh, it has been a phenomenally successful program uh, the adjustment of this tax is way out of date. We are not um, uh, we are not uh, up to par with some of our neighboring states, um, and it's a uh, it's critically important at this juncture where we are with um, oyster repletion efforts and oyster restoration efforts that we do whatever we can to fund uh, the purchasing of oyster shell. I'd ask the committee for a favorable vote. And there is a problem with the bill. The bill does not include Baltimore County. We'll have an amendment that will add the Baltimore County Shell Committee so they can also participate in uh, in uh, in uh, um, receiving some funds from this. That was an old iteration, and the result, that was because of a rushed introduction to meet the bill deadline. So thank you. Okay, is Captain Newberry here? Uh, you can see we're the designated as sponsor panelists. So you're going to go first, and every each of you gets two minutes, okay? Uh, Mr. Chairman, my name is Captain Robert Newberry. I'm chairman of Delmarva Fisheries Association. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, it is important that this bill uh, needs to go through. As uh, Senator Mounts had stated, it has been quite a significant amount of time since this, uh, I'm thinking you're going back to the 1950s, to the point where this uh, money hasn't been increased. And our numbers are going up as far as our uh, harvest of oysters. But the problem is our shell supply, the price of that is increasing. It's increased almost threefold in the past five years. Right now, um, for what uh, they're receiving down there with that severance tax at 30 cents, we're getting it delivered back up here for $8.50. So, you know, we need that money to move forward so that we can keep purchasing shell. And there is a, a problem with shell, too. I mean, it's at, uh, you know, the only person that we're really getting shell from is one individual down in Virginia. And uh, this would help us get more shell, but it is very important that, you know, this bill goes through. And it's not a bill that is coming from the general public or the general fund. It is generated by what we do in our industry. The industry is specifically asking the people, the watermen and the oystermen are asking to have this increased upon them. 
so that they can continue with a sustainable fishery. It wouldn't be coming from the general fund. It wouldn't be coming out of your pocket. It'd be coming out of the waterman's, basically the waterman's pocket. And then maybe the other end might be pulled by the consumers, but it would majority of it initially up front comes out of the waterman. So if it's a $2 tax, if our oysters are 48 a bushel, we'll be getting 46. So we're willing to, you know, put that money in, into the fact that, you know, we're wanting to build our industry. I mean, and we couldn't get this through under the prior administration because there was, you know, no new taxes. But we had a lot of problems convincing that fact. But, I mean, the fact is, it's paid by us. It's not from the general public. So I ask for a favorable on this bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Could you just maybe pass the mic to the gentleman to your right and tell us your name? And then, again, you've got two minutes yeah, uh, my name is uh, Jeff Harrison, and I am president of the Talbot Watermen's Association. I represent about 250 oystermen in Talbot County. I, I just want to say pretty much the same thing he did. It, is, it does show a commitment by the public fishery that, you know, we do want to pay our fair share. Uh, the price of shell, like you said, has gone up uh, just this past year, a dollar, the year before a dollar. And it, this uh, money is much needed. And so I want you to ask uh, ask for a favorable on this. Okay, no. thank you, sir. Uh, Robert T. Brown, President of the Maryland Waterman Association, Chair, members of this committee. Uh, this is an investment that the commercial waterman, the oysterman itself, that is putting back into the business. Uh, we, we need this increase because, like uh, Captain Rob Benutbury said, the price of shells is up. And as you know, everything in the economy has went up over the past few years. Uh, th these funds will be carried out, they go down to our oyster committees. Our oyster committees are, uh, it's 11 of them in the county that uh, boarded water. And in the, each county has a committee and they are voted in by the people in their committee who actively oyster. And then they, they get together and at the end of the, this time of year, right now they're going through it, trying to decide where they're going to plant and reinvest money into each one of their counties or in another county, next to them if they choose to. So this is money that is gener would be generated by the oyster community, and we want to have it so we can reinvest into our livelihood. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Jim Mullen with the Maryland Oystermen Association. We're also in favor of this proposed legislation. Uh, at the end of the day, it really provides more financing toward in-water projects, uh, that would accumulate either additional oyster shells, uh, oyster spat on shells, or just generally seed. So uh, the more overboard in the bay, the better for the a healthier bay. So with that, uh, we're in favor of it, and the financing will go a long way moving forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you to the panel. Uh, any questions for the panel or for the sponsor, Senator Mounts? Uh, seeing none, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill 634. Thank you, sir. Um, next, going to move to Senate Bill uh, 637. Senator Mounts, you're up again, and I've got um, okay. I've got one sponsored panelist. Maybe it's some of the same folks. So, well, I've got Russell uh, De Dashiel. Shield. I'm sorry, Dashiel. And similarly, I do have some other witnesses. Captain Newberry, you're signed up on this one. Favorable, James Mullen. Um, Herman Harrison and Robert Brown again. So those are all favorable witnesses signed up in person. Okay. So if you can all take a table and center mounts, it's all your Senate Bill 637. Uh, thank you, Chairman, distinguished committee members. It's an honor to present Senate Bill 637. Not unlike the previous bill, uh, this is not the first iteration of, uh, of this legislation. Uh, we've got uh, some of the uh, greatest minds on this issue. It's a complicated issue. Uh, the bill creates a system that would alleviate what is now the death penalty for um, oyster uh, violations. Years ago, uh, the state of Maryland decided that uh, the uh, violations on the bay for, for different um, oyster infractions were intolerable, um, and they came up with a system that resulted in a permanent lifetime revocation. It was a firm, hard line. It was strictly enforced, and in many instances, in not many. In some instances, individuals who made a mistake or they uh, broke the law at a young age, not understanding the consequences, were forever prohibited from participating in the fishery. That was years ago. Many bad actors have been removed from the fishery. 
Um, and the uh, ethos, the business, the Bay, the industry has changed dramatically. And uh, along those lines, we've tried to come to a point to where we could propose an opportunity where if someone were removed from the fishery, that there would be an opportunity where they could uh, regain the ability to join the fishery. Uh, we wanted to do that in a very careful um, uh, manner that demonstrated the individual was in fact, suited to be join a fishery, uh, had demonstrated they're able to uh, follow the law and that uh, we want to help try to promote the industry. Um, the bill is, there are many provisions of the bill that are going to be discussed today. We are accepting amendments and suggestion, suggestions to try to perfect this. Uh, so we're open to different ideas. I know there's an opposition panel also. Um, with that, Chairman, I would like to let the uh, expert witnesses take take the bill from there. Sure. Maybe we could uh, start with Mr. DeShield because you were designated as one of the sponsors, formal, formally designated. So we'll start with you, sir. Thank you, sir. I, uh, I was 45 years as a lawyer, uh, and I practiced on the eastern shore in every county uh, of the eastern shore of Maryland, with the exception of Cecil County. I tried many, many cases. I tried many cases for watermen. I defended a number of them. And I was very familiar with all of the AGs assigned to the uh, uh, Department of Natural Resources. I've got the greatest respect for them. I think that 4-1210 uh, <clears throat> was a well-intentioned, effective piece of legislation in 2011. It broke up sanctuary harvest. It broke up uh, night uh, oystering. Uh, but then, it, then there was a flaw in it. The flaw was that if somebody were uh, charged and proven by preponderance of the evidence, more likely than not, in an administrative hearing within 90 days, then they lost their license forever. This is a redemption bill that allows uh, a chance, a second chance for someone uh, uh, to regain their uh, ability to work in the oyster fishery after five years and after education. There could be some other uh, provisions added to give the department some additional discretion but what it does is it, it makes it fair. As I said, I was a lawyer. Bad lawyers in the state of Maryland, the bad ones who are disbarred for theft and breaches of trust, oftentimes are allowed the, the, the ability to be readmitted, to petition for readmission. I don't think you should treat watermen any less. Okay, why don't you hand it either way, your, your choice. Okay. So Tell us, repeat your name. Uh, Robert T. Brown, uh, President of the Maryland Water Association, Chair and members of this committee. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're looking at in this is Patuxent River, for example. It's about a, two miles wide. There's a buoy on one side of the river and a buoy on the other side. And they're probably 10, 10 12 inches in diameter. And on one side of that, that line that goes there, you can patent on. The other side, you can hand tong and dive. If you go across that line, you can lose your license for life. And that's not right because that's just human error can happen in that because it's so far apart and it's only two buoys, one on each side. You can hardly see the one on the one side when you're working on the other. And for a person to lose their livelihood for even this way for five years is bad. Uh, we think that it's it's time that it's revisited and a person who has made some mistake has had five years to reconsider what he has done in the past and hopefully he's rehabilitated and can come back into the seafood industry. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Jim Mullen with the Maryland Oyster Association. We're also in favor of this bill. Uh, Similar to what Delegate Mount said, the industry's kind of policed themselves over time to weed out the bad actors, been successful with that, similar to any other industry. Um, you know, we've evolved into a society of second chances. And I think in this case, after five years, um, you know, somebody can petition to be allowed back into the fishery. And I think also to Delegate Mounts's point, when you folks huddle up to uh, debate this issue is really from our perspective, we're looking for some type of educational rehabilitation program or avenue. And whatever you folks can come up with 
and working with the Department of Natural Resources, say, okay, what is most probable? What can we do similar to any other um, rehabilitation program in the state, whatever it may be? So hopefully when you guys huddle up, you can come up with something and work with the good delegate. Thank you. He, he got a promotion to the Senate. Yeah, you know, just, <laughs> just a rem reminder there. No, no biggie. Okay, sir? Yeah, uh, Jeff Harrison. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I know of a situation in, in Talbot County. It's it's very similar. And this uh, boy was, uh, was about 25 years old, had a couple of young kids, and he was actually in the Miles River in a test area that you could power dredge on. And one of the violations um, that you could do is if you're using the wrong um, equipment in, in, a, in an area, it's automatic revocation. Well, at the time that he got caught or the lawman come to him and he said, well, you were over the line. He said, no, I wasn't over the line. In the same situation, it was buoys way apart. And so they kind of worked it out. He said, well, if you dump a bushel overboard, he only had four bushel oysters on the boat. He said, I won't write you a ticket. So he did that. And then about a week later, the officer come to him and he said, I talked to my superior officer. He said, I have to write you a ticket. So the boy took the ticket, went to court. His lawyer, there was a case ahead of him, he had the same guy and he got a PBJ. And he said, do you want to do that? It was no fine. He said, yeah, I'll take the PBJ. But what he didn't realize is when he took that PBJ, he was admitting his guilt. And so when he went in front of the DNR board, they took his license for life. So it was his first ticket ever, one charge, and he lost his license. So that's the type of people that we're talking about. It's not the guy who continually has broken the law. Those guys don't deserve, we don't want, as watermen, we don't want them on the water. They give us a bad name. But this boy, he ended up now he is perch fishing in the wintertime and he clams for as long as he can from spring to uh, late fall. But he would really like to be able to go oystering. Oystering is really good right now. He has a family and uh, it, this thing is really for him. So I asked for a favorable on this please. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Captain Robert Newber. I'm chairman of Delmarva Fisheries Association. Um, you've heard about everybody on the panel here talking about, you know, gentlemen that have been caught and that have to go in front of this uh, basically review board at DNR. Um, let's change the gears a little bit. Um, I mean, we all probably know at least one or two or three people that have had a DWI. Um, we had a situation where a young lady had a DWR that died right up in front of our farm that ran over two people. She had her license suspended, killed both of them, had her license suspended for six months, had to take a class. She's back now driving for the post office. So these aren't what I call horrendous, you know, horrible issues that these watermen have created. I mean, the bad eggs, yeah, there, there's a lot of bad eggs out there. And you know, a lot of them are no longer working on the water, but there are cases where people have done a minimal offense. They plead, you know, make a plea deal and get a PBJ. Next thing you know, they're in front of the, the administrative review board at DNR. Their license is gone. You know, that to me, that's double jeopardy anyway. But, you know, I just look at the facts that, you know, in society now, there's a lot of people that make big mistakes and have bad mistakes, but they're still in society. And to take somebody out, and we did have one client that was 58 years old, worked on the water for 40 years, never had a ticket in his life, had one violation with restrictive gear. He's no longer working on the water. And, you know, just to let you know, my age is the average age of watermen, 65 years old. So we have young guys that are coming up that really don't know, you know, they're learning as they go along and they make a mistake. Well, you could be 21 years old and lose your license for life. So um, I vote for favorable on this bill. If we've got to have like a committee set up, like a defensive driving course, like you do to get your license back. Cool. We're good with that. So I ask for a favorable vote on this bill. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to everybody. Uh, any questions for any of the panelists or sponsors, Senator Mouts? Question. Yes, Senator Simon Air. Thank you. Senator Mouse, nice to have you here. Congratulations on the promotion. Thank you. Um, this issue has been before us a lot. Um, I've been on this committee, I think it's my 13th year. So I'm familiar with this issue. And I think I actually put a bill in to help with the hearing process to make sure the timing worked out. Um, I'm hearing some things that sound conflicting, though. I hear, you know, it was a person who did this. Um, offense and they didn't know about it and so forth. But in the code, I believe it says they knowingly did it. That is one of the standards for this to go into place. So one, they have to know about it. Um, the other thing I hear is that, you know, there were bad actors and we got rid of them. And now we're just coming back for these people who didn't really do too much. 
So my question one is in this legislation, would it allow those bad actors to come back? Is there anything prohibiting that in this legislation? Well, sir. I think one of, one, of, one of Senator Mounts's bills that he uh, sponsored before the House, on which I testified, uh, had a discretion um, provision with regard to the department's ability to exercise discretion to preclude some of the bad actor types. That could be, I think, quite easily added to this uh, as a preface to one of the sentences in subparagraph E. What I did want to say, and, and uh, what a number of these panelists have, have shown is, knowing violation is knowing violation by preponderance of the evidence. Courts, judges, uh, administrative law judges, and uh, officers can make mistakes. Um, they are making observations on the exact position of a boat sometimes from a half a mile away. That's about from where you sit to the TAWS office building. Uh, they use spotter scopes, they use lots of things. Uh, a, a number of the instrumentalities um, are faulty. Uh, you sort of get a drumhead court martial and a number of the bad people deserve that, but most of them are gone. Uh, you're, you've got 90 days, you go to the district court, you then go to an administrative law hearing. Usually uh, uh, the AL, ALJ hears your case before the district court does. So the situation is that, yes, knowing in a, an administrative law hearing might merely mean a mistake that is incorrectly interpreted by bad data, odd observations, courts, judges, people make mistakes. We all do. Lawyers do, legislators do. What we're saying is that, that let them have a vehicle of redemption. And I think it's a good idea for the department to also exercise discretion for people who don't deserve redemption. Uh, and I think that could be quite easily added into a subparagraph E with just a, a phrase or two. So what I'm hearing is potentially the Senator would work on an amendment because as the bill, st as the bill stands today, all those bad actors <clears throat> come right back in. Is that correct? And to answer your question, yeah, the bill does not uh, 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 dictate which applicants can come back. And we could easily put together an amendment that's been proposed in past iterations that would filter out, you okay. know, repeat offenders and things that would raise flags. But also the point of the way this bill is drafted, we try to make it shorter and to the point is that the discretion is held by the department, you know, with the advice of the attorney general's office. Um, so even with political pressure and things like that, because we all know what happens, you know, you have problems with DNR, so you call your senator, or your delegate and that sort of thing. Um, and, and so having the attorney general's office involved adds another layer of um, of uh, of uh, um, reliable. Uh, Is that a, in a the bill? Significant layer the attorney reliable. general? Uh, that, no, that's the process for getting the. Uh, um, for, in I know the, for the hearing. In the application for. Um, Hold on one second. Well, that was my next question. So I'll just lead right into it if it's okay, Chair. So what I saw, it, it's it's unclear to me. It basically says the department shall require an applicant to be reinstated subject to the completion of the course. So is that they shall, okay, I finish this course, they shall be reinstated. I don't see the discretion. And if there is, where is that in the bill? How uh, will the department? What state the question one more time? So reading the language as far as reinstatement, it says the department shall require the applicant to complete the course to reinstate them. I don't see the discretion. Maybe it's intended, but I don't see that in the new language that they have discretion once they complete the course okay. to say, no, we're not going to let you back in. Well, we can, I can, I'd be happy to put together an amendment that would clarify that. Okay. Um, and, and also, I didn't mention this in my opening testimony, but should this be approved and enacted, we request an amendment that would state that anyone who was reinstated, that they would go in the back of the line uh, to apply for a license because there's a waiting list to get a license. So they had, would have had a license, lost the license, reapplied if they're eligible, uh, gone, taken the course, if they're reinstated, then they would go in the back of the line and they would have to wait their turn to, uh, to be able to acquire a license. And the last thing, I am sympathetic to the PBJ, um, I don't know if there's some educational component to let people know by doing that they're they're setting themselves up for lifetime 
revocation um, because I don't think that's fair as well either. So yeah. that may be some other consideration you put in there. Maybe I'll do that for my bill for next year. There you go. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Any additional uh, questions for the panel or for the sponsor? Okay. Seeing none. Um, we do have a, uh, two uh, witnesses signed up unfavorable. Allison Colden and uh, David Sikorsky signed up unfavorable. And so if you two could come up here. And Ms. Colden, why don't you uh, when you get to, why don't you lead off and then we'll go to Mr. Sikorsky and each of you get two minutes. Ready? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Dr. Allison Colden, Senior Fisheries Scientist with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, here today in opposition to Senate Bill 637. This bill would weaken penalties for oyster poaching by allowing convicted, convicted poachers to reapply for an oyster harvest authorization after five years. In terms of discretion, I wanted to run through the process. In order for a revocation to occur, a person would first have to be caught. A resources police officer would have to be confident in, enough in their assessment of the activity to write a ticket. A prosecutor would have to choose to bring that case to court. And then the judge would have the discretion in making the ruling. Not only that, the uh, prosecutor must demonstrate not only that the violation occurred, but again, that the violator knew what they were doing was wrong and did it anyway. After a revocation, there is an appeals process in which the final decision can be reviewed by a judge. The numerous steps in the process and high burden of proof mean that very few revocations occur, and on an annual basis, information from DNR indicates that three revocations per year total occur, and not solely for oyster violations. As mentioned, under current law, there is no process for the reinstatement of licenses. That reflects the types of violations that are subject to lifetime revocation. These are five very specific violations which were considered egregious and in need of a strong deterrent to encourage people not to poach in sanctuaries, outside of time, over MDE lines, which is a public health issue, so on and so forth. I will note that several years ago, this body also changed the law so that it wasn't revoking your title fish license, solely your oyster authorization. So these folks do have the opportunity to continue waking a living on the water, just not in the oyster fishery where their violations occurred. And finally, every year, uh, participants receive a shellfish closer book and have access to an app, which helps them um, orient themselves relative to important management boundaries. So with that, I urge your unfavorable report. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is David Sikorsky. I'm the Executive Director of Coastal Conservation Association, Maryland. We are largely a recreational fishing organization, but also uh, have members uh, throughout the state and throughout the country that, that focus on the, the uh, proper use of our natural resources and the science-based management of them. As Dr. Colden hit on a number of important points um, regarding the process for overseeing natural resource law um, and adjudicating it, I think it's important to recognize that harvesting a natural resource is a privilege. It is for me as a recreational angler, it is something that I'm, that I'm lucky to have been introduced to in this Chesapeake Bay that we all love so much. Those are the members that I represent. People that don't have the opportunity to necessarily work on the water, even though we do have watermen in our ranks and our membership. Um, but what does that mean? Shouldn't all Marylanders have an opportunity to enter into these fisheries and, and use this privilege, whether it be for commercial gain or for recreational gain? That is our charge here is to manage public natural resources for the benefit of the public today and into the future. And with that, we need firm laws because nobody that's given an opportunity to fish and then breaks the rules repeatedly goes through the process Dr. Colden mentioned should be, be able to continue to hold a seat that some other well-meaning individual may want to enter into the fishery. We have these consistent issues of people of, 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 um, of barriers for people to enter into these, these industries in our state that are you know, fantastic and in a, an important part of our culture and our heritage. And I think it's important to recognize that when a revocation occurs, that individual has had their opportunity in, in court. And as we've seen discussed here today, there may be a process in which DNR can oversee this. But as um, wearing other hats I have, like the chair of the Sport Fisheries Advisory Commission and being heavily involved in DNR, I know they do not have capacity now to do the work we want them to do. So I'd like to see this bill have an unfavorable report at this time and work through what really needs to be done to give those a few individuals their opportunity again, but not the bad actors, because I can't see the change at this point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Simonary. 
thank you for your testimony. As we said, we've been going over this many years. Um, you know, over the years, we've seen some really egregious cases. And I think Sen Senator Frosch at the time and, and some others were putting in some legislation to deal with that. But I also feel I'm looking for the balance because I do feel the redemption portion of somebody. It's their first offense, mm -hmm. first time caught um, or a very young person. Do you see any way to allow discretion for a reinstatement for some people while keeping the really bad actors off? Just want to comment on that first. I think um, before we look at reinstatement, as as Dave and others have touched on, there is a wait list. There are folks who want to get into this industry who, um, you know, are have not even had the opportunity to do anything wrong. Um, and I would really like to see a stronger education on the front end for people who are entering our industries, people who are moving to Maryland, perhaps, and, and joining a commercial fishery. There needs to be stronger education so that folks know, like you said, Senator, before the PBJ issue. Um, to me, that sounds like poor legal advice that that person was given. And that is incredibly un unfortunate, but that's an issue of, of education and people not knowing the seriousness of what they're up against. And so I would definitely be supportive of additional education so people know, one, which violations do result in revocation. Um, and also, when you are in that type of situation, what what those types of plea deals or, or, or different outcomes could mean for them. Because again, I think as long as people know that on the outset, then, you know, they have that in the back of their minds when they are when they're out on the water. Um, and I do want to just quickly touch on one other thing with respect to um, uh, the, the limits. For example, there are um, geographic limits. So if you go over the line just a little bit, um, you're just over 100 feet, 50 feet, you're subject to a different part of the code um, than if you go over more than 250 feet. So you got to be well within a boundary you're not supposed to be in before you would be subject to a revocation. And so those are the types of things that I feel like you could better educate folks before they come into the fishery or on an annual basis so that we don't have these, these issues moving forward. Okay, any additional questions uh, for the panel? Okay, seeing none, uh, that concludes the bill hearing on uh, Senate Bill 637. And we're gonna go to the third of three bills from Senator Mounts. Next up, Senator Mounts, Senate Bill 638. Um, your sponsor panel witnesses are Captain uh, Newberry again, Robert Newberry and, uh, and Mucci Gilmer. Is Mr. Gilmer here? Okay, we've got some other witnesses signed up again in person, some, some of the folks from previously. How about uh, Herman Harrison? Is Mr. Harrison here? Um, Okay, then we've got some favorables with amendments. Why don't we keep, uh, let's keep it with just the straight favorables and Robert Brown uh, is also straight favorable and then we'll go to a few favorable with amendments, okay? Okay, Senator, it's all your Senate Bill 638. Uh, Chairman, committee members, thank you for your patience this afternoon. This is the last of the three bills. Uh, this is a really important bill. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of really good testimony, and I, I expect we'll have to bring an amendment for this legislation also. It deals with SAV, subaquatic vegetation. A couple of years ago, it was brought to the attention of the Department of Natural Resources that it had not updated its, uh, uh, its, its markers for, SA, for subaquatic vegetation. Um, uh, lines were put out, uh, markers, buoys were placed to... Uh, quarantine off subaquatic vegetation. Subaquatic vegetation is critical for the bay's ecology. Um, it uh, filters the water. It does a number of very good things. And we're trying to promote and protect what's these SAVs. However, the system in place right now for delineating what is an SAV area and what's not an SAV area um, is using information or data that's two to three years old. Now, SAV is ephemeral. And I looked that up in the diff dictionary because I've heard the word ephemeral associated with SAV many times. I wanted to say that publicly on a recorded line, but it's ephemeral. That means it, it lives a short distance. It, it, it grows and, and lives a short time and then dies and then it moves. 
So SAV is, is, is not, it's a lot like other species in the bay, like clams, where one year there's a lot of SAV in one part of the bay and another year it's in another part of the bay. And you'll see on this bill testifying, you'll see environmental stakeholders and commercial stakeholders both testifying in favor of this bill. And the reason you'll see that today is because the system we're using right now doesn't work. It's outdated. And the bill is an attempt to try to improve it. The bill is requiring the department every year on March 1 to update its SAV lines. Uh, and we hastily put this together. Um, and I think it, it, there, it may be an expansive demand or request of the department. The department is understaffed in this area. The bay is a huge uh, uh, geographic space to try to map. Um, and uh, you're going to hear a lot of really good testimony about it. I would just encourage this one point is that right now the department can only use this certain amount of information from VIMS, the Virginia Institute of, Mil of, of not military, but marine science. And, um, and, and that information has to be processed. And to me, it only makes sense that if you've got good data that you know there's grass somewhere or you know there isn't grass somewhere, the department ought to have the authority to move the buoy or move the lines. Now, opening that up for the entire bay may be very problematic. So perhaps, you know, focusing on micro areas or things like that would, is where we would be headed. But with that, I would encourage a favorable report on this legislation. And I do expect to bring an amendment to address those issues to the committee. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, why don't we go uh, to Captain Newberry? Uh, you're up next. Yes, Mr. Chairman, my name is Captain Robert Newberry, Chairman of Delmarva Fisheries Association. We represent the Maryland Clamors Association also. Um, uh, some of the other gentlemen are going to talk, but I'm going to specifically get on a point and I'll try to be as quick as I can. You might be asking what this is. This is an underwater drone. Last year, I was called by the Clamors Association to look at a specific point in the Chop Tank River. Um, this drone right here, I was able to look at roughly around 2,500 acres in a matter of two and a half hours. It moves through the water at 10 knots. Um, it is not completely remote. It is tethered. Um, it has GPS coordinates. You can put on identification uh, process through that will identify grasses. Um, in less than four hours, I did probably about eight and a half miles of complete shoreline and found no grasses in the area. Videotape was sent to the department. Um, there are people that are uh, saying that this bill would be financially bad. Well, they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars with VIMS. This is $800. person can operate this in fog, cold, as long as it's underwater. It's got high intensity lights. It's got 3D graphing, infrared. This can do the work of probably 20 people. So to hear that they don't have the ability or the time or the staff, that's not our problem. The fact is that these are ephemeral grasses. It is very important not only to the, um, the clamors, but to populations for fish and crabs and also from the clamors that supply for our fantastic uh, blue crabs that we all love very much. Uh, that's their main source of bait. So I'm just saying when you do hear people say that, you know, there is a problem with this, just remember this little yellow monster right here. This can do the work of 10 people and can instantly, not 10 minutes, I can instantly download if, if for instance, Mr. Chairman, if you had a phone, I could link you to this. You could see what everything I was doing the minute that it happened. So technology is here. Let's get with the program and please support this bill with amendments if they are necessary. Thank you. Okay, sir. Um, yeah, my name is Jeff Harrison, uh, president of the uh, Talbot Waterman Association. Uh, the problem with the current, uh, the way uh, the SAB lines are drawn is it takes every three years. Uh, right now, we are working off of uh, three years from 2018. At, at that time, the grasses were as, probably as far out as I'd seen them since I was a young kid. Uh, it was really a success story for SABs. Uh, the very next year, we had the heavy rains, and SABs really took a, a, a bad hit and really have not recovered. Uh, some of the lines, but the lines stayed the same for the last three years. Um, the problem is, is that, you know, it could be three or 400 yards inside uh, before you've seen any grasses. Uh, if you change that to one year, you know, you could move them each year. Uh, this year is the year that they're going to change them. They're going to move them way back in. Now, if next year the grasses come back, the problem is the line's not in the right place. Now, the clamor still can't work in the grass. They've been telling people that all along, that it fouls their gear. But the problem is, is that the lines, the grass lines will be way in. And if the grass continues to move out, they still have the right to go there and they don't want to have to be able to do that. So that's why I would like to see 
this uh, bill voted on a favorable cause. Robert T. Brown, President of the Maryland Waterman Association Chair and members of this committee. <clears throat> it comes down to trying to get the best science available. And the way it is now, with this three-year gap that we have in this, it's, it's just not working. We need to have it brought up to date year after year. That's how you can tell exactly where you need the lines at. We want to protect the grasses, but we want to protect our clamming industry also. The clamming industry uh, does a lot for the crabbers and crab bait, but the grasses also is a place for the small crabs to hide. It's for the small fish to hide. So it's a real tough balance to get it where it needs to be at. And waiting three years to decide to change a line is incorrect. It's wrong. We need to have these lines moved every year as necessary. Now, I'd like to have a favorable on this. Thank you very much. Okay, get that mic in front of you so we can hear you. Moochie Gilmer, a clamor. And that's the only thing I do anymore on the water. Uh, thank you for letting me speak today. And the first thing I would say, there's nothing no more important than the grasses in this bay. It, it is the lifeline of, of all fisheries. And I'm in favor of Senate Bill 639 with amendments. In the current law, SAV has five years closure when the SAV is found. For the yearly survey, the time of closure needs to be adjusted to correspond with the survey. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Senator Mouts or any of the panelists? Okay, seeing none, we do have two additional witnesses. I'm gonna call up that have signed up favor with amendments. Uh, Matt Pluta. And, and Dr. Uh, Allison Colden, who we heard in the prior bill. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And so each of you have two minutes. You're both signed up in favor with amendments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, again, for the record, Allison Colden, Chesapeake Bay Foundation here, favorable with amendments on Senate Bill 638. As was mentioned, underwater grasses are a critical nursery habitat in the Chesapeake Bay, particularly for the iconic blue crab. Seagrasses provide habitat for our vulnerable juvenile blue crabs to forage and grow before venturing out into other parts of the bay. The SAV protection zones, which protect these critical habitats from destructive activities, are currently updated every three years. In recent years, with the expansion of seagrass beds, this means that newly emerging beds could go several years without protection before SAV zones are updated. We support the bill's proposed annual updates of SAV protection zones to provide cover for grasses, especially in newly expanding areas. However, the bill also suggests replacing the annual aerial survey conduct conducted by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science with a currently unknown survey to be approved by DNR. While there are other survey methods currently under investigation by the Chesapeake Bay program that would allow for more rapid and frequent assessment of the location of underwater grasses, those methods are currently not available for management use. Therefore, we urge the, com the committee to consider amendments that would retain the current aerial survey of record as the VIM survey until and unless an alternative survey method can be derived and the appropriate calibrations made to maintain the long-term data series that has become so critical to the management of our seagrasses in Chesapeake Bay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Matt Pluta. I'm the Chop Tank Riverkeeper with Shore Rivers on Maryland's Eastern Shore. And today I'm also favorable with amendment. I wanna take a moment and just recognize that today is World Seagrass Day. And so if there's any day to be emphasizing the value of underwater grasses, um, I'm glad that today's the day we can do that. Um, I won't get into the value of underwater grasses because Dr. Colden already mentioned that, but at Shore Rivers, we are heavily involved in the restoration of underwater grasses. We started the first SAV Watcher program where we have volunteers go out and help to identify where beds are growing. Um, we've also have, have our hands really tied into the SAV restoration piece where we go out and harvest seeds from grass beds and then process them so we can help to restore grass beds yeah. elsewhere. Um, this bill isn't entirely new. In 2019, Senator Kagan had a very similar effort to um, update the, the SAV protection zones on an annual basis, and we still support that. We feel that the aerial surveys are done annually. The data is there. We just need more resources in-house at the Department of Natural Resources to turn those around more frequently. And we believe that by doing so, we'll be able to actually protect grasses, um, expansion of beds, new beds that, that are growing, um, that'll be caught up in the annual surveys and then protected in the following year. 
Um, where we would like to see an amendment um, similar to, to CBF and Dr. Colden is um, jeopardizing what is this very long-term data set that the Virginia Institute of Marine Science has been able to create. Now, we do recognize there are other technologies being developed. Um, speaking with DNR, we learned about satellite Im imagery, um, drones, you know, th th that is a possibility, but we're being told that it's not yet. And so until we can actually figure out what the mechanics are of making that work, we believe that the best path forward is to maintain that data set and the integrity of that data that's been collected from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And so we would be favorable of an amendment that keeps them named in the bill. And, and for that, we ask for a favorable report. Okay, uh, Vice Chair Kagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pluto, for remembering that I did sponsor this bill or something very similar uh, uh, in 2019. I was just looking for it, actually, uh, trying to dig it up, uh, but you beat me to it. Um, I was actually asked to mention that today is Read Across America Day also. Wow. So uh, it used yeah. to be that President Miller would bring in Dr. S um, the Cat in the Hat every year and people would get their pictures with Cat in the Hat, but that didn't happen. So, uh, but my question was for Dr. Colden, but you have, have kind of um, advanced that. I remember talking with some of the Hogan leaders um, at, at DNR about an app that would make that would also speak to the prior bill about yes. uh oh I'm about to get near the line I should stop now and 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 pivot. Um, do you have any idea? And we didn't get great cooperation. And I kind of thought that might be ideological. Do you know whether this this DNR is exploring that because that could be a win win kind of for enforcement for avoiding the need for enforcement because everybody would have easy access to the data and then clearly stuff like um, like the SAVs would be easily identifiable as well. Yes, there was legislation, maybe it was 2019 or 2020, um, that required the development of an app to show some of these. Yeah, yeah, the bill. Yeah, right. that one. <laughs> um, the, the app has been developed. It's called iShellfish. Um, it includes management boundaries similar to the ones we were discussing in the prior bill, but also I, I do believe it includes the SAV protection zones as well. I will say um, there are some glitches. There are some improvements that could be made to make it a little bit better, a little bit mobile friendly for folks when they're out on their vessels and want to um, and want to address that or, or pull that app up, it does allow you to see your position relative to uh, management boundaries on the screen. Um, given that you have appropriate cell phone service and GPS location to show where you are, so um, that is currently available. It, as many things could always be improved, but the basics of it are out um, on the street. Could you just clarify whether that is a something that has been created by government or private industry is something people have to pay for? Is it widely available in public domain? The one that I'm referring to, iShellfish, was created by DNR in response to the legislation. It is publicly available um, as an app for your cell phone. It also has a website on the DNR um, page. So I'd be curious, maybe Senator Mouts, you and I could have a conversation about whether some extended effective date of that and give a little bit more time to uh, work through some of the kinks that you identified. Um, because it seems like that, as I think it was Mr. Brown who said, you know, the technology, technology is increasingly available, let's use it. And this is another great example. So, but we can talk about that another time. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. you Mr. Absolutely. Okay. Any, any additional questions? Uh, Senator Carosa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I just wanted to go back to Mr. Pluta, your testimony about the um, the entity that would uh, conduct the aerial surveys. I guess, um, and I, it's right now, it's the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Correct. So that there's um, no entity in Maryland that can conduct these aerial surveys. So the way the survey is done now is by aerial. Um, so flying over the, the Chesapeake Bay to map the grasses. And currently, VIMS has the contract to do the entire bay. And so it's been a, part, a longstanding partnership between Maryland and Virginia to um, sort of piggyback off of that data collection so that both states could benefit from it. Okay, so the more along the lines of where we have partnerships with other states when it comes to the Chesapeake Bay? Correct. Okay. I just want to understand, when you see that, you you tend to just want to go back to home state well right and you see virginia in the in the title right, exactly. and so but okay thank you okay any additional questions seeing none that concludes the bill hearing on uh, the the mouth's troika of bills sent us <laughs> that concludes in a bill 
a 638, and we're going to next move to Senator Klausmeyer for two bills. Thanks. Senator Klausmeyer, we're going to start with Senate Bill 434. And um, you've got five designated sponsor panelists. We only got four seats, unless you go to the podium, and then we can fit all your. That's why we have that extra seat there. So, Brian, I'm going to call Brian Russell, Scott Budin, uh, Tanner Council. Allison Gold, uh, Colden and Mark Bry. Oh, uh, actually, Mark Senator, your fifth sponsor panelist is virtual, so you actually do have a seat at the table if you want, or you can stand. No, I'll stand. Okay. No, you burn more calories this okay, way. Okay, good. Right? Okay, Senator, you uh, you got the time you need for several four three four. Four three four. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon to um, the committee. Good afternoon. Uh, chair and Vice Chair, uh, Senate Bill 434, Natural Resources Restorative Aquaculture Pilot Program. Good afternoon, Chair Feldman and members of the Education, Energy, and Environment and sometimes Election Committee. <laughs> I'm here to present Senate Bill 434, which will create a pilot program to provide financial incentives for aquaculture businesses that achieve similar oyster populations and habitat improvements as oyster reef restoration projects. This program creates a win-win situation by keeping water purifying oysters in the bay for longer periods of time. At its core, this is a bill meant to encourage restorative aquaculture, which is defined as the intentional use of aquaculture to positively affect ecosystem services. Like all filter feeders, oysters improve water quality. The addition of oyster aquaculture gear into the marine environment can provide important habitat for fish and crabs in areas where, nat where natural habitats like oyster reeds and seagrass beds have been lost. Despite these restorative benefits from aquaculture businesses, oyster growers are not compensated for the habitat and oyster recovery benefits that their leases provide. While the nutrient removal benefits of oyster aquaculture agriculture are recognized and incentivized through trading nutrient, nutrient credits, there is no similar incentive recognizing the restorative benefits aquaculture can provide. Senate Bill 434 would address this by creating a pilot program that would define the types of aquaculture practices, equipment, and management that would produce restorative habitat and oyster recovery outcomes in the Chesapeake Bay and establish a framework to pay growers for providing these benefits. This will not only provide an opportunity for private industry to contribute to the Chesapeake Bay oyster recovery, but also help build a more resilient aquaculture industry by helping growers diversity, diversify their income streams. I want to thank the committee for your time and in requesting a favorable report on Senate Bill 434. Okay, thank you, Senator Klausmeyer. Why don't we just go down the road, Doctor? Why don't you start uh, first, and then we'll just go down the road. Each of you gets two minutes. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, for the record, Dr. Allison Colden, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, here today in strong support of Senate Bill 434 to establish a restorative aquaculture pilot program. In areas where native species and habitats have been lost, like our native oyster populations in Chesapeake Bay, aquaculture of those same species has the potential to help recover lost ecosystem services including nutrient removal, water filtration, and habitat provisioning for fish and crabs. A 2021 report by the Nature Conservancy defines six key principles of restorative aquaculture. I've included a presentation in my written testimony which lists these out. But to summarize the first five, it's really about citing the right species in the right locations using practices that maximize environmental benefits. When those principles are used to evaluate the potential for oyster aquaculture in Maryland to be restorative, the conclusion is that generally, yes, with appropriate siting, aquaculture farms uh, and incentives to utilize practices that maximize those environmental benefits, oyster aquaculture can help restore the services lost by the degradation of the Chesapeake Bay's wild oyster populations and habitats. 
The sixth and final principle of restorative aquaculture is that it should recognize the social and economic value of the environmental benefits that it provides. And that's exactly what Senate Bill 434 is intended to do. This pilot program would develop a framework to provide financial incentives to res for restorative aquaculture practices to further encourage the expansion of those practices to benefit both Maryland's economy and the environment. We understand amendments may be offered that would transition this bill to a study. However, as drafted, the bill already includes a study period of one year. Therefore, we do not believe a separate study bill to be necessary to implement the program as drafted. Thank you for your time and we urge your favorable report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. My name is Brian Russell. Um, I'm a member of Short Thing Shellfish and also president of the Southern Maryland Shellfish Growers Association. And we asked for a favorable report for Senate Bill 434. Um, we like in aquaculture like to say that aquaculture is not just sustainable because it is, but it's restorative. Um, as an oyster aquaculturist, I got into aquaculture primarily because of the restoration aspect. I used to work for the Department of Natural Resources uh, as a summer intern um, on oyster uh, restoration at the Piney Point Aquaculture Center in Piney, uh, in Piney Point. And um, I enjoyed what I did, but I didn't like the bureaucracy. So I did. I decided uh, to get into aquaculture. It was the same time that the, the state started to streamline the aquaculture process. And so it was me and uh, two other partners and then my dad. So there's four of us in Short Thing Shellfish. And I can tell you from anecdotal evidence that we have a two acre water column lease with about 700 oyster cages on it. And previously that, that area was barren bottom. And every time now we pull up a cage, there is a large number of small fish and large fish and blue crabs that come out of those cages and hang around those cages where they were, were not there before, excuse me. And so we are providing a lot of ecosystem services. We're providing habitat. We are providing a nursery for all these other organisms. And we think that just being able to incentivize other people to get into this industry uh, that this pilot program would show that to be true. All right, we ask for a, a favorable report. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Scott Budden. Thank you to the chair and to the committee today. I'm a partner at Orchard Point Oyster Company. We sustainably raise oysters on Maryland's Eastern shore. Um, we've been in business since 2015 and we currently harvest around a million oysters a year and distribute those and sell those all across the country. Um, so I, like similar to Brian, I uh, got into this industry and this business partially because it's a business and there's incentivization there in itself, but also because I felt a deep connection to the Bay having grown up on the Eastern shore. And, you know, I think I'll speak to the business side of things. It's a, it's a good business, it's a viable business model, but the margins are tight and you kind of have to be either small with only a few helpers or blow it out of the water and be really big and have a large operation. It's very tough to scale. Labor is hard to come by, especially in this tight labor market. And as far as technology and implementation, um, we don't have, we're a little bit beyond a, a horse and plow, but we're not to the combine yet. We're, we're at the tractor phase, so to speak. So the work is very tough. We harvest 52 weeks a year, haven't missed a harvest in going on eight years or something like that. And um, the people we employ, you know, some of them have college degrees. Some of them could do a lot of different things. They are making a lot less money on an oyster farm because they enjoy being out in the environment. They enjoy the regenerative aspects of oyster farming. So being able to retain those folks with increased um, incentivization through the, just by doing the business that we're doing would be huge. It would allow the industry to grow, it would attract new entrants and it would make it more viable for current, current industry members. So uh, another quick example of something similar that happened was uh, the SOAR program, which was administered through the state during the pandemic where farmers and people with, had, well, people with leases could sell their oysters into um, basically restoration projects. That was that was big because during COVID, our sales went to zero and within two weeks, um, restaurants weren't open. So, you know, that's a similar kind of model that worked. That was primarily for restoration, but it's been proven in terms of um, the impact it can have on industry and the positive effects. So we asked for a favorable report from the committee on this bill. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Tanner Council. I manage the Chesapeake Oyster Alliance. We are a coalition of over 90 uh, academic institutions, nonprofits, oyster growers, and other businesses with a concerted focus on 
advancing oyster restoration, aquaculture, and research. You may have run into some of us today. There's a number of, here, uh, of us here today. I thought I'd ask, if you're here with the Oyster Alliance, would you please stand up? There were, I think there was more as a long day. Uh, <laughs> thank you all very much. Um, so we are here to urge for your uh, favorable report on SB 434. Um, I would just add that uh, oyster aquaculture is one of the few food production systems in the world that has a net positive impact on its environment. Uh, this bill would help to, us to better understand that and incentivize growers to further unlock those benefits. Thank you. Okay, any question for Senator Klausmeyer or the panel? Okay, seeing none, we do have just one witness um, virtual, Mr. Breyer, Mark Breyer. We're going to get him on here. He signed up favorable, straight up favorable. Mr. Breyer, we see you've got two minutes. Thank you, Chair Feldman, Vice Chair Kagan, members of the Energy Education, Energy and Environment Committee. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. For the record, my name is Mark Breyer. I'm the director of the Nature Conservancy's Chesapeake Bay Program. As part of our conservation mission, the Nature Conservancy promotes restorative aquaculture all around the world, uh, whether it's sea sea seaweed farming in New Zealand or oyster farming right here in Maryland, aquaculture that uses the right practices in the right places can support economic opportunity for communities and actively restore our environment. Dr. Colden uh, mentioned uh, the report. I urge you all to take a look at that if you're interested uh, that the Nature Conservancy produced about the benefits of restorative aquaculture. And Mr. Budden mentioned the SOAR program that the Nature Conservancy helped sponsor at the beginning of COVID. Again, that program that we developed was in response to uh, the closure of restaurants and helped uh, purchase oysters uh, from farmers who, who didn't have a market to sell into uh, during COVID. We did that across seven states and uh, in doing so really helped establish an alternative market uh, for those oysters uh, through the use of re uh, their use in reef restoration. Um, Maryland was the flagship state across seven states uh, of the SOAR program. 26 farmers sold us more than one and a quarter million oysters, and that helped restore 17 acres of sanctuaries in, in the Bay. A year after the SOAR program was established, uh, we took a look at how, how well the oysters did. 85% of those planted survived, and 95% of the participating farmers were interested in selling their oysters again. Most importantly, 90% of the farmers said they would like a reliable option to sell their oysters for restoration purposes in the future. Senate Bill 434 does just that. It provides the basis for a program that would help expand markets, further incentivize restoration efforts on aquaculture leases, and provide a financial reason for the aquaculture industry to continue to invest in conservation. By balancing economic interests with restoration efforts, the Restorative Aquaculture Pilot Program is another step forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Breyer. Any questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none, we do have one uh, witness signed up unfavorable, uh, Robert Newberry, Captain Newberry. I'm going to come back up here. Again, signed up unfavorable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Captain Robert Newberry. I'm chairman of Delmar, Delmarva Fisheries. Um, I have been in the aquaculture business for 38 years of my life, but I do not do oysters. I do pond aquaculture. We raise striped bass, largemouth bass, yellow perch. Uh, we do hard, we've done hybridization. I'm not doing it anymore. And we also do freshwater clams. Um, this bill, the problem that I have with this bill, it, I'm not trying to pit aquaculture against the commercial industry, which we represent. One of the main problems is, is I hear this word restoration and you heard a couple of people testify when they pull their, their trap, their pots up or their uh, oyster cages, you know, you got fish, you got crabs, you got, um, where are the oysters? They're in the cage. Uh, the other thing that I think needs to be clarified, what is the percentage of triploid oysters they're using and putting on these bars versus diploids? Triploids are sterile oysters and do not reproduce. They grow faster. They are good for the aquaculture industry because they grow quicker and they could be harvested faster. Uh, the other thing is the money. We've got a, a program called Marbidco that a lot of these individuals that have taken care, have taken advantage of. I've, in my industry, I was unfortunate not to be able to use Marbidco. Um, but there, don't forget, there's also a 40% debt forgiveness with loans with Marbidco. So, you know, that may sound good, but don't forget debt, debt forgiveness is a collectible tax according to the Internal Revenue Service at 15%. So uh, we're unfavorable with this bill because I don't think it, it is putting out exactly what these aquaculturists need. This sounds to me like, you know, the bill is a thing where they can buy the oysters and put them on state property. Well, 
I believe that the wild fishery could probably sell them a little bit cheaper than they could because you got to look at the input that they've got going into these oysters. And that's a lot more than what we have in the, in the uh, commercial fishery. So I just move for an unfavorable vote on this bill. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for the witness? Okay. Um, seeing none, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate bill uh, 6434. And we're going to next move to back to Senator Klaus Meyer for Senate bill 437. And I'm going to call up a panel of witnesses, a sponsored panel of Brian Russell, Scott Budin, Tanner Council, and um, Allison Colden. Those are the four witnesses. And Senator Klausmeyer, back to you on Senate Bill Thank 437. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, EEE committee. Um, and one thing I would just like to, to say that I am on the Aquaculture Coordinating Council and have been since its inception. And I only say that because I would just like to invite any, anyone um, here on the committee um, to attend one of our meetings. So if, if you would like to do that, and I bet if you asked anyone here that has a, an oyster farm, you might ask them if you could just come and see that because it's fascinating to see, so, and, Yes, the, the folks behind me started at eight, eight o'clock this morning, and I'm sure they came to see all of you, and you all have your little oyster pins. So thank them very much for all their hard work. So with that, um, I'm here to present Senate Bill 437, which will make three main changes to aquaculture in Maryland. First, Senate Bill 437 aims to streamline the state's approval process for aquaculture leasing by ensuring that applications that meet all regulatory requirements and receive no protest are pro processed within six months. Currently, some new businesses wait years for oyster aquaculture lease applications to be approved. In fact, the average time for a rece receipt of, app of an application to lease execute in Maryland is nearly three years, 34.3 months which places Maryland last among 19 coastal states with shellfish aquaculture industries. Lengthy delays can be caused by, pro can be caused by protest, which tend to add a year or more to the lead processing timeline and are often dropped or dismissed in court. Senate Bill 437 will ensure that following any necessary legal or regulatory review, Leases are executed within six months. Second, the bill directs state agencies to identify state-owned land with waterfront appropriate for aquaculture leasing and directs the leases pro the lease process will provide oyster growers with certainty needed to move forward with pursuing oyster aquaculture in Maryland. Lastly, this bill adds representation for the aquaculture industry to the Oyster Advisory Commission to make sure that the needs of this growing industry are considered in state policy making. I have also provided or requested a few amendments that First Amendment would strike this portion of the bill changing commercial watermen representation on the advisory, Oyster Advisory Commission. The bill would still increase representation from the aquaculture industry, but we want to be sure that all relevant industries have a voice as well. The second amendment is to restore a representative from the Oyster Recovery Partnership to the Oyster Advisory Commission. The bill originally struck them from the partnership, but they have since reached out to express interest in being more active in the Oyster Advisory Commission. I am also request, requesting a third set of amendments, which are not yet finalized. I met with DNR uh, to discuss how to best implement this bill, and they provided me with several re recommendations, and I would like to have them included. Most of the changes in these amendments will be technical or clarifying in nature, but they will also include an amendment to remove all changes to the tidal fishery. Commission and give the Aquaculture Coordinating Council authority to convene, convene stakeholder work groups as needed. I look forward to continuing discussions on this important issue and would like to request a favorable 
with amendments report on Senate Bill 437. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's go through the down the panel again, uh, starting with you, uh, Dr. Colton. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Allison Colden, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, here in strong support today of Senate Bill 437. As Senator Klaus Meyer mentioned, uh, the analysis of Maryland's lease applications since 2018 indicates the average time from receipt of application to lease execution is nearly three years. Adding a protest on top of that will add an additional year, and you'll hear from some of our oyster farmers their personal experiences with Maryland's lease process. This is not only slowing down oyster aquaculture operations, but it's also hurting Maryland's competitiveness as aquaculture industries in other states continue to grow rapidly. This bill would address the lengthy lease processing timelines by providing critical certainty that after a lease is fully reviewed and vetted, the lease agreement would be completed within 180 days. This is important for growers who currently have to frequently check in with DNR staff on the status of their application even after reviews are fully complete. It would also allow for that expedited leasing on submerged lands adjacent to state-owned properties where DNR and MDE have determined that leasing is viable and compatible with existing water uses. Because DNR has jurisdiction over all of the other commercial fisheries in the state, inclusion of DNR as one of the main uh, agencies reviewing and processing these, these areas for pre-approval means that they would have to determine that they are compatible with all existing uses, including recreational and commercial fisheries. Finally, despite the fact that um, oyster aquaculture is currently harvesting 20% uh, of the amount of uh, oysters harvested in the state, and we have more than 500 people engaged in the industry, there's only one representative from the aquaculture industry on the Oyster Advisory Commission and the Tidal Fisheries Advisory Commission, two very important key bodies which advise DNR on important commercial fishing interests. So this bill would ensure adequate representation of the aquaculture industry on those key boards and commissions who overlap with aquaculture. I urge your favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Once again, Brian Russell with uh, Shore Thing Shellfish and the Southern Maryland Shellfish Growers Association. Um, as Dr. Colden said, uh, when we got started in 2010 uh, as a as short thing shellfish, we applied for uh, two leases, a nursery lease, and then also our uh, current water column lease. And it took us three years to get one without any protests. And it took us a little, uh, about almost four years to get the nursery lease because there was a conflict with the pound net site. Um, and that, that was, you know, 10 years ago. Now we're 10 years later and the process is still about the same length. It's still taking three to four years on average to get a lease. And when you're starting a business, especially one like aquaculture, once you get that lease, then you got to get your seed in the water. And then that's another year and a half to two years before you can even make your first harvest. So you're talking an average of five years before you can even sell any product. So how do you how do you go into a business when you can't even get started or when your start is that hard. Um, we're asking for a favorable report for Senate Bill 437. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Scott Button again with Orchard Point Oyster Company. Thank you to the chair, chairman and committee. Um, we're asking for a favorable, favorable report on this bill. Um, so from experience, uh, it's taken us quite a number of years to get our leases. And we have about 25 acres of water column leases spread between Chester River and Eastern Bay and Kent, Queens and Talbot County waters. Um, the first lease in the Chester River took about four and a half years to complete. That was protested. We were able to work with the adjacent landowner and some commercial concerns to actually relocate the lease to a better location. We always try to be a good neighbor, reach out to both the landowners as well as the county uh, waterman committees to get their opinion on where a good site would be. Um, our longest lease was our last lease that was issued recently that took six years without a protest. There wasn't a protest. It took six years. Um, we've had a, another lease protested that took five years, and that was protested from a waterfront landowner that had no view of the actual lease. It was completely around the corner, miles away. So the, the time we're talking about here is a very real thing. It's not a, a figment of our imagination. It's, it takes a lot of time, and you're, you're revenue negative for you know 18, to two, 18 months to 24 months after you're actually received the lease. So 
Um, it also locks you in and makes you less flexible with your business management too. Um, as far as the um, membership of TFAC and OAC, I'll disclose I'm a um, I'm the aquaculture liaison to the Title Fish Advisory Commission. I also sit on the Maryland Aquaculture Coordinating Council. Um, my experience with TFAC has been a positive one. I'm the lone liaison. I've honestly learned more than I probably contributed. I think there's a lot of opportunity to have more representation for aquaculture to reflect the harvest numbers that we're currently bringing in. And I think that there's a lot to be said for interaction with people that don't necessarily do the same thing you do. You can learn a lot from them, their struggles. You can empathize with what they're going through with regulation, and you can share your experience. I think it's been a very positive experience overall. I think having more members on it would be good because right now I'm just mostly listening. There's no other no other liaison. So I uh, just wanted to share that. Thank you for your time. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, Tanner Council, Chesapeake Oyster Alliance. Um, this bill provides some um, very important adjustments to the impressive expansion of the Maryland, Maryland's aquaculture industry that we're already seeing. Um, growers are coming on at a rapid clip. Uh, yields are increasing. And this would provide um, uh, it would help to improve the process for new growers coming on the access for those growers, the actual space to grow and representation of those in important committees. And I just wanted to mention I was actually very surprised when preparing for this, as Senator Klausmeyer mentioned, again, 19th and last in 19 coastal states um, for the uh, from time of application to execution. So um, I think this bill will uh, modernize that process. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Senator Klausma or any of the panel? Uh, Senator Augustine. All right. First of all, it's good to see you, Senator Klausmeyer. Good to see you too. I'm not going to ask you the most glaring question. I'm going to leave it alone. But but I will say that I am not a fan of oysters. Um, oh, to eat geez. for eating, just for eating. Um, but I do. I, I I'm curious from you all, like a million. Sir, you said you do a million a year, right? We harvest a million, so you have to plant several million more on top okay, of it. Okay, but you so year. and so what I just for my education, because this is new for me, like how much space does that require? Well, it depends on how you do it, and each place is very site specific. So we do that within 25 acres. I can only kind of speak to our that's farm. the kind of number I was asking about. So, like, Correct. takes 25 acres to do that. You could do it in smaller. We have some. There's a lot of considerations with our sites and, and our logistics of our business, but that's what we currently use. Correct? Okay. Yes. And then how far, where, where are these? Like how far are they off the shoreline? Most of our leases are pretty near shore. Um, they're not located in deep water. I'd say the average lease distance, if I had to put a number on it, is maybe a thousand yards or so offshore, give or take, and about anywhere between four, four feet of water, mean low tide to 17, give or take. Based okay, because I, I mean, I've I was been told that they're a little closer. They can be a little closer than sure, that. And they, that's they can part be. of the reason why mm -hmm. some of the landowners have, you know, correct expressed some concerns. Right. And they, they and are I, a little closer. They can be. They can. There, there are certain leases that are closer to the adjacent shoreline. And sometimes in some circumstances, the business or the leaseholder owns the property and sometimes they don't. So if obviously if you own it, you're not going to create a conflict with yourself. But um, as far as, you know, that process goes. I think, you know, being a good neighbor goes a long way. It's always been our experience, and we've always been able to find an amicable solution. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Any additional? Uh, Senator Crozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, not going to let Oyster Day go by without asking a couple of questions here. Um, so when I look at this bill, and I appreciated the meeting with, that I had with the Oyster Alliance, because we we talked about not just individual bills, but I think we talked about where we are um, with our different constituencies and about maybe we're past 2019 and further along where we can build more trust with, you know, our commercial watermen, aquaculture, and, you know, even the structures that we have in place that deal with some of these issues. So with that as background, um, I, I think this bill, you're, you're addressing a couple of, you know, I think kind of major issues one which hits you you know i think <laughs> right up front is the you know the delays on the time you know you know whether you agree or disagree with this type of business or whatever but the fact of the matter is when you, when we have businesses set up and you all are going through this process these these times are absolutely unacceptable 
And as someone who's actually been contacted by one of my constituents with aquaculture with a major delay and has had to try to use my position to cut through some of this red tape, and I found it frustrating, um, the, the, these numbers are alarming and it has to be addressed. So I thank you for that, Senator Klausmeyer. Um, the issues when it comes to the organizational structures. And I, I, I guess this is my question, and this might go to um, Worcester Alliance or if the Senator wants to address it. When you have, I think, some of the other organizations, the Maryland Waterman's Association, the Talbot Waterman's Association, raising issues about you know, um, fairness and being included, I think our organizational structures have to be so that we can start building more trust. So, you know, I, I saw that you were offering amendments. I haven't had a chance to have the exchange, but, and, you know, the invitation for some of us to participate in some of these meetings, um, you know, whether it's the Oyster Advisory Council or the um, Title Fishery Advisory Commission, somehow we got to remove this bureaucratic commissions, councils, and make sure whatever we put in place is representative of these constituencies. And again, I go back to building trust. So, you know, I don't know if Oyster Alliance or the Senator, but do you have any suggestions or recommendations besides the bill on, you know, if, if you think your amendments do it um, as far as being more inclusive, but how we can get to back to being inclusive. So it's not aquaculture against our commercial watermen. This is more about how we can, you know, that we can do this together. I'll, yeah, I will, I will just quickly say that um, you have a very, you know, there's serious concerns, but aquaculture and wild harvest are not mutually exclusive. And I think that's really the key that they can actually be very supportive of each other. And especially in this, in this particular case where we're looking for leases on state owned lands, <clears throat> you're not moving, you're not moving into areas that are not already being fished for wild, wild fishery. So these are, these are two things that can work together hand in glove. Scott. Yeah, I'll try to be brief on answering your question. So my experience of have, have, having served on some of these commissions and committees is that, you know, it doesn't need to be zero sum issue. I think there's a lot of overlap and I found that we have a lot more in common than we do differences. Um, it's been a great learning experience. I'm happy to do it for public service aspect of it, but just for my own education and understanding what um, the commercial fishery has to go through on a day to day basis has been enlightening. So I think that, you know, we should work on building more bridges versus fences. I'm absolutely on board with that. And I think if there's a way we can do that, um, where we have representation from the, the commercial fishery, as well as, you know, adequate representation for aquaculture, that, that's a win-win. Okay. Any, any, any additional questions, Senator? Okay. Seeing none. We do have um, a list of unfavorables. So thank you, Senator Klausmeyer. We're going to, I'm going to bring up, I'm going to call you by name, uh, Robert Newberry. And the regular today in the committee, We've got Robert uh, Brown, James Mullen, and uh, Herman Harrison. And then we have a couple of uh, virtual witnesses after that, but those are the in person. So again, Robert Newberry, uh, Robert Brown, James Mullen, Herman Harrison, and then we have two virtual witnesses signed up unfavorable after that. So, sir, you can why don't you start off. Once again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Captain Robert Newberry. I'm chairman of Delmarva Fisheries. Um, I kind of feel the pain for the aquaculture people on the time frame that they have. Uh, when I got my aquaculture license to do my pond aquaculture 33 years ago, it took me six days. Six days. And the reason was aquaculture is an approved agricultural use. Why is it in DNR? When it was with the Department of Agriculture, Department of Agriculture did all the paperwork. They had the staff to do it. They had the people to do it on the final end. And I even I even had some cage lease areas. I had a DNR officer come by, inspect it with a biologist from DNR. Done. That quick. That might be the problem. The 2010 aquaculture bill removed the rights of protest. We have no standing. The watermen have no standing. I've been involved in three different protests. One county spent $15,000, lost no standing. I had a landowner that bought a piece of property for four and a half million dollars down on the Honga River. ALJ, ALJ judge told him you have no standing as a property owner. It was right in front of his property. 
And another one that we had, it was done by a property owner that was told he had no standing. So our standings are being removed. This bill does not address what the problem is. It's creating more problems, I think. You know, we see in this bill, there's a possibility of bottom taking by pre-approving aqua aquaculture bottom. We were told in the initial bill by Mr. Don Webster testified in here and in the house said, we don't need shell on bottom. We don't need sanctuaries. We don't need public fishing areas, PSFAs. We can take any bottom. Now you find they want to go into sanctuaries. They can represent 10% of sanctuaries. I think this bill needs to be pulled back and looked at and get straightened out a little bit and then maybe revise how the process moves forward with getting a license to uh, have aquaculture. So I ask for an unfavorable mess. Thank you. Um, Jeff Harrison with the Talbot Waterman Association. Yeah, the uh, I don't know that I truly understand all of the uh, um, uh, the bill, but my understanding is it kind of pits the watermen against okay. aquaculture. Uh, it's my understanding that like 60% of the aquaculture leases are by watermen TFL holders. Uh, in our county, um, I guess it's as much as two years ago, we noticed this problem and it does, it takes a long time. I have a waterman who tried to get four leases and it took him four and a half years. Uh, he almost gave up on it, but he hung in there. And anyway, um, a, a couple of years ago, the prop part of the problem was, is you never really got to see the lease until it was at the very last process, the 30 days that you could uh, protest it. So they started a tracking system on uh, leases so you could see them when they were first put in. Since that's happened, I believe that the process may be moving a little quicker. Um, we are working at our county. We encourage anyone who has a lease. I call Rebecca Thur and say, you know, I give them my number. If they want to call us, they come to our uh, county meetings that we have every month. We recently just went through a process with a guy. Uh, he showed us the areas that he wanted to lease. We didn't have any problem with him. I sent him to Queen Anne County because it was in the Miles River and uh, they didn't have any problems. He put the leases in and he went to uh, the county to get a water uh, permit and 10 people on either side of him that were landowners went and protested it. And that's where really the protest is coming from. It's really not from the watermen anymore. It's from landowners. And that's what's making the process so long. Uh, we've really built a lot of trust in the uh, consensus process that we went through the last couple of years. We came out with a really good bill uh, that you know is encouraging uh, stuff happening in Eastern Bay, and we would like to see that continue. So I'm really not sure that this bill is a good bill. I, I think it needs to be rewritten, uh, but I understand their concerns. <clears throat> Robert T. Brown, President of the Maryland Waterman Association, uh, Chair, members of this committee. Uh, I I know what the uh, what the problem is with. Uh, taking so long to get uh, aquaculture leases. It is a problem there, and that does need to be speeded up. But that's not where the problem is coming in this bill. Uh, what we have here is you're talking about uh, pre-approving some ground to have it so aquaculture can go in. That causes a problem right there. For example, our oystermen, they are protected by a lot of the eight spars. Some of that can be uh, revisited, and you can have it re estimated how many oysters are onto it to possibly get some of that for leasing. Then you got your clamors, they cannot work on a Yates bar, so that's a line on the outside of them. Then on the inside of where they work it, they got the grasses, they got to stay on the outside of the grasses. So the oysterman got a place, the grasses got a place. Where do the clam clamors go? Well, when it comes to a protest, the clamors have no rights. Our clamming industry should have the, the rest, most of the other parts of the body that they're working right now. If a piece of bottom is protested by the clamors, they lose it every time because they'll say, well, it's, they said you were in a NOAA code. A NOAA code runs from Cove Point all the way down on the Bay Shore from all the way down to Point Lookout. So, I mean, this is the problem. We got to protect our clamors. And hey, we can have, Aquaculture too, but our clamors have been there before aquaculture has come at the needs that it is now. But we have to protect our clamors. They got bait. They, sometimes they have social clams for us to eat. There's got to be some kind of way that these clamors of ground that they are working every year that they do not lose this. And they have lost some because it would not hold up in court. Thank you.
Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Jim Mullen with the Maryland Oysterman Association. We're opposed to the bill just from the simple fact of the restriction of the participation of the diversity of the Title Fish Advisory Commission. You're taking 14 members and you're reducing it to 12. We have no problem with adding additional aquaculturalists and increasing the diversity, but restricting the diversity we're opposed to because you'll find on line 16 on page two of the bill, which is in existing law, the, comp the comp composition of the commission shall reflect the geographic regions of the state where the commercial fishing industry is operating. With regard to the Oyster Advisory Commission, which I serve on, you have 11 Oyster County committees that presently serve on that. When you read the bill, it's being proposed to remove all 11 and replace it with three commercial watermen. We don't think that's accurate as well. Again, the idea is to increase the diversity of these commissions. So if you want to add two more aquaculturalists, we're not opposed to that, but I don't know why we want to restrict participation. And then in closing, I read, found this on page four of the bill. They want to take out, advertise the application on the website of the department and once a week for two weeks in a newspaper published in any county or counties where the proposed lease is being located, that lacks transparency. I don't know why you want to hide something or restrict the flow of information. I, I just, some of our rural counties in the state, you just, we don't have Bay Broadband yet. So why you want to take it out of a newspaper and not publish it, I don't think is accurate. So those are our three concerns and we would work with Senator Klaus Meyer on amendments. Uh, just in closing, I did serve on the Aquaculture Coordinating Council for six years as a liaison of the Maryland Watermen's Association, and the motto there was, we're not going to promote one industry at the expense of another. So thank you. Hey, thank you to the entire panel for your testimony. Uh, any questions for any of the panelists? Senator Carosa. Thank you. Did I understand, um, Senator Hossmeyer, that some of your amendments address the membership concerns? Yeah, yeah, it, it does. And um, we could sit down and talk about them. And I'd be more than happy to sit down and see if we can, you know, right. make make it work. Excellent. Well, we just don't want to take anybody off. Yeah. Or just if we want to increase diversity, awesome, all for it. Uh, like Mr. Budden said, uh, we can. It's a two-way street. We learn back and forth, but to restrict participation, I, 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 that's not healthy. If we're going to build trust, to Senator Carosa's yeah. so, earlier, no, and I and I get that. So, okay. um, at one point, I I heard that the watermen were a little upset with me, and I just said, "Please come and see me and talk to me." So, okay, well, why there, you guys I just could, broke that wall down? You, get to, so, you, get to, well, you guys can uh, get together offline. That'll that'll yes. work. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions for uh, the panel from the committee? Okay, we do have, thank you, thank you, everybody. We do have two virtual witnesses signed up on favorable. We're gonna to go to uh, Timothy Mortis. Mr. Mortis on the line. Bring you in here, sir. Yes, I'm here and uh, Steve Lay is also sitting here with me. Okay, well, you both, each of you gets two minutes. So you get, okay, so Mr. Mortis, you can start two minutes. Uh, I'm Tim Mortis, second vice president, Maryland Waterman's Association. <laughs> There seems to be a lot of confusion with this bill over multiple parts. Granted, the process, the aquaculture process in general, there are some issues with it that can be addressed. But making changes with this bill right now, there, there are other shareholders involved, the clamors, you know, taking up crab bottom, stuff like that. It just seems to me that we need to take a step back with this, revise it, you know, a possible summer study before we go for we go, you know, any farther forward. Thank you. Here's Steve. Okay, uh, Mr. Lay, you've got two minutes. Thank you. My name is Steve Lay. I am the chairman of the Title Fish Advisory Commission. I am hoping our sponsor's first amendment removed the need to add any aquaculture people to the Title Fish Advisory Commission. Our purpose at TFAC is to advise and make recommendations to the Department of Natural Resources on commercial fishing issues. We do not deal with aquaculture issues. 
our committees must respect the boundaries of one another to be able to work efficiently. Um, our watermen on the TFAC are very highly educated, experienced, and take care of business in a professional manner. I cannot afford to lose any watermen on my commission for trading for two aquaculture individuals. And since we don't deal with aquaculture, we don't need any more aquaculture people on tidal fish. We have one representative, which is Scott here at your hearing, and two other watermen who have aquaculture leases on tidal fish. So we do have three representatives on tidal fish that deal with aquaculture if needed. I'm hoping that you kill this bill or at least amend out the portion which requires aquaculture people to be put on tidal fish. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions for either Mr. Mortis or Mr. Lay who are both there in the same room? Okay, seeing none, uh, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill uh, 437. Thank you, Senator uh, Klausmeyer. Thank, thank you for your attentiveness. And we're gonna next move to Senator Hester, Senate Bill 586. And I'm going to, I've got a, a designated sponsor panelist in Frank Dudek. Um, I do also have Robert Mead here in the room uh, who signed up favorable. Why don't we bring him up as well, Mr. Mead and Mr. Dudek. They're both here. And we're going to start off with Senator Hester to present Senate Bill 586. Hello, how are you? Hey, Thank you very much, Chair Feldman, Vice Chair Kagan, members of the committee, uh, for your consideration of Senate Bill 586. This is a consumer protection bill regarding licensed tree experts. So just a small break from oysters to talk about something taller. Over the interim, our district heard complaints from constituents and business owners regarding businesses that represent themselves as tree experts when they are in fact unlicensed. To prevent this mischaracterization going forward, this bill um, um, as amended prohibits a person from engaging in the business of treatment, care or removal of trees over 20 feet tall, unless the person is a licensed tree expert, employs a licensed tree expert or works for a company or individual that employs a licensed tree expert. It also requires a licensed tree expert to maintain and be able to demonstrate valid workers' compensation insurance at the time the license is issued, if required by law. Finally, it suggests, at the suggestion of the Department of Natural Resources, this bill has also increased a fine for repeated instances of unlawful tree work from $1,000 to $2,000 to deter repeat offenders. To date, there are approximately 1,300 of these licensed tree experts in the state of Maryland. However, our law currently permits any company to act under the license of a licensed tree expert. This has led to growing concerns from industry about insufficient oversight. To be clear, this profession routinely ranks as one of the most dangerous in the country for worker injuries, and improper tree care poses significant threats to the trees. Uh, dependent species. Unlicensed operators often lack safety procedures, putting workers and landowners at risk. Poor practices such as tree spiking lead the spread of bacterial or fire blight across the tree species. So in summary, colleagues, the care of large trees is one of the most dangerous occupations in the United States. Industry stakeholders believe that the alterations to current standards, which I have described, are are effective solutions to mitigate the negative worker safety and environmental impacts of unlicensed tree operators. For these reasons, I respectfully request a favorable report of Senate Bill 586, and I'd like to turn it over to the panel of licensed tree experts. Thank you. Hey, sir, tell us your name. I only had two folks uh, sign up favorable uh, in person, and I've got three witnesses. So, but in any event, just, uh, just tell us your name. That's okay. Fine. I'm Gary Matthews with cutting edge tree experts. We don't have you signed up, but that's fine. Just go ahead, that's fine. The, yeah, the owner couldn't make it today. He asked me to fill in for him. I spent 30 years as an arborist with the National Park Service. 
in Washington, D.C. My duties were the care and the maintenance of the trees for the National Park Service and the White House grounds. For the last 12 years, I've been with cutting edge tree experts. I'm typically uh, conducting tree evaluations and estimates for customers on a daily basis. Over the last few years, I've seen a dramatic increase in the unlicensed tree companies, as well as the companies working under someone else's tree license with no supervision. Others prescribing tree removal from either lack of knowledge or deception scaring the homeowners into removing live or healthy structural sound trees while climbing spiking trees, which can lead to injuries and or diseases to the tree. In some of those cases, it can be fatal to the tree. Other improper, improper trimming techniques, advertising as a licensed and insured company when they are not, improper insurance policies for tree work, as well as the workers' comp insurance for their employees. The past year, we have made numerous calls to the Department of Natural Resources on unlicensed tree companies. By the DNR's own admission, the current fine was not enough to sway any unlicensed tree company from operating in Maryland. Tree work has been ranked as one of the most dangerous occupations in America. Without additional steps to ensure that the companies are licensed, trained, and hold the appropriate insurance consumers and our urban forests are at risk. I believe this bill is a step in the right direction to help protect the homeowners and the trees and employees. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, either one of you, make sure you tell us your name. Sir, you Good afternoon. My name is Frank Dudek. I am the owner of Arbor Valley Tree Service. I started in this business when I was 12 years old as a grunt, basically raking and dragging brush on the weekends. Uh, when I was 16, dropped out of high school and came into it full time and have been into it ever since. I've been over 50 years in the industry. Uh, the industry has changed in so many good ways because of licensing regulations and changes that we've made in, in the law. Um, the practice of renting a license is, you know, you, I heard in the earlier testimony on other bills, good players and bad players. Anybody renting a license is a bad player. Okay, there's just simply no reason for somebody not to obtain a tree expert license. It's a very simple test. If you can rate at an eighth grade level, you can take this test with just studying a simple guide that we have in our industry. So it's a very simple test to get. But most importantly, it is an extremely dangerous business. And I have seen some terrible injuries. Now, you can't fix our injuries with a Band-Aid or, or a roll of gall tape and some, some, some antibiotic. Uh, you know, chainsaws are very unforgiving. When they hit you, they hit you bad. Um, the problem with renting a license also is the license holder who is renting it out has no, no financial interest in the company that he's renting it to or the fellow that he's renting it to that's operating the business. So when something goes wrong, something he's out of the picture. It's all on that guy. And then that guy probably doesn't have the right insurance because if you're not properly licensed in the state of Maryland, the insurance companies can then say, well, you weren't properly licensed. You're now, your insurance is now null and void. So then where does it fall? It falls to the homeowners and it falls to the employees to, to assume all of the risk while these bad actors are renting a license and breaking in the profits. And it is a profitable business if you run it right, but it's just unfair to the consumer. So I ask you to please, you know, support this bill and, and shut this down. Otherwise, when I retire next year, I'm going to open up rentmylicense.com and rent 50 different licenses out in 50 different industries. Now, it, basically the loophole was right there to rent every license in the state. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Sir, Good afternoon, get, Chairman. Get, get, get that mic closer. Yep, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Felden, Vice Chairman Kagan, members of the committee. Robert Mead, I'm an owner of a licensed tree expert company in Western Howard County. Been in the business for 44 years. Um, I have, uh, as a professional arborist, and a licensed tree expert. I'm also a current instructor for the Tree Care Industry Association in numerous domains, which relates to public safety as well as crew safety of the uh, climbers and grounds people. I've um, been a past president of Maryland Arborist Association, was instrumental in the continuing education of the arborists, as well as the getting the tree removals added into the licensing as part of uh, the license coverage. Sharing a tree expert license causing harm to the industry and the consumer uh, in numerous ways. Uh, the there, excuse me. Um, several of the operators are operating, you know, without a license, 
paying a fee to somebody who has little to no oversight, including you know somebody that's in the far western part of the state operating, lending his license to somebody in Baltimore. It's almost impossible to oversight that. Um, sometimes these operators on these jobs, they leave property damage. Their, injured, their workers get injured. You know, it falls back on the homeowner, their insurance. Um, sometimes they just pack up and leave. I've had several clients that have said that, you know, the, the people that were here, they just left. They did all this damage and left. They have no recourse against these people because there's no licensing. There's no tracking of them. They're gone. So I urge your favor in this uh, as a consumer protection and employee protection uh, for our industry. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, questions for Senator Hester of the panel? Uh, Vice Chair Kagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually have um, several questions. Um, a few things. First of all, Senator Hester, thank you for a good consumer protection bill. It sounds like it is. it works for it's one of those rare things that works for the industry and it works for consumers and stuff. So so it makes sense, but devil can be in the details. First off, I wonder, did you reach out to the attorney general's office? Because I'm noticing that they did not submit testimony in their consumer protection division. Maybe you can just get them to weigh in on current law and whether they think this bill uh, works for addressing the issue. So I'd be happy to. Okay. So that's that's one thing. And maybe they're watching or something, but that's that's one thing. Um, gentlemen, I wonder if one of you on another topic, uh, how hard is it to get a license? How long does it take? What do you have to do to show that you're expert at this stuff? Is our process working? Can you just educate us about that? The, the current licensing process um, is you have to have three years of experience of work underneath of a current licensed tree expert or a tree expert company. Uh, then you're capable of sitting for the exam. Uh, the exam is, I believe, mirrors 10 domains, uh, which is indicative of the International Society of Arboriculture Exam for a Certified Arborist. Um, once you pass these, then you become a licensed tree expert. So when you say sitting for an exam, that sounds like it's written. Yes, it is a written exam. So I don't have to show that I know how to use a um, a chainsaw. I just know how to check yes, no, 12, like whatever the questions are. I don't have to actually show that I know how to do it. Simplistically, yes, but diving a little deeper into it, there are questions on safety and, you know, so but, let's say I know the right answers on safety, but maybe you, I still you've can't. You've also do just had three years of experience under a licensed tree expert who okay. has taught you the safe practices of tree care, chainsaw use, chipper use, personal protective equipment. Okay. So much, so on. Okay. So I take the written exam. I've had three years of practice watching someone else or helping someone else, working with someone else, yes. participating. I take the written exam, I have to get some degree of percentage correctly, and then I get my license, and then that's good for forever? It's it's renewable every other year. Every other they year. have alternate licensing years. It's renewable for a fee, and you must can, can, uh, complete eight hours of continuing education in that two-year period to maintain your licensing, gaining knowledge and experience in tree care. Okay, those answers are all pretty reassuring. Thank you. Um, back to you, Senator Hester. Just a last question, if I could. Um, on page two at the bottom, um, when you talk about the consequences, the, the fines and fees, first offense, a fine not exceeding $500. And then the second offense, um, imprisonment not exceeding one year or a fine not exceeding $2,000 or both. That's fine. What's interesting to me is lines 30 through 32, which is that the second or subsequent violation is one that has occurred within two years of any prior violation. So first off, it sounds like you get a get out of jail free card after, you know, a little bit of time has passed. But also someone's doing it over and over and over and they kind of have a free window for two years. I don't know that. I. So maybe counsel can can coach us on that another time. But that seems like a really broad window before they get in trouble a second time. So they get they get a $500 fee and then they've got two years or, you know, one year and 11 and a half months before they get the other fine if they haven't uh, 
if they haven't gotten their license by then. Yeah, now that is that is a fair question, Madam Vice Chair. This was a suggestion of DNR, and I'd be happy to circle back to them and get answers or tighten it up. I'm I'm interested. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, in addition, we've got Senator Augustine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, Senator, did you see the testimony from the Maryland Arborist Association? I've um, I, I, I've seen that it is there, and my understanding is that it's from the executive director on an individual basis that they did not take an official position. Okay, well, it does say here that they're opposed to the bill. I mean, and it's on their letterhead, um, and one of the things that they raise uh, on here is that this could potentially have a chilling effect, particularly on um, uh, minorities uh, by creating a a barrier, particularly with the workers' comp, um, where there's already in in the law uh, that you you know for different these types of situations you would have to carry workers' comp, but that also sole proprietors do not have to um, necessarily carry workers' comp, but that this would create that barrier, supporting obviously bigger businesses that have a chilling effect on sole proprietors. What do you? How do you address that? So I did forget to mention that we have um, three amendments. They don't completely eliminate their op the, the opposition. And I'll have to clarify again once the whether it's the individual or the association. But um, one of the one of the amendments, I believe, does allow a sole proprietor to opt out of the insurance requirement since it's not required by federal law. Okay. So what why would they need to why 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 make it an opt-out versus it just not being there at all? I will have to get back to you on that, okay. Senator. Okay. Okay. That that's fair. Um, okay. 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 You look like you're eager to answer. Why don't you take a crack at Senator Augustine's question? Currently, the current law, as a sole proprietor without any employees, I I, I wouldn't have. Sir, to could have you put your word lip beam and Frank do that again? Um, the current law, as a sole proprietor, you would not have to have workman's comp. You know, if it's you and just just your family members working for you, you need workman's comp and all, on. If you're hiring other people outside of your family, your immediate family. Right, sir. But that's that's the issue here. So the reading of it right now that these folks are saying that the way that this is currently written, that it would require it because in order for you to have the license, it says now, if this were to pass, you got to carry workers' comp. So therefore, you would have to carry it as an individual, a sole proprietor, even though it's not the case, like you said. That's what I'm saying. That, that could very easily be amended. Okay, and I do believe that Robert Mead that, that there was a little brief statement in there where required uh, at the end of that sentence. Is that correct? Yeah. So my understanding of the amendment that I will get to you, Senator, is that it allows a sole proprietor to opt out of the insurance requirement since it's not required by federal law. So I don't know why we require. I mean, to your point, if they're going to opt out, then why do you have it in the law, anyways? Yeah, that's yeah. all I was saying. I, I I see. I think I think probably it could be tighter. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any additional questions for this panel? Okay. Seeing none, we do have, thank you. We do have uh, one witness in person signed up unfavorable, Paul Wolf. Is Mr. Wolf here? And then we do have one uh, virtual witness unfavorable. So Mr. Wolf, uh, take a seat. And you've got uh, two minutes to submit your uh, unfavorable oral testimony. Thank you. My name is Paul Wolf, uh, owner of Integrated Plant Care in Rockville, Maryland. I've been a licensed tree expert for 45 years. Um, and uh, I've been past president of the Maryland Arborist Association. This bill is fraught in a couple of different ways. Number one, it would pro prohibit my company or any other company, for instance, of hiring outside companies from other, uh, other states from performing work uh, following a storm, the rapid cleanup of a storm. Number two, it would prevent a company from hiring an independent arborist, uh, which there are many in the state from performing high skilled work, work that maybe my employees can't perform, they could. Number three, it would prohibit the sharing of a license with another company. And this, par this part's rather personal. A good friend of mine, Bob, uh, Bob Blakely, um, a, an Olympic rower, uh, a uh, licensed tree expert for 45 years, uh, also a uh, reserve Naval Reserve officer for 30 years, uh, was tragically killed in an automobile accident. He was the only licensee of his company. Um, if this bill 
passes, or if this bill had been in effect uh, when he passed away, it would have a tremendous effect on his company. He would no longer be allowed, or the, the company would no longer be allowed to do any work in Maryland, having a really adverse effect on his family and his employees. Um, with the blessing of the department and following their guidelines, um, I have asked if I could be the licensed tree expert to represent their company while they are going through the process of either selling their company or one of their employees becoming the licensed tree expert. Some may say I'm a bad player by, by offering that, but I think it's the right thing to do. Um, I, um, you can finish your thought. That's fine. Yeah. Um, it, it's, I, it's going to be a temporary thing, but um, it, it's in keeping with the spirit of the law in that there will be a licensed tree expert in charge of the people that were employed by his company. I, I urge an unfavorable uh, review of this, uh, re, uh, of this bill. Okay. Any questions for, uh, for Mr. Wolf? Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you, sir. Thank you. We have one uh, final witness, a virtual, uh, I guess Michael Huber, Mr. Huber, uh, although you don't, you don't, that's not your name next to you. Okay, sir, who, who are you? My name is Ron Muir and I'm the president of the MAA. Okay, is he the right name? Okay, yeah. okay yes, that, proceed, Mr. Muir, you've got two minutes. Okay, thank you, sir. My name is Ron Muir and I'm a Maryland LT and the current president of the Maryland Arbor Association. I'm here to represent our over 130 member companies. As the trade organization representing the Maryland licensed tree experts, we work to promote education in the field of arbor culture, support the success of arborists and promote the importance of proper tree care. MAA has significant concerns about the unintended negative consequences that Senate Bill 586 would have on minorities, small businesses in the Maryland tree care industry, while increasing the difficulty to obtain the LTE license, which is why the Maryland Arbor Association requests your unfavorable report on this bill. The scenarios being cited as the catalyst for this bill and the changes to the Maryland license tree expert laws to address this issue are already illegal under the current licensed tree expert regulations and are only an issue for a very small percentage of the 1300 currently licensed LTEs in Maryland based on feedback from our 130 member companies. MAA has met with the bill sponsor regarding our concerns understand that amendments are being added to the bill. However, we still have the following concerns. MAA frequently hears from our membership about the difficulty required to achieve the LTE status. We're concerned that this new language still does not address the scenario that we raised during the initial meeting on this bill of mentoring someone to get their license, which would lead more to more individuals violating the law. The requirements of, for workers' compensation insurance in this bill are onerous, as the state of Maryland already requires by law that employers carry work, workmen's comp insurance. Lastly, we're concerned that the current proposed legislation will weaken the intended purpose of the license as non-LTE consultants or workers prescribing tree work under the new amendments would not have undergone the training or gained the necessary experience to be qualified to prescribe tree work in one of the most dangerous and unforgiving industries in the world, as you've heard by various testimony. In closing, we request your unfavorable report on the Senate Bill 586. We thank you for your time and consideration. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Any questions for the witness? <clears throat> Seeing none, uh, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill 586. We're going to next move to Senator Lewis Young, Senate Bill 690-690. And I'm going to call up your panel of, um, you've got some virtual and some in-person, but I'll just call up the in-person. We've got Lisa Radoff, uh, Chris Holbein. Uh, Nancy Perry, and then you've got okay. some sponsor panelists virtual. We'll take them next. Oh, and um, Jennifer Bevan Dangle. I'm sorry. Well, hey Jennifer, you used to hold back. You're not on kind of a designated sponsor panelist, so you'll be on the next panel. Okay. So um, Senator Lewis Young, you you're going to you. start off, and I've got again three in-person sponsor panelists, okay? So you, you can start off, Senate Bill 690. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, due to an enormous pub, 
public opposition to confining farm animals in ultra restrictive cages. And I think we have a sample of one here. Oh, it's right over there. It's now clear that the future of egg production is cage free. In fact, there are 10 states in the country that have already passed laws that, very, that are very similar to what we'll be proposing today. What it'll do, this law will do, is ensure that after a phase-in period, that eggs produced or sold in Maryland would come from cage-free operations and adhere to the egg industry's own guidelines. This bill is going to promote food safety, advance animal welfare, and it provides a very business-friendly regulatory framework. The majority of hens in the United States and the egg industry are confined to these cages that are so small that hens can't even flap their wings. Uh, these cages are not only cruel for the birds, but the cage systems have been associated with much higher risks of salmonella, a disease which can be deadly. It's particularly risky to children and to our older population. Why is that? Well, these cages are so small that clearly the hens are lying in their own excrement, and that's oh. where they're laying their eggs. This trend towards cage-free eggs, very popular. In fact, there was a poll conducted in Maryland in 2023 by an organization called YouGov, and the results found that 76% of Maryland voters support their legislators actually being in favor of the cage-free reforms that you see before you in this bill. I want to point out that this measure doesn't impact other sectors of animal culture, doesn't affect broiler chicken producers, and it only applies to a really small, um, it doesn't apply to small farmers or those that produce eggs in their backyard. In fact, the cutoff is flocks of 3,000 birds or more that this legislation applies to. There's a lot of cost considerations that are a large part of the debate on this particular bill, and I want to review a little bit of that information with you. The difference in production costs between cage and cage-free housing systems is really rather minimal. It's estimated to result in about a one cent per egg premium. And we have this information from California that has this bill in effect. And our bill is really modeled uh, quite a bit after that bill. Since cage-free eggs will become the norm, the cost of cage-free eggs will actually decline because sellers are currently uh, charging a premium. It's an artificial premium for these more desirable eggs, the old supply and demand theory. And that disproportionately discriminates against lower income individuals that want eggs that are produced in a more healthy, friendly environment, but can't afford the premium. Egg industry data shows that the egg prices in California uh, have been like a penny an egg. I think I mentioned that. But there's other cost considerations as well. And that's inhumane confinement and, and safety risks, as I mentioned, with the increased chance of salmonella. And that has been documented as well. The standards that are proposed to you in this bill, the guidelines, were actually written by the industry. And here's what they've recommended. They're requiring between one and one and a half square feet for birds, depending upon the specific system used. So Maryland's egg 
uh, laying hens would be able to uh, perform really important natural behaviors like flapping their wings, walking, perching, dust bathing. I learned recently what dust bathing is. The hens actually roll around in the dust. That's how they clean themselves and get rid of mites and parasites. And of course, laying eggs in nest boxes as opposed to these kind, tiny little cages. So as I mentioned, these standards are based on guidelines written by United Egg Producers. This measure codifies where the market's going already. For example, Target, Costco, McDonald's, Burger King, Denny's, IHOP, Arby's, Panera Bread, and Taco Bell, these are all very cost-conscious companies, are either 100% uh, cage-free, or they have a plan to reach 100% cage-free. And almost all these companies will be cage-free by the deadline of this particular bill, which is 2025. So this bill will keep Maryland farmers competitive in what is clearly an evolving market. I want to just um, address three objections that you're likely to see in testimony or hear. I think I've, object, I've addressed one, which is the cost considerations. Uh, another one is we're all aware that the price of eggs went up recently, has nothing to do with cage-free eggs. It had everything to do with the avian flu. Now, another thing you may read or hear is uh, Proposition 12 in California, which is being challenged legally. And so you may hear testimony saying, well, why don't we wait until that is heard? Uh, read between the lines. That case has nothing to do with eggs. It's a uh, cage-free eggs. It's about pork. So the argument somewhat irrelevant. No, it's very re relevant. So in conclusion, I would like to play a little uh, video for you because a picture is worth a thousand words and much shorter. Sorry if you found that disturbing, but I think we really need to know what this looks like. In conclusion, the trend is clear. Uh, we need to have healthier eggs and be a more humane society. So I ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, Senator Young, you want to, you want to go, uh, Ms. Radoff, you want to go next? Good afternoon. Um, Chair Feldman, members of the committee, my name is Lisa Radov. I'm the president and chair of Maryland Votes for Animals here in support of SB 690. You heard very compelling and comprehensive testimony from our sponsor. Um, I just want to add a few things. Um, first of all, um, that this is not just 10 states. Um, 
Cages for egg-laying hens are prohibited in 18 countries, including the whole European Union, India, New Zealand, Israel, Norway, and Switzerland, just to name a few. As you heard from um, the Senator that Marylanders support this very strongly. And I can tell you um, from our action alert from Maryland Votes for Animals, people are very supportive of this bill for health as well as humane reasons. So this is not just a we feel sorry for the chickens bill. This is also a health bill. So I wanted to also let you know that um, you're going to hear from a lot of other witnesses. I think I'm sort of teeing this up at this point. Um, and I just want to let you know that it is time for Maryland to join these states and these countries, the European Union, to promote the health and well-being of egg-laying hens and Marylanders. Thank you so much. And thank you to Senator Lewis Young for um, sponsoring this humane and healthy legislation. Yes, sir. It's on. It's on. It's on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, members of the committee, for allowing me to speak here today. My name is Chris Holbein. I'm the public policy director for farm animal protection at the Humane Society of the United States, which is proud to be headquartered in Maryland. Organizations like the Center for Food Safety have supported cage free measures like SB 690 because they result in safer food for Maryland families. Um, and as the senator uh, mentioned, it's not hard to understand why hens who are caged so tightly they can barely move are more likely to become stressed and sick and transmit dangerous bacteria <laughs> like salmonella. But I want to underline that the, the senator uh, eloquently spoke about why this will actually help make uh, safer, more humane eggs more affordable for Maryland families. That artificial premium, which the egg industry's own uh, uh, industry news outlets have acknowledged uh, is, is, uh, is, is grossly exaggerated and is charged because uh, grocery stores know that some people will uh, pay more. But this creates a two-tiered system where lower income consumers are basically pushed into buying substandard eggs. By requiring cage-free as the new baseline, this artificial premium will no longer be applicable, making it easier for all Maryland Marylanders to afford safer eggs and a, that accord with their values. Uh, a leading industry uh, magazine recently concluded it's no longer a discussion about whether to convert egg production from cage to cage-free operations, but rather when that will happen. The nation's leading grocery, restaurant, and packaged food companies are requiring their contracted egg companies to switch to cage-free. Uh, both red and blue states across the country are taking action on this irresponsible, irresponsible practice. This measure would simply require egg producers to follow the egg industry's own cage-free guidelines. Thank you for your consideration. We ask you to please vote yes on this modest but important measure. Okay, thank you. Okay, tell us your name, and then you've got two minutes. Chair Feldman and members of the committee, my name is Nancy Perry, and I am so proud to be here today before you as a Maryland citizen and as Senior Vice President of Government Relations for the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. We represent over 25,000 Maryland citizens and more than 2 million supporters across the country who care deeply about this issue. I'd like to offer our strong support for SB 690 because it will improve the welfare of millions of animals. It will align our wonderful state with the broader shift that we're seeing towards high welfare farming systems. And it'll position our farmers to lead the way in meeting the ever-growing demand for cage-free eggs. Marylanders really do care so deeply about the protection of animals. And that's seen in our amazing cutting edge policies when it comes to puppy mills, horses, and wildlife. We have led the way, we're a national leader. And public surveys are showing time and time again that people are deeply concerned about the welfare of farm animals too. And that concern has fueled what you've already heard about today, this significant demand, the growing demand for more humane options. And more than 200 companies now have committed to adopting cage-free systems. You've already heard about McDonald's and Costco and Walmart. Maryland-based Sodexo has made this commitment as well as Maryland-based Marriott. State legislatures, as we've heard, are 
there's a tidal wave of these confinement bans. 14 other states now have actually banned them as well as other countries. And what we don't wanna do is let Maryland fall behind. Many farmers do wanna make this transition to expand their capacity for high welfare and cage systems or to transfer entirely, but they really need laws like this to help make that possible, as you've heard. Providing these hens with these basic protections better matches consumer expectations from all the polling we've done and would simply meet animals' most basic needs. So we offer our strongest support for this bill. We wanna thank you for your consideration of it and hope you will vote it out of committee. Okay, any questions for the sponsor, Senator uh, Karen Lewis-Young or the three um, sponsor panelists? Okay, we've got Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Young. Um, my one exposure to chickens outside of Chick-fil-A uh, was going to Purdue, uh, going to visit the Purdue site in Salisbury where every graduate of Leadership Maryland went. Are those chickens there uh, cage-free or not? Uh, those are those are not laying hens, so they are, they are outside not. the subject matter of this bill entirely. Okay, and so I don't see where there is a uh, an ask from the state to help the uh, the farms who have these retrofit to be able to accommodate the additional space needs. Was that done intentional? Is this what I would call kind of an unfunded mandate to to this industry? Well, there's a long phase in period, so that would help. And you know, the equipment has to be phased in and out routinely anyway. So it would be easy for farmers to make that transition in a natural progression. And we think that the economic value to farmers would be made up as you've heard about this artificial premium. We think that that adjustment will happen. And it will actually, I think because of the timing with all these other phase outs that are occurring and the phase in of this bill, our farmers were, are gonna be right at the cutting edge at exactly the right moment for the market. And, and currently, is there any, um, you had mentioned the, the non-cage free uh, hens could have some potential for diseases when they lay their eggs. It seems like, you know, when you go to grocery store, you have your option, you want cage free, you want not, you want the brown eggs, whatever, but all of them go through a screening process. I've not known there to be an egg outbreak of disease has that happened yeah i mean salmonella is a, a significant concern for uh eggs and uh the what happens when they lay the eggs because they're stressed and sick uh the bacteria is is often uh becomes embedded within the egg as it's as it's laid. are you telling me bad eggs make their way currently yeah. today yes. into our grocery stores yes in fact, the Center for Science in the Public Interest and Center for Food Safety support cage-free reforms for that very reason, okay. unfortunately. Thank you very much. Okay, any additional questions? Uh, Senator Brooks. Okay. Chair, uh, quick quick question. Uh, this is a business. It's, 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 uh, it's an, an industry. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like the, the farmers would want to do whatever they can do to keep their, I guess, for lack of a better word, inventory healthy because then it's more productive for them. So, so why do you feel as though they would do things to that would be counter to that? The egg industry uh, employs people to walk through these cage sheds every day and pull out the dead birds. Uh, there is a, a it, the poor welfare leads to many of the birds dying and they've made the economic calculation that uh, for for years, that they would rather have some birds die than to to uh, change to more uh, to better more humane systems. Uh, the industry, as as uh, some of my colleagues discussed, is moving uh, greatly from uh, the cage to the cage free operations because they're seeing the animal welfare benefits, they're seeing uh, the food safety benefits. They're doing it in more cost-effective ways, and uh, we expect this trend to continue. Uh, as I highlighted, basically the industry has conceded that uh, this will continue. We believe that as companies make these decisions to go cage-free, uh, that it makes sense for Maryland to codify into law uh, an important animal welfare and food safety standard. Okay, so you feel as though the reason they 
won't make that transition is be, it's because of cost. Uh, it has been uh, a cost issue over time, but I, as um, as a senator uh, noted, when the egg industry looked at the production cost changes uh, for uh, for cage free, as it's especially as cage free has been, uh, you know, continually refined, uh, the 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 prices the cost is is minimal, and uh, that's why we continue to expect. Uh, that more producers will uh, will convert and, until it's a fully cage-free uh, market. And this measure would help uh, solidify that. Yeah, okay. And lastly, I'll say, uh, speaking of cost, I know, I think the cost of eggs in my, uh, <laughs> in my district has gone up probably 300% in yep. the last, uh, I'd say, maybe three months. Yeah. So <laughs> As the Senator mentioned, that is... Uh, that is entirely due to the avian flu outbreak, which has tragically killed uh, about 40 million uh, egg laying hens. We're already starting to see those prices come back down. This measure, uh, you know, has a has a phase in date uh, so that this uh, this latest outbreak will almost certainly be over. And the egg industry is, itself is talking about that it is recovering as it uh, gets new hens in into production. OK. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. OK. Okay, um, Senator Hester. Thank you, Senator Young, for this bill. Um, I'm. It, it was really hard to watch the video. Obviously, no, no, no it's fine. I mean, we, we see we you know things are. It's fine. Um, my question though is, I mean, Maryland doesn't operate on its own, right? We're surrounded by other states, and our eggs come in and out. I'm reading the Farm Bureau's testimony. And they make a couple of good points, uh, one of which is that the farms are contracted with out-of-state companies that will just drop their contracts with the farms, and these farms will have to create a new demand for their eggs in a market where there already is an oversupply of cage-free eggs. So do we have any like industry like data about, about I'm just trying to figure out like who who, who is it and, and how many of their are there are these contract operations with with other out of state uh, farms? Do we do we know who specifically in Maryland is doing this? Um, I I don't know the uh, inner workings of of the businesses, the private businesses, but I I will say that I disagree uh, respectfully with with the Farm Bureau's uh, suggestion that these producers will be dropped. Cage free is where all the demand is going from these companies, uh, from other states, from consumers. And the, um, the uh, demand will, will continue to uh, cause more of these companies to say to their contractors, it, it already is saying, we want you to go cage free as soon as possible. Can we follow up? Yeah. What, the other thing that they say is that by moving to a cage free operation, the hen mortality rate increases significantly due to, due to more bacterial habitat being introduced into the barn. Now, is that true in some instances or are they flat out lying? Um, it, they're not lying. It is outdated science. And uh, Dr. Sarah Shields, who uh, uh, is going to testify uh, next, uh, is, is an expert on this issue. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let her speak to it. Okay. Any additional questions for this panel? Okay. Um, Okay, seeing none. Uh, got two more in-person witnesses. Then we do have two virtual witnesses, um, or three actually. Alicia Brugoski, uh, Brugoski, Alicia Brugoski, and Jennifer Bevan Adangle. Jennifer. Okay, and then we'll go to the virtual witness. Okay. I'm sorry, go on, you, you can start. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Alicia Prygoski. I'm with the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Our mission is to protect the lives and advance the interests of animals through the legal system. On behalf of our members in Maryland, I ask that you support SB 690, which would protect hens from cruelty, provide safer options for Maryland consumers at the grocery store, and make Maryland a leader in what has clearly become a nationwide trend for more humane egg options. 
Not only is this a trend that we're seeing in the market itself, like my colleagues have already spoken about, um, you know, with dozens of major companies choosing to go cage free, but it's also a trend we're seeing in legislatures across the country. 11 other states have passed laws or regulations prohibiting battery caged hen housing, and eight of those have also passed cage free sales laws. What is particularly noteworthy about this trend is that it's not limited to any particular demographic or region. We have and continue to see strong support for cage-free eggs in a bipartisan manner in states that have both highly urban and highly rural populations and in varying geographic locations as well from the West Coast to the Midwest over here to the East Coast. It's abundantly clear that the future of egg production points toward cage-free and passing SB 690 into law will put Maryland at the forefront of a national shift toward more humane egg choices. So I ask that you please support this bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Bevan Dangle. I'm the State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. I'm here just to draw your attention to two sign-on letters. We're trying to be respectful of your time. We know the late nights this committee has been putting in. So I do want to make sure that you know there's a sign-on letter from over 100 family farmers in Maryland that is in your witness list. There's also a sign-on letter from 17 Maryland veterinarians, all of whom are supporting this legislation. And you could add my family farm in Western Howard County to that list, certainly, because any farmer who has chickens who are able to engage in their natural behaviors just knows that that's not an acceptable life for a chicken. And this is only half the number of birds that could actually be kept in a cage that small. And that is the actual size of the battery cages that we're talking about today. So beyond the video, just the understanding of how cruel this truly is to birds is something that resonates with family farmers who support this measure. I do want to note who's not here testifying today. And it's the actual industries that are responsible for egg production in the state. We respect the Farm Bureau and the work they're doing to speak for their farmers, but it's important to note that you do not have testimony from Sauter or from ESA speaking against this legislation, and that's because they're neutral on this bill. The egg layers know that this is where the market's headed, and what this bill does is it puts Maryland on the map as saying we want a firm deadline to get there. That's what this bill is about. It's about saying we know this is the direction, but we want a commitment. And that is something that this state does. We are very proud to set clear guidelines and expectations for industry practice. I do want to thank the sponsor for her leadership on this bill. We do want to note there are two amendments in the sponsor packet. They're technical amendments that keep the bill conformed with other states. We think it's very important that the legislation stay very consistent so that there's a regulatory framework that producers across the country all know and understand. And that's why this bill relies on the egg industry's own standards to set the parameters for cage-free. So we do urge a favorable report. Hey, Senator Hester. Trying to get some data again on yeah. this topic. Um, you mentioned there were 11 other states that have done this. I mean, could you tell us which states those are? It could be an offline, but then also the impact of the the on the farmers and the industry and the contracts. Because if 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 11 states have done this, then there should be evidence about whether or not those contracts have been pulled, and that would be incredibly helpful for this committee. We will be starting to follow up. I I know that those 11 states are in your packets of testimony somewhere, but I don't want to say the wrong ones uh, right here. So we will follow up with you. I will say there are only two states that have fully implemented it. So it's 10 states that have, 11 states that have passed and two that are fully implemented and operational, one of which being California. But we'll make sure that we get that data to the committee. Okay, any additional uh, questions for the panel? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we're going to go next to the virtual witnesses. Uh, we are going to go to Sarah Shields. Her name was invoked earlier, virtually. Is Dr. Shields there? Okay, we have you. You've got two minutes. Thank you. Feldman, members of the committee. I'm Dr. Sarah Shields. I'm an animal behavior scientist. I studied at UC Davis in California, and I am now director of farm animal welfare science at Humane Society International, and we strongly support SB 690. I have three short points. First, science confirms the public's concerns about keeping hens locked in cages. Animals have deeply ingrained biological drives to express certain times of natural behavior, and this is well documented in the scientific literature. For example, a hen needs a perch for roosting, a nest box for egg laying, and loose litter for foraging and dust bathing. Restriction of movement in cages has real physical consequences for the animals, including for hens weakened bones from lack of exercise, 
and poor plumage condition from rubbing against the bars of the cage. Animals are built to move and they suffer if they can't. Second, as the science has advanced, producers have gained more experience with cage-free housing and the few remaining obstacles have been addressed. Hen health and productivity is good in these systems. And finally, having reviewed the materials circulated in opposition to this bill ahead of the hearing today, I would like to point out that they include some common and outdated misperceptions about cage-free production. Cage-free doesn't have to be free range. The, the birds can be housed indoors with industry standard biosecurity. The eggs are clean and the flocks are productive. The most recent meta-analysis, which included over 6,000 flocks, 167 million hens published in 2022, found that the mortality in cage-free production is as low as it is in cages. So in summary, this bill is about progress scientific and technical advances in animal housing. We know so much more about the behavior and the cognition of hens than we have ever known before. And every time we look deeper into the biology of the animals, we find more, more evidence that they are far more complex than we ever knew. And the egg industry has to take this into account. Please vote to advance SB 690. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the witness? Seeing none, um, our next virtual witness is uh, Cheryl Lee, uh, Leahy, 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 Cheryl Leahy. It's Leahy, sorry about, about that. Two, you've got Thank two minutes. You. You're That's signed up uh, fa favorable. Yes, so my name is Cheryl Leahy and I am Executive Director of Animal Outlook, AO, a nonprofit animal protection organization with a home base in Maryland. I'm testifying in support of SB 690 for many of the same reasons you have heard and will hear others present. Battery cages are inhumane to animals and also present food safety risks and public health risks. What I believe I can uniquely offer today is a specific factual look at the realities of battery egg production, including here in Maryland. AO has conducted multiple investigations of battery egg facilities in Maryland. In 2001, numerous occasions in 2002, 2003, and then again in 2005, AO entered Maryland battery cage egg facilities where hundreds of thousands of birds are warehoused. AO documented the following repeatedly across these investigations. Hens crowded in barren wire cages, restricting even simple movements. Animals in the lower rows of cages forced to live in the excrement of birds above them. Severe and widespread feather loss. Birds with severe and untreated illness and injuries deprived of veterinary care, including multiple disfiguring swollen and infected eyes. Birds trapped in the bars of their cages under other birds, immobilized and unable to access food or water. Widespread dead birds with live birds forced to live in cages with their decomposing cage mates. While I have highlighted the Maryland egg industry, AO's investigations of other battery cage egg facilities reveal almost identical conditions and issues. In 2005, 2007, and 2009, AO investigated battery egg facilities in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Minnesota, and documented once again the same kind of overcrowding in cages severely decomposed birds with live birds in cages, sick and injured birds with no veterinary care, feces landing on animals, stuck birds with no access to food or water, and escaped or abandoned birds in the manure pits or aisles. Each worker being responsible for between 125,000 and 225,000 birds, with one worker saying they could only spend no more than an hour per house looking for dead birds. Battery cages, cruelty and suffering is the rule, not the exception. Thank you. Okay, any question uh, for the witness? Seeing none, thank you. Our final witness on this bill uh, is signed up unfavorable, Colby Ferguson from the Farm Bureau. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, uh, you got two minutes. Again, you're signed up unfavorable. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau, and uh, we are here in opposition of uh, Senate Bill 690. Um, the for several things, I, I love how when people get my written testimony and then take the time to go through and, and change their testimony to refute it, um, I just go off of the data that uh, we, we we get from the industry and um, from the industry that we've that we work with, um, which is the the uh, commercial egg growers. Um, they talk about that the cost to retrofit or to take an existing structure and change it over to a cage free. Is roughly about 41% increase in, increase in cost of production. Uh, and then you have a 119% increase in, uh, in labor. Uh, one thing we've also seen is that the cost, the difference between the cost of cage-free eggs 
uh, as well as uh, in the non cage free eggs is about three times uh, more expensive um, on a normal basis. Uh, we're in an anomaly right now with uh, avian influenza, but uh, that um, doesn't happen very often. And so even with the avian influenza, the price of non-cage free hasn't even uh, risen to the cost of the cage free eggs. And, um, you know, the the final thing I'll talk about on this bill is, is that, that Prop 12, which is uh, with the Supreme Court, does does talk, bring in cage free uh, for um, for the egg laying hens, because it specifically says that it uh, uh, talks about veal calves, breeding pigs, egg laying hens to be housed in systems to comply with specific standards for freedom of movement, cage free design, and specified minimum floor space. So it does bring it in. And so we believe that this bill could potentially be um, unconstitutional if the Supreme Court comes down on Prop 12. Lastly, I'll say that this is a hammer approach, it doesn't work very well. The carrot approach is much better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Ferguson? Uh, Senator Washington. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. What's the carrot approach? Well, the good thing in the carrot approach right now is we have quite a few farmers. Um, I live in Frederick County, and I, I reached out to a couple of our egg, egg laying operations in Frederick County, um, and they've actually, uh, they're independent. They're not with a contractor. Uh, they have already switched over to cage free um, because they are garnering. They're they're selling their eggs independently and uh, and getting a higher price uh, price per dozen. Um, so there, th to me, the the direction is already moving uh, without a ban and uh, a, an unfair push on on the the farmers that haven't had that opportunity to move or switch over. Uh, there's only about five or six counties that uh, still have the the cage. Uh, caged operations that are mostly up uh, along the uh, Pennsylvania border where most of our of the eggs go and uh, work their way back into our our market. So uh, the the carrot approach would be to um, to continue to incentivize for uh, the movement towards this versus banning them uh, because these farmers would be out. I've already talked to them. They have contracts. They don't believe Pennsylvania doesn't require this. Delaware doesn't require this. Virginia doesn't require this. So they they would lose those and they would have to find another way or just get out of uh, chicken production. And, and just as a follow up, you mentioned the, the contract um, farmers. And so those are individuals, I believe they they don't have any con direct control by, by virtue of their contract. They don't have the choice, even if they would want to switch to caged free, they they wouldn't be able to. Are, are there contracts that uh, would not allow or uh, prohibit uh, an individual farmer to, if they chose uh, to go cage free to be able to, you know, to do that? I'm, I'm going to guess that there's probably some um, in, I don't know, around on the East Coast side of any contract uh, growers at this time, any integrators that are doing the large scale cage free systems. Most of that I, that I know of is in the Midwest and Western area uh, meeting California standards. But um, my guess is, is that as these large integrators start to to move towards the direction um you know, it's about 40% is what we're hearing uh, that they're moving towards um, with the, the cage free. The challenge of it is, is that, you know, the vast majority of um, uh, purchasers or consumers are uh, buy on price. And so when you push that, when you force this narrative, you are going to directly increase the price of, of eggs in the grocery store because the alternative won't be available because okay. this bill doesn't allow it. Okay, thank you. Senator Hester. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, could you get back to us with some data about like which, um, like how many contract farmers they are and then whether, I mean, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but are they all contracting with the same, are all the farmers contracting with the same, what is it, producer or? or integrator. Integrator. E ESA, 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 that's the, um, that's the primary one in Maryland. Um, I actually talked to them um, yesterday on this, and uh, they're not neutral on this bill at all. They just didn't come in uh, on this, uh, this bill at this time. So then as a follow-up to uh, Senator, the Senator to my right's question, I mean, if we could ask them what the carrot approach might be, it seems like there's one company that will influence, but the, the contractors are, are smaller farmers who, who do this. 
Yeah, this this bill hurts the farmers. This bill doesn't hurt the contractors at all. They'll just um, they'll just grow them in another state. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Any additional questions for Mr. Ferguson? Okay. Uh, seeing none, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill uh, six nine zero. We're going to next move to Senate Bill eight three six, and Vice Chair is going to have the gavel for this one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, next up is Senator Brooks, Senate Bill 836, Maryland Native Plants Program. If uh, the sponsor panel could please come forward, Marie Laporte with the Sierra Club, Kirsten Hoffman with Green Towson Alliance, Jeremy Tidd with Bonaterra LLC, Sarah Tangren, and Judith Fulton from the Maryland Native Plant Society. There are other witnesses, but let's have those first five join Where us. Are you? At the table, please. And Senator Brooks, uh, you may begin your testimony. Thank okay, you. thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Kagan and members of the uh, of my great committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you on SB 836, uh, the Maryland Native Plant Program. Uh, for the record, I'm Ben Brooks, and I represent the 10th Legislative District in uh, Baltimore County. Uh, the purpose of this bill is to encourage and promote the use of and the sale of plants native to Maryland at certain businesses and to educate the public on native plants. Furthermore, it would require the University of Maryland Extension to develop several programs to promote native plants and educate the public on them. Native plants are crucial to Maryland ecosystem and food chain. Not only do they contribute to the environment's biodiversity, but they also, uh, but they also <clears throat> on food sources, many important pollinators, including bees, butterflies, and other insects. Studies suggest that restoring native habitats near farms can also increase crop yield. Further, since native plants have deeper root systems, they act as filters to keep the waterways clear. SB 836 will support native plants in three ways. One, it would require the University of Maryland Extension to hire a native plant specialist to administer the native plant program, which would encourage the use of and sale of native plants by garden centers and nurseries. The coordinator would also teach the public and landscapers about the benefits of growing native plants and, <clears throat> and growing technologies. Uh, the University of Maryland Extension, in coordination with the Department of Natural Resources and the Maryland <clears throat> Native Plant Society, will also be required to develop a native plant list and a marketing program called Maryland Live to promote the use and sale of native plants. This will be done through a sticker program where retailers may place Maryland native stickers on approved plants. Three, the same agencies will also create a voluntary certification program for growers and retailers to, to be identified as Maryland native plant growers or retailers. Many plant buyers in Maryland want to support the local environment. Having an outreach program act, <clears throat> activate their sensibilities is key to shifting consumer sentiment toward native plants. Furthermore, a native plant specialist would provide much needed guidance for taking care of these plants. Similar, similar programs have been initiated in other states. In 2022, New Jersey unanimously passed the New Jersey Native Plant Program, which established a labeling program for plants sold at nurseries. Furthermore, the New Jersey Department of Transportation is required by law to use native plant vegetation for landscaping and habitat restoration projects. By supporting our native plants, we can support our entire state uh, ecosystem, but that begins on the grassroots level by educating consumers and landscapers. For these reasons, I request a favorable report on SB 836. Thank you. Senator Brooks, you all just wanna go down the row here? If you would identify yourself and please make sure you uh, pull the microphone as close as you can so that folks listening from home, watching from home can hear you. 
Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kirsten Hoffman, on behalf of the Green Towson Alliance, asking for a favorable report on SB 836. Biodiversity, the variety of animals, plants, fungi, and microorganisms that make up our natural world supports everything in nature we need to survive. Food, clean water, medicine, shelter. Biodiversity loss is often cited as the biggest existential threat facing our world today. By a simple act, however, each of us can help mitigate this threat. That simple act is adding native plants to our landscapes. Consumer demand for native plants is increasing as more and more people learn about all the benefits native plants provide. But how do we know which plants are Maryland natives? How do we identify Maryland native plants when we go to a nursery? How do we find nurseries that carry a wide choice of native plants? This bill seeks to address these issues by establishing a list of commercially available Maryland native plants that both consumers and the nursery trade can reference on state websites. By creating a Maryland natives logo, which may be used by nurseries to label Maryland native plants. By creating a voluntary certification program for native plant growers and retailers who choose to sell a significant amount of native plants. Additionally, the bill adds Maryland native plants to the products marketed through the Maryland's Best Program and increases native plant education through a native plant specialist at the University of Maryland Extension. Requests of the extension for native plant information have been increasing significantly as consumers look to plant natives and nurseries to grow and sell more natives to meet that demand. Native plants are the most powerful tool we have to restore the biodiversity needed for our survival. And this bill gives consumers the information they need to find and plant natives. Please give a favorable report on SB 836. Next, uh, welcome. Judy Fulton, on behalf of the Maryland Native Plant Society, we strongly support Senate Bill 836. We're a nonprofit making a difference in Maryland for 30 years. SB 836 combines voluntary participation with public education and business promotion. Native plant sellers can grow their revenue while homeowners and landscapers can access the native plants they want. The University of Maryland Extension reported that interest in native plants has been ballooning. The most visited web page in 2022 was on Maryland native plants, with views increasing over 90% from 2021. Native plants are at the base of the food web, and people are at the top. If we don't encourage growing natives, beneficial insects will die off along with many of our crops. Over 95% of U.S. land birds feed their nestlings on native insects. When birds migrate or overwinter, they depend on the nutrition and fats in native berries. Without native insects and fruits, the skies will become silent. Without native plants and the rest of the complex interrelated food web, humans might not be able to survive. Biodiversity loss is as much a threat as climate change. According to a 2023 report, one third of the US plant species may go extinct. Plant populations that are too small or not genetically diverse can result in die-offs, similar to what occurred during the Irish potato famine. However, if we plant genetically diverse Maryland natives, they can cross-pollinate with their wild siblings. Plants will be healthier and more resilient in the face of climate change. As our wild areas disappear, native plants become more dependent on cultivated landscapes to survive. With this bill, the commercial Maryland native plant list will let us know what species can best help the environment so that they will become more widely available. We need to grow native plants so that the food web can survive. The Maryland Native Plant Society respectfully urges a favorable report on SB 836. Thank you for your time. Fulton. Jeremy. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. My name is Jeremy Tidd, and I'm the owner of Bonaterra. Uh, it's a 100% native plant nursery in Anne Arundel County. I'm strongly in favor of this bill that establishes Maryland Native Plants Program. Uh, Marylanders deserve to have a way to distinguish growers who have niche knowledge about native plants. This certification program will do just that. I've been growing native plants for over 18 years. I started with a six by six foot space in, my, in the back of my rental property and I've built it up piece by piece. 
By the end of 2020, I had created the largest all-native retail inventory of native plants in the D.C. area. Um, but I still had a long way to go to connect with Marylanders that are seeking to buy native plants. It took several years of outreach and advertising to connect with enough people to believe that I will not run out of operating capital before the customers who seek to buy my plants uh, find out where I am. Uh, now I'm looking forward to a really good year, but if this bill had already been in place, potential clients could have found my business on the Maryland's Best website, and my business could have been providing many more essential plants to Marylanders. Um, I got into this business because everywhere I look, I see beautiful and unique ecosystems at risk because we don't know how much we depend on the native plants around us. I love the Maryland ecosystem, and like all ecosystems, it is unique. It's one of a kind. Um, there is only one Maryland ecosystem in the world, and if you love Maryland, then you need this bill to be the next step in helping to protect it. Uh, passing this bill will ensure the next time someone who's building a native plant business from the ground up comes along, they will have a way to connect with the people who need those native plants. Thank you. Mr. Tid and Bona Terra, Good Earth? Yes. In Italian? Yes. Okay. Or Latin. Or Latin. Greek. Greek. Okay. <laughs> All right. I am not fluent in any of those, but yeah. yes. Cool. Uh, welcome. Are you Sarah? Hello. Um, my name is Dr. Sarah Tangren, and the Green-Towson Alliance, I am testifying in favor, the Green-Towson Alliance proposed this bill to improve the commercial availability of Maryland native plants, and they invited me to speak because I have published research on this topic. In 2018, I led a team that surveyed 760 people who use native plants and seeds as part of their jobs in the Eastern United States. Here are the survey results. 94% of respondents say commercial shortages make it difficult for them to purchase native plants and seeds. 95% want more continuing education opportunities, fact sheets, and research. 75% expect their demand for native plants to increase. 74% said they prefer locally sourced native plants and seeds. 418 miles is the average distance that respondents go to buy locally native seeds. <laughs> And even though we didn't ask any questions about labels, 46 respondents wrote comments about bad experiences they've had with poorly labeled potted plants. Nine prior surveys conducted from 1998 through 2011 produced similar responses. My colleagues' concerns about poor commercial availability are well supported by the literature. Thank you. Dr. and Marie Laporte, Sierra Club. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. Marie Laporte speaking today on behalf of the Maryland chapter of the Sierra Club and its 70,000 members and supporters in support of SB 836. You may think this little bill isn't very important, but we're really here today talking about human existentialism. Native plants are the keystone food for much of our wildlife, including existentially important native pollinators. Many insects, even birds and bats are important pollinators, but bees are among the busiest. Of the 100 crops that supply 90% of human nutrition, over 70 require bee pollination. According to the US Geological Survey in almost all crops, Native bees are the primary pollinator or they significantly supplement the, the activity of European honeybees. Even crops like cotton and soybean and peppers that don't need a pollinator have higher yields if visited by bees. To put it simply, native pollinators are critical to sustain our food production and they need native plants. In addition, three quarters of all North American plant species require an insect, frequently bees, to pollinate them to produce seeds for reproduction. Without pollinators, these plants die out. Imagine losing three quarters of our plants. 
Additionally, native plants, which are frequently de deep rooted, help with stormwater management, sediment control, and bay health. Marylanders want to help by planting native plants. And this bill would supply us with valuable information when we are planning our garden, at point of purchase, about what is native and what will grow best in our setting. This voluntary program will also help develop the Maryland native plant grower and retail business. This program is good for the environment. It helps build Maryland grown products to address a growing consumer market opportunity and helps support consumer interest in these essential plants. We hope you'll give a favorable review to SB 836. Um, colleagues, um, questions for Senator Brooks or the witnesses, and I see Senator Washington to kick us off. Thank you so much, Senator Brooks, for putting this bill in. I really wanted to, and I, we couldn't we couldn't make it work. So I'm just so so grateful, uh, and so uh, that you, that you were able to do this. Yes. Um, so just in case you know someone raises it, um, uh, we we heard that there was already that there is a list that is considered the native list that is produced, I guess, by DNR or someone. I I believe that you have some. You said that there's some differences. Could you could you address that? Thank you. I mean, this is Kirsten Hoffman. Um, yeah, so uh, a bill was passed last year, um, I believe SB7, HB15, that required the DNR to post a list of Maryland natives on their website. Um, from speaking with uh, the DNR, they were going to post um, a botanical publication called The Vascular Plants of Maryland. And it is a very long PDF, hundreds of pages, and it lists everything that grows in Maryland. So you would have to kind of filter through the PDFs and look for the lines that say native um, or the symbols that indicate which ones are natives. So it's not that user friendly. Um, it's a very important document. And what our bill proposes is that there is a searchable website called the Maryland Plant Atlas that uses that document, pulls out the natives. And so that this that would be the base of what we would say that the natives to, to more easily find the natives. We take this a step further because not everything on that list is what you want to find in a nursery. Um, and so then we kind of pared down the list and that's our commercial native list that the bill mentions so that it is what is being commercially grown, what's gonna work in our landscapes and in and our homes and our yards and things. So it's it follows the effort, it, it continues it to get it to work for this bill and this environment that we're promoting. Um, thank you, Senator Washington. Uh, just a very quick follow-up to Senator Washington's good question. Uh, Ms. Hoffman, is that hundreds of page document not searchable? It's it's a PDF. PDFs are searchable. You can do a control um, F on the word native or something and run through that. If you yes, it's in that sense, yes. Um the, the database you actually you know you can type in your plant name and, and you get various you get the families, you get your genus and species, and you get a lot of more information. Okay. Um, it seems like it's it's an easier to use. And to understand the vascular plants, you do need some botanical knowledge. It's organized by families, which are not the names you see at the nurseries when you go. So it's not a direct relationship. And there's a, a pretty extensive symbology that you need to understand in order to, to kind of weed your way through it. Well, the good senator from the 43rd district has the green thumb. I'm afraid I have the black thumb in this because I'm, I'm terrible at this stuff. So uh, other questions for this panel or for Senator Brooks? Seeing none, we thank you for your testimony and we'll bring up additional witnesses. Uh, next up, Meredith McDonough, Nancy Lawson with Humane Gardener, Doug Myers, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. <clears throat> Uh, Amanda Ray, Wild Ones, Greater Baltimore. And I think we have one more seed is uh, Jane Henderson, Chesapeake Natives. Come on up. And you may go in any order or the order in which I called you, whatever is your preference. Sure, I'll go. Okay. okay, thank you, welcome. You have up to two minutes each. Thank you. My name is Meredith McDonough, speaking for several garden clubs. I'm in favor of SB 836. Every spring, I impatiently wait for the Indian pink to bloom, calling hummingbirds to drink. Summer brings red cardinal flower, followed by lavender obedient plant. Then in fall, a large flock of chattering robins feasts on the red berries of my American holly. 
What links these experiences together is literally the buzz and vibration amongst the native plants. I feel very happy to feed hungry creatures as I am in their world. The garden is alive, it's activity central. If I do not see insects on a plant, then there's a good chance it's not native, not even a good food or habitat source. Over the years, I see fewer native plants on my land. My garden is now quiet. It may look pretty, but it lacks vibrancy, quite flat. It is becoming a dead zone. What natives are left withstand drought and deluge, require minimal care. So I am planting more natives. We all need to do this for our future. I want more support finding straight species natives so that shopping in real time is productive. A huge thank you to educated staff at nurseries offering natives and good signage. Such attributes are lacking at big box stores and little opportunity for any of this in very urban areas. I support a native plant specialist who would change public perception and behavior from choosing just pretty plants to those with ecological benefit. Centralize and publicize information on natives, including plant sales of partner organizations. Influence natives use on public land and update old county landscape manuals. Stay current on timely research. Support all stakeholders for success. Thank you for a favorable vote on this bill. Uh, Yes, Doug. Good afternoon, committee chairs, co-chairs. Uh, my name is Doug Myers. I'm the Maryland Senior Scientist at Chesapeake Bay Foundation. We support SB 836 uh, because it covers all the bases, sales, education, marketing, and promotion. Native plants are best adapted to our seasonal weather patterns. They store water in the root zone and withstand droughts and floods, all the while absorbing excess nutrients and stabilizing fine sediments. Native plants need no additional fertilizer and provide cooling shade. SB 836 emphasizes education and marketing are essential as any trip to Home Depot or a garden center will leave you overwhelmed with landscaping choices, but little to no information on what is native to your area. The addition of the Maryland Native uh, Plant Extension Agent uh, can deepen our, all of our knowledge about Maryland's Appalachian, Piedmont, and coastal plain ecoregions, and things like there are different genotypes for even the native plants we use. Uh, in Chesapeake Bay Foundation's restoration projects, uh, we have to grow our own native trees because there's just generally not available uh, all the species and the right size stock that we would need to supply all of our restoration programs. Extending the range of native plants um, will also extend the support system for native birds and other wildlife. <clears throat> As CBF has discovered with its Keystone 10 Million Trees initiative, nurseries were unprepared for the sudden uh, demand for native trees in Pennsylvania. SB 836 will help us make the transition here in Maryland for the Tree Solutions Now Act, which was passed by this body last year. We urge a favorable support uh, for this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Yes. Please, welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Nancy Lawson. I'm the author of The Humane Gardener and the co-chair of Howard County Bee City. When I began growing a plant called butterfly weed from seed a couple decades ago, I did it because the flowers were my favorite color. It was only later that I realized just how important they were to butterflies because I saw monarch caterpillars munching on the leaves. When I started growing switch grasses, I did it because it added structure and beauty to my garden. But then I saw it also brought so much life when a whole flock of sparrows came and devoured the seed heads. At the time, none of my local nurseries sold native plants. I hadn't learned about them in school. There weren't many resources uh, to consult. Instead, it was the animals who taught me that for wildlife, native plants are not just a preference, they're home. At my place, they're the homeland of wood thrushes, Baltimore Orioles, tree frogs, eastern box turtles, where once we had only a single butterfly species, we now have dozens. And we also host Bombus pennsylvanicus, which is better known as the American bumblebee, now a threatened species here in Maryland. These local flora and fauna are some of the original Marylanders. They're as much as part of the place as 
the Chesapeake Bay and the Allegheny Mountains. Native plants are foundational, providing food, shelter, and protection from the storms, yet many people don't even know their names. I only know because I did extensive research for years. I became a Maryland master gardener, master naturalist, and certified Chesapeake Bay landscape professional, and I wrote two books on nurturing local habitat. Most people don't have time to go to such lengths to learn about plants, even if they want to help the environment. But if we strengthen our labeling and education efforts, they won't have to. They'll learn on quick visits to the nurseries, on quick uh, visits to our state agency websites. SB 836 will empower consumers and businesses to do their part to restore the real natural Maryland in our own backyards. Thank you for considering this important legislation. Very cool, your work, thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm uh, very pleased to be here today and appreciate your attention to this bill. Uh, my name is Amanda Ray. I'm president of Wild Ones Greater Baltimore, uh, part of the national group Wild Ones, which has supported native plant landscaping education uh, around the country for more than 30 years. We strongly support SB 836. Native plants have evolved to serve as essential food, shelter, and medicine for native wildlife. Exotic non-native plants have altered our natural landscapes to such a degree that you can see trees engulfed in vegetation along the interstate. Exotic non-native plants dilute and degrade the quality of our natural ecosystems and lead to the decline and extinction of insects and fauna that depend upon them. Because retail inventory of native plants at local nurseries is often scattered among branded non-native plants, gardeners wanting to establish native plants on their property can become discouraged if they cannot find what they are looking for. Compounding this, nursery center staff may have little knowledge of natives. I recently spoke with a staff member of my local nursery who was not able to demonstrate basic knowledge of native plants and indicated he often recommended certain invasive plants because he did not know what native plants to recommend instead. He said he would like to have this information. Commercially branded names like Proven Winners are designed to attract the attention of customers with appealing colors and imagery on their tags and pots. These tags on non-native plants lure customers into a purchase that may appear to be beneficial. In actuality, the real proven winner is a locally grown native plant that has already proven itself by having evolved for millennia to be perfectly adapted for our local conditions. This means it will do well for the gardener while also helping the ecosystem survive in our critically important Chesapeake Bay watershed region. We ask for a favorable report. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ray. Appreciate it. And we must be Ms. Henderson. Yes. All right. Welcome. Um, Vice Chairman, Chairman, thank you for an members of the committee opportunity to talk to you. My name is Jane Henderson. I am the executive director of Chesapeake Natives. Since 2005, Chesapeake Natives has been growing, promoting, um, and um, uh, encourage and uh, protecting native species of the Chesapeake Bay region. Uh, we grow, we are also a nursery. We have a nursery in our location in, um, in Rosaryville State Park down in Southern Prince George's County, where we grow local ecotype native species. I wanna just underscore the existential piece of this. This isn't just about that biodiversity is cool. And it is about about and it is about food production, but it's also about the inhabitability of our planet. The inhabitability of our planet. If if we go on the current trajectory in which we continue to lose insects uh, at the rate we are, we will the planet the biosphere will literally rot, and we'll have fungus and bacteria will take over and we won't be able to live on this planet anymore. So this is really more. It's about more than just being groovy to be into, frankly, to be biodiversity. It's about our, our life on the planet as we know it. Um, I We are highly favorable of this. Um, people, I'm not gonna repeat things that people have already said. We do, however, have a, a favorable amend, some favorable amendments we'd like to make. And I've been in touch across the aisle through the house. I'd like to talk to your office as well. Um, 
there is no focus in here on what we would call local ecotype native species, which are a subspecies of native plants. And to understand a little bit about that, sometimes a native species can span a continent. And within local regions, they literally develop genetic differences. And so they bloom when local populations need them most. And so we would like to see some recognition and maybe, eat, and I, we don't want to complicate this because we like this bill a lot, but to, to at least task the extension agent with focusing in on identifying sources of local seed um, that people can use for production. So, you know, under this, currently someone could uh, bring native plants that were grown in Oregon and sell them here in Maryland and that from seed that is used to the Oregon ecosystem and not ours. So we're signed up as favorable. So if you are favorable with amendments, if you could please put something in writing so that um, the committee and our council. Okay, have I will to be in touch with the and with the sponsor for sure. Yeah, yeah, both. That would be great. Um, before we take questions, I uh, I'm inclined to bring. What? Oh, uh, I think is John Murphy here from the Maryland Green Industry Council. Okay, uh, please, Senator Augustine. I, before you leave, I just want to say hello, hello. to my constituent yes. and my neighbor, Jane. Yeah. It's good to see you. Nice to see Thanks you. for being here. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I will. Yeah, I can. If one of you could just step back for Mr. Murphy, that would be great. Mr. Murphy, why don't you come on up? You are favorable with amendment, and then we will take questions for any of anyone on this panel. Uh, Maryland Green Industry Council, welcome, Mr. Murphy. You have up to two minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Congratulations on the new uh, committee, EEE, and uh, thank you, Chair and, and members here. So uh, we have a, a okay. amendment we'd like to see favorable with amendment on here. We've um, actually talked to some of these folks in the past um, on a little bit about this. So I'm going to read this quick so I don't mumble. Um, so we support with amendment. The Maryland Green Industry Council represent nursery landscape greenhouse garden center and arboriculture professionals is opposed to Senate Bill 0836 Maryland Native Plant Program as written. However, it would offer support of this bill with amendment. As written, a bill seeks to define a native plant as one that does not include a named or unnamed cultivar or a hybrid. The amendment proposed to remove this language, which is found on page two, lines 13 and 14 of the bill. The industry as a whole encourages the planting of native plants. Industry values their importance, loves to sell them, encourages customers to plant them. Uh, plants, however, routinely cross-pollinate and hybridize naturally. Natural mutations and vegetations occur in native populations as well. Cultivar names are given to these plants to distinguish their the physical differences, but they are no less native than the original plant. The original species can be des designated as such, but cultivars should not be excluded as a native. Cultura, uh, cultivars may also be intentionally grown for purpose to create a plant with greater benefit to habitat and ecosystems than the original native. Benefits may include such traits as greater fruit yield or enhanced pollination tendencies, characteristics that would serve wildlife in the ecosystem. Also note the cultivars serve to protect the survival of entire species. Case in point, the American elm population, a tree native to North America was virtually wiped out after it succumbed to Dutch elm disease. USDA has successfully developed a disease resistant cultivar, which has enabled the species to be reintroduced and thrive both in the build landscape and in the wild. For example, recently, planted American elms in the National Mall in DC are products of disease resistant cultivars produced originally by the USDA. Without the work done to produce the native cultivar, it's safe to say that American elm population in the United States would be on the brink of extinction. And this is just one example of native species being saved by the production of native cultivars. Nurseries and retailers in Maryland seek amendment to the bill to remove the language that exclude cultivars from the definition of the native plant for the aforementioned reasons. Industry leaders also note that there are a very limited number of businesses that do not grow and sell cultivars or natives in itself without cultivars. The elimination of a plant that is named for unnamed cultivar hybrid from the proposed native plants program will effectively squash the program. Magically, magic respectively requests an amendment to 
Senate Bill 0836 to remove lines 13, 14 from page two to Bill's original draft. To give you a little more information, I'm a, I'm a grower myself. I grow natives, I grow perennials. Um, anybody wants to buy some natives, please give me your cards. I can hook you up with many people in the state of Maryland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Um, are there questions for anyone on this panel or the folks who are sitting behind them who have already testified? Madam Chair. We have, yes, sir. Oh, may I say something? Of to course, the, yeah, okay. Senator. Yeah, uh, Mr. Murphy, yeah. Uh, right now, our position is that cultivars and nativars are what fill most nurseries now. And the purpose of this uh, program is to encourage growers and retailers to include uh, native plants, including uh, cultivars and nativars in this list would not achieve that purpose. Uh, and for the benefit of, of the committee, uh, cultivars and nativars, a, a cultivar is a plant variety that has been produced uh, in um, cultivation by selective uh, breeding and most notably known as uh, cloning and hybridization. And a nativar, that's a native plant that occurs naturally uh, in a given location or region. And a native bar is sometimes uh, is a natural variant that you probably uh, wouldn't find in nature in most places. So to just to give you a little, a little uh, background on what those two are. So, thank you for educating you. us. Okay. Yes. All right. I see no other questions for these panelists. So we thank you for your testimony. There are two witnesses who are virtual. So let's shift to them. They are both favorable. So first up, Robert Jenks Jenkins with Blue Water Baltimore. Is he here? All right, Mr. Jenkins, welcome to the committee. You have up to two minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I'm Robert Jenkins. I work for Blue Water Baltimore. Uh, we are an environmental nonprofit that focuses on water quality and strong communities within the watersheds that feed down into the Inner Harbor. Um, I run our native plant program, Herring Run Nursery, and that is a core part of our work uh, operating the nursery and specializing in plants that are native to Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Uh, we are writing today in support of the Maryland Native Plant Program, SB 836. Uh, as many others have already mentioned, uh, native plants are an integral part of a healthy and a functioning ecosystem, and they need to be things that we are aware of and, and encouraging. Um, what we have found is that a number of the folks that come and visit us at the nursery um, are confused uh, or uncertain about whether a plant is native or not. And it, a lot of times it depends on the source of information um, that they're looking at. Uh, our nursery staff is responsible for engaging and educating Baltimore communities, our customers, about the many benefits and uses of indigenous plants. Uh, SB 836 will support these efforts by providing uh, a centralized resource and education, uh, materials that are readily available to anybody, readily available and accessible to anybody that's a Maryland resident or beyond, uh, as well as providing information on where, where folks can find these na native plants. Uh, SB 836 is also going to support the growth of native plants and the native plant industry in the state. Uh, education paired with the voluntary participation and labeling of plants as Maryland natives uh, will act as drivers within the industry. And competition is a good thing, right? I don't want somebody to put me out of business because we have so many, so many people growing native plants. However, it's a good thing because we want more native plants. And this act is gonna certainly incentivize growers and retailers to do so. Uh, we urge a favorable report on SB 836. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. William Hubbard from the University of Maryland is up next, and he will be our final witness on this bill. Mr. Hubbard, welcome. You have up to two minutes for your testimony. Thank you. Yes, and I would like to uh, clarify that we are in favor with amendments to Senate Bill 836. So good afternoon. My name is Dr. Bill Hubbard, and I serve as an assistant director for natural resources and environmental programs with the University of Maryland Extension. Our agency provides applied research, education, and assistance for Maryland's agricultural and natural resource communities. We too have certainly witnessed a dramatic increase in interest and requests for native plant information and training uh, in Maryland. The results have placed a increased demand on our extension specialists and agents who serve both 
the residential and commercial stakeholders in our state. From the residential side, you've heard about our flagship, uh, one of our flagship programs, the University of Maryland Home and Garden Information Center, uh, regularly receives over 6 million page views a year. Uh, they have witnessed a dramatic increase in questions regarding native plants uh, related to planting and maintenance recommendations, managing insects and diseases, and where to find native plants for home and commercial plantings. Our county-based home horticulture and master gardener coordinators, too, have witnessed a huge increase in, in these kinds of requests. From a commercial horticultural perspective, our specialists and agents have reported a huge increase in requests for native plant consultations. This bill would require our agency to teach growers uh, techniques and other topics. We currently cooperate with Maryland Department of Agriculture, and we would plan to uh, continue that good working relationship with the uh, Maryland Department of Agriculture. Uh, we currently work with them on seafood safety, nutrient management, a number of other programs. We do not currently have a native plant specialist. This uh, bill under its current language would uh, require uh, additional resources to be able to hire someone with uh, expertise in this area. So we support this bill uh, with the amendment, uh, several amendments we are working with the sponsors on to cross file this and work to ensure that extension can provide support and expertise that aligns with our mission and ensure that we work together with the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hubbard. I see no questions. So we thank you very much for your testimony and the work that you are doing. That completes the hearing on Senate Bill 836 and giving it back to the chair. Okay, next up, we're gonna to go to Senator Kramer on Senate Bill 495, Senator Kramer. And I'm gonna bring up your sponsor panel. You've got several in-person and then we've got some virtual. So we'll take the in-person testimony first, then we're gonna do the virtual okay. sponsor panelists. And then we'll go to the unfavorables after that. Uh, Lisa Radoff, Jennifer Bevan Dangle, Vicki uh, Katrinak. Um, those are the in person. We do have some sponsor panelists virtual. Video, let's, right? yeah. Yeah. Senator Kramer, and I understand you have a video. And I, you know, I understand also just keep it, you know, just, you know, I think for some folks, it could be a little disturbing, yes. uh, this video. So just a little heads up on that front. But in any event, back to you, Senator Kramer on Senate Bill 495. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, Ben Kramer here to introduce Senate Bill 495. Um, I do have a brief video and colleagues. Uh, very sadly, it, it is disturbing. Um, I'll discuss a little bit more about it as I uh, go into my comments and give greater context as to where this video footage came from and, uh, and its importance. So with that, if we can crank the volume up and get it playing, please. Thank you. For more than 50 years, various companies have bred dogs at this dog factory farm to sell to laboratories, which kill them in experiments. Here, a supervisor with no veterinary training inserts a needle into a puppy's head without anesthetics in a crude attempt to drain fluid from a wound. Workers with no veterinary training put some puppies down by trying to inject euthanasia solution into their hearts, causing excruciating pain. Nursing mothers and their puppies were left to cower and tried to escape while the supervisor and others blasted the kennels with a high pressure hose. The animals ended up soaking wet and were left that way. The dogs had no beds, no toys, no stimulation, no real lives. They're just being warehoused. Deprived of any opportunity to run, play and simply act like dogs, these beagles just pace back and forth and jump up and down. The qualities that make these small, gentle, eager-to-please beagles great companions 
also make them animal experimenters' preferred victims. The deafeningly loud, crowded, and stressful conditions cause the dogs to fight. Female dogs are bred twice each year for up to seven years. Many gave birth to puppies on the hard floor until workers saw them in labor and put a plastic tray on the bottom of the cage. Over the course of the investigation, PETA's eyewitness found more than 350 puppies dead among their live littermates and mothers. Some puppies fell through holes in the cages and ended up in the drains, soaking wet and covered with feces, bedding, and waste. After a few weeks, these loving, devoted mothers were taken away from their puppies so that the puppies could be sold to experimenters. For their final two days with their puppies, workers intentionally deprived nursing mothers of food. According to a supervisor, inspectors with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA, told management to feed the dogs through their last day, but the supervisor refused and continued to deny the nursing dogs food. This week they did not get fed, but if too many people know it, it's going to get out. That's what we're doing, yeah. then it's going to get bad. I never fed them yesterday. And as USDA officials raised other concerns, the supervisor had this to say. It's a damn game you got to play to, to satisfy because of the bullshit that they can make happen. These dogs should live as all dogs deserve to, in loving homes. But thousands of them remain imprisoned in this breeding mill, suffering, destined to be sold for painful, pointless experiments around the world. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, now you present the bill. Yes, thank you. Colleagues, eight track tapes, camera film, dial up internet, public pay phones, bedside alarm clocks, and video rental stores, all at one time served a purpose. However, they all have fallen by the wayside as technology has opened the door for new and better alternatives to serve our needs. Unfortunately, while these 20th century archaic devices are all in the rear view mirror, cruel and inhumane experiments, reminiscent of medieval torture chambers, continue to exist to this day and right here in Maryland. Sadly, even with incredible 21st century technology and innovation, public and private research facilities continue to abuse animals by dripping ulcer causing chemicals into their eyes, forcing poisons down their throats and injecting pesticides up their nostrils. They are deafened, blinded, burned, infected with viruses and diseases, and very typically given little or no relief from their pain. As a consequence of these experiments, the animals suffer from vomiting, diarrhea, paralysis, convulsions, seizures, boils, internal bleeding, and oftentimes death, which is probably the most merciful outcome. Colleagues, the video that you just saw is not nearly as graphic and gruesome as many of those that have been smuggled out of research facilities. The suffering animals that you saw in this video were filmed just in the past year in two different facilities subject 
subject to the federal Animal Welfare Act laws that people mistakenly believe ensures the proper care and well being of animals and research. The company that allowed the suffering in those videos, if you were able to even watch it, um, um, were um, not, uh, well, I went on to say that poisoned, and, and I, you saw it, that poisoned the beagle that you saw dying at the end of the v video that laid there until it finally passed. And by the way, the hand that you saw trying to comfort that beagle was the person who got in from the Humane Society and was able to videotape what was happening and tried to comfort that dog poisoned and left dying on the floor. The company that did that is named Inotive. It is one of the top animal research facilities in the world. Inotive is the parent company of Invigo, the same facility that you also saw in the video that housed thousands of beagles in vile conditions with puppies left dying in cages and with non-veterinary employees euthanizing dogs without anesthesia. Inotive is not some third world entity and in fact is experimenting on dogs right now in Montgomery County, where they just built their East Coast headquarters in Rockville. Colleagues, once again, these facilities are fully regulated by the same federal agencies that you're going to hear the opponents come to this bill come up and say, that's the reason we don't need the legislation before us the same regulations that govern those facilities are why they're gonna say, we don't need regulations. The opponents are further going to say, trust us. We are subject to federal inspections. We have licensed veterinarians on staff. We have oversight boards. Every one of the videos that have been smuggled out of these facilities all have those exact same requirements and regulations. And yet the horror shows that are revealed in the videos always document those federal regulations are meaningless. Um, I in fact have pages, pages of documents and videos and photos that when revealed show what really is happening in these facilities. The USDA is charged with doing inspections. They have roughly 100 inspectors, which is where they've been at for years, and they are responsible for inspecting roughly 10,000 facilities. 100 inspectors responsible for inspecting roughly 10,000 facilities in our country to believe that research facilities are actually receiving routine and thorough inspections is a fantasy and a fallacy. At its very best, the Animal Welfare Act relates to the care of animals while they are not being the subjects of the experimentation. It has nothing to do with the experiments themselves. Right now at Johns Hopkins, there are dozens of barn owls part of a highly suspect experiment that's been going on for years. They are strapped into tubes or leather jackets with their eyes pinned open and forced to stare for hours at a time at various flashing scenes to overload their senses. Their skulls have been cut open and sensors have been implanted deep into their brains to record brain signals in response to what they are witnessing. All of this suffering and pain because Hopkins claims that there may somehow be a relationship to these nocturnal wild birds of prey and attention deficit disorder in humans. Colleagues, to date, after all these years, this experimentation has yielded nothing 
but suffering for these animals and their death. By the way, these animals, like these owls, like 95% of animals aren't even covered by the Animal Welfare Act. The National Institutes of Health reports that 95 out of every 100 drugs that pass animal tests fail in humans. The opponents of this bill make the claim that we would not have cures for many diseases were it not for animal testing. That statement is disingenuous in the 21st century as animal testing in the past was the only, only major method employed to find a cure for human ailments. But now we have many, many new, exciting, and high-tech methods for experimentation that actually are providing far better and far more reliable outcomes for human beings. This past December, the FDA announced that it no longer will require that all drugs be tested on animals before human trials. High-tech alternatives include the use of miniature tissue models, organs on chips, organized computer modeling, along with other alternatives. So what does the bill do? It creates a state inspector of animal welfare and charges the inspector and the department with establishing a license fee for facilities experimenting on animals in the state to pay for and obtain a license. The license fees will cover the costs of the state inspector. There's no cost to the state in doing this. The state inspector is required to inspect a research or testing facility at least once a year or at least once every other year if the facility is registered with the United States Department of Agriculture. The state inspector may enter into an agreement with an animal welfare organization, a local animal control agency, or similar entity to conduct the inspections. Testing facilities, as defined in the bill that use animals for research, shall use an appropriate alternative test method if, if, this is the operative word here, folks, if it is available and if the appropriate federal agency has waived the need to use animal testing. The bill further provides that nothing prohibits the use of animal testing to comply with federal or state requirements. If it's required, then animal testing will be used. The bill further provides that a research facility also defined in the bill conducting biomedical research shall uh, report to the inspector how the animals will be used, whether there are suitable alternatives to the use of animals, whether human test subjects can ethically be part of the experiment, and whether animals are necessary to accelerate the treatment of humans. There are also additional reporting requirements to in help, help inform about the number of animals being used in experimentation and the purpose. The bill also provides that the use of dogs and cats in experimentation should be minimized to the greatest extent possible and provides additional protections for dogs and cats, including methods to minimize suffering when they are killed at the end of the experiment. It specifies a licensed veterinarian must do the euthanization, not just a lab technician with no experience, no understanding, who goes and just stabs one of these dogs and hopes for the best that maybe they got the uh, injection in the right place and leaves the dog suffering there until it dies. Colleagues, this bill will not inhibit research or discovery. It simply provides that where and when alternatives to animal testing are viable, use them. When possible, minimize animal use and the suffering. And it puts in place a legitimate process for increasing assurances that research facilities are actually complying with the minimal humane standards that currently exist. 
I am going to ask that when the opponents come up here and they simply say, trust us, trust us, this is the way we operate. We are, you know, we, we are doing all the things properly and trust us. Remember these videos, please, because those companies, until they were caught on tape, said the same thing. Trust us. We comply with all of the regulations. And by the way, we're regulated. That means we must be good. We are inspected. Maybe, probably at best once a year by an inspector who has thousands of facilities that they are responsible for. Um, I will point out, colleagues, that the fiscal note indicates that four people would need to be hired and also clerical staff. At the moment, there are 22 registered federal testing facilities using animals here in the state of Maryland. If they're inspected once a year, I don't think we need to have a staff of four, five, six, as was put in the fiscal note, to do the inspection of 22 facilities. That would be maybe four facilities for each individual once a year. Um, and I will also uh, remind you all that the license fees for testing on these animals will cover the costs. So there is no cost to the state for implementing this legislation. With that, I appreciate your time, colleagues. Okay, Senator, um, of your sponsor panelists, do you have any sequence you'd prefer? I'll leave it up to you. Who wants to go first? You can tell us your name and everybody's got two minutes each, okay? Good afternoon, Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Vicki Katrinik, and I'm the Director of Animal Research and Testing at the Humane Society of the United States. I'm pleased to be here today to provide testimony urging a favorable report of SB 495. We thank Senator Kramer for his compassion and leadership on this bill. SB 495 creates a comprehensive framework to limit unnecessary animal testing and provide protection for animals currently being used, including mandating the use of accepted non-animal methods for product testing, providing additional protections for dogs and cats, requiring facilities to obtain licenses and report on their animal use, and creating a state inspector position to conduct inspections. The animal research community has long espoused the values of the three R's. One, replacement of animals with non-animal methods. Two, reduction in the number of animals used. And three, refinement of test methods to minimize animal suffering. These principles for ethical treatment of animals in research were originally described by scientists in 1959. SB 495 seeks to ensure that all Maryland facilities are held to these very basic principles. In a YouGov Blue poll of Maryland voters conducted last month, there was strong support from Marylanders for several of the provisions in SB 495. 72% support banning animal testing to determine product toxicity. 80% support requiring the disclosure of the number of animals used in testing and the purpose of the testing and 82% support preventing institutions with repeated violations of animal welfare laws from receiving state funds for continued research. The provisions of SB 495 simply create a mandate for Maryland facilities to adhere to the three R's principles. HSUS urges a favorable report on SB 495. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go next. Okay, tell us your name. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Bevan Dangle. I'm the state director for the Humane Society here. I want to just build on the testimony you've heard. I think the senator did a very good job of explaining what's in the bill. I just want to explain where some of these concepts have come from. This is not an idea that is pulled out of nowhere. California last year passed very comprehensive legislation that bans exactly what this bill does. The use of animal testing where alternatives are already approved and existing. We're talking about things like food additives, household cleaners, items that simply do not necessitate the level of animal abuse that the senator has explained in detail. 
this own committee and the Senate, this chamber are on the record of supporting moving away from animal testing where it is no longer necessary. You and your great wisdom passed the legislation ending the testing of cosmetics on animals for future cosmetics sold in the state. And that's a good example of where we simply do not need this type of research. We're not simply up here talking about biomedical, although I know that that's what's sort of triggered tremendous response. We really are talking about the dozens of independent companies that are doing testing that we don't even truly know what it is in our own backyards, such as Innative, which we know is on the record of having animal welfare violations. We also want to talk about some of the work happening in Virginia around enhancing enforcement of the Animal Welfare Act because that state passed much stronger state level oversight when Animal Welfare Act violations occur. That is why that facility that you saw was finally able to be shut down and some action taken and those dogs saved. So the states have a valuable role in supporting and undermining and supplementing the Federal Animal Welfare Act and making sure that our institutions are meeting our humane values. Virginia is also on the cusp, or I guess their session's ended now, they're a bit more fortunate perhaps than we are, um, of passing reporting requirements. And so a lot of the ideas in this bill are already in different jurisdictions. And this is about Maryland putting together a strong framework of protection. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rado. Good evening. Chair Feldman, Vice Chair Kagan, members of the committee, the hour is late. My name is still Lisa Radov. I'm still the chairman and pre chair and president of Maryland Votes for Animals. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. You've already heard very compelling and excellent testimony from our sponsor and from my esteemed colleagues. I wanted to leave you just with a few kernels. If you think that in terms of testing with animals that um, it still needs to be relevant, a drug that some of you may have heard of, Lipitor, Pfizer's blockbuster drug for reducing cholesterol was not effective initially in animal experiments. And it was only after one of the researchers petitioned to get the drug to be tested on humans that it was found to be effective and is now the most prescribed drug in the United States. As Maryland moves forward with these state-of-the-art alternatives for animal testing, as you've heard, we need the extra protections in these bills, in this bill. Laboratories on Maryland, in Maryland need to be on record. They should be held to the highest standard out of respect for their subjects who did not contract or volunteer for these tests, nor are they compensated. Maryland's lab animals are counting on you. I'd like to thank our sponsor for this humane legislation and urge its passage in a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Senator Kramer, the sponsor, or his uh, panel? Uh, Senator Galleon, welcome back, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Senator, the video that was shown, uh, if I was very emotional, anybody that looks at that, one thing you mentioned later on was um, that they were caught. So the folks in that video, they were caught. So what they were doing is already illegal under federal statute, correct? When you say they were caught, so did they get in trouble or what? No, I didn't say they were caught. They caught on video what was happening, but that was video that was taken inside these facilities and then brought out. And in fact, the revelation um, where you saw that one facility in the beginning brought down that particular facility, a federal judge who saw this film footage was so incensed by what happened after the state stepped in and said, whoa, we need to find out what's going on. The USDA went in there. All It triggered all kinds of investigations. A federal judge stepped in and said, you all are now out of business. Shut the facility down. And even when it was shut down, they were trying to sell some of those 4,000 beagles that you saw in that video. This all just happened last summer and, and fall. And but the federal judge said, nope, where you're not going to sell them, you're not going to transfer for them. These dogs are going to be rescued. And it was all a consequence of getting that footage. So the footage showed what they were doing was illegal then under federal statute. It showed the barbarity of what was happening. And yes. So if it's if, it, if it's already illegal under the federal statute and this judge acted on that, what does this bill do that that federal statute wouldn't already cover? So what the bill does, importantly, um, provides that where there are uh, alternatives that are 
sanctioned by the federal government. So the federal government says, you may use alternative to animal testing, then the facility will use those alternatives as opposed to, yeah, you know what, it's simpler for us just to kill another hundred beagles. Um, they'll have to use some of the new modern technology as an alternative instead of killing the beagles and forcing them to suffer the pain that you saw in that one beagle who had poison shoved down its throat. And by the way, the veterinarian on call on that video um, there or at that facility didn't want to be bothered. That dog laid there until it died. Um, but the bill before you would say, if there are alternatives that are approved by the government, use the alternatives. And it also has now a state inspector to double down on putting eyes on these facilities so that you have a state inspector who will go in and help with our overwhelmed federal inspectors, as I indicated, roughly 100 for 10,000 facilities. We would then have a state inspector to go into these labs and see, is that what's going on? Or is it actually, if it's represented, everything's fine, by the way, when the opponents come up and say, we do all of this, it's, it's great, we're doing everything, then what do they fear about having a state inspector go in and put eyes on what it is they're doing to verify that everything is hunky-dory? And that's what the bill provides for. So it's, it's not preventing, it's just you know saying if there's an alternative and it's approved by the, the feds, then use the alternative. It also, you know, the goal is let's minimize uh, the use of animals where we can. And as I noted, puts into some, uh, a little bit of additional pro protections for our companion animals, dogs and cats, so that at a minimum we're ensuring at the end of, if they're not gonna allow the dog to be adopted, if it's gonna be killed, it's gotta be a licensed veterinarian doing it and, and let the inspector verify. That's what's happening. Okay, any additional questions for the sponsor or for any of the panelists? Uh, Senator Watson. Thank you for this. And I love my dogs and cats, but um, I'm not talking about dogs and cats here. I'm talking about animal research in general. You know, I had to, uh, several years ago, use a rhesus monkey, expose the brain, attach probes, and watch where the neurons fired. And that was the early experiments around <clears throat> speech recognition that we know today. The ability to use models has to start from true data captured from animals. And so, so when an inspector comes in, the inspector is not inspecting on processes and procedures. They're expecting on the humanity of the conditions of the animals undergoing tests or ensuring that when they're not undergoing tests, they're treated humanely, they have Precisely. proper space and all those things, right? Spot on. Okay. And so, and while the, the dog video was very disturbing, you know, I look at, you know, just as a scientist, all of the things that we've been able to discover over the years by using animals. And now that we've done it, now we're able to convert a lot of that to computer technology, artificial intelligence, and those types of things. Would this inhibit if we had another pandemic, right? And we had to speedily go down and, and come up with a new technology, say the mRNA or whatever it is, um, whereby the, the federal government allowed these expedient methods whereby final testing on a human subject was not required. In fact, it was done in, 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 uh, at the same time parallel with, with lab trials. But we do have University of Maryland, who's an R1 research facility. I just want to make sure that when we're talking about cutting edge technology, new uh, ideas for vaccines and, and uh, medicines and those types of things, some things you just can't automatically say this computer simulation will provide you the results. In fact, when uh, the COVID tests were being performed and they were being performed on lab rats. We have what, 90% of the same genetic codes, but the labs were not reacting as the scientists thought and they had to 
induce a mutation in the rats so that they experienced they had the same gene as humans and then they saw what was going on. So say all that to say is I'm fine protecting our dogs. I'm fine having an inspector come in and verify humane conditions. I just want to ensure that our research facilities can stay on the cutting bleeding edge of technology when it comes to new ways to protect humans. And in that um, we're not doing anything in our state to artificially preclude us from um, being able to go down that path. We are leaders here in Maryland and I, I want us to stay that way. And in that regard, there are two things in here. First of all, um, there is, with regard to biomedical research, there is nothing in here that addresses beyond the uh, requirement to share what they are doing. There's, there's a distinction between biomedical research and testing. And then the bill also specifies um, that nothing in the subsection may be construed to prohibit the use of a traditional animal test method to comply with federal or state requirements, even if there is uh, alternatives, but the government has concluded that they need to ensure the health or safety of the public. And therefore it's clear in here that they can bypass alternatives and, and use animal testing. So um, I think the bill very much distinguishes between biomedical research and just other types of testing being done on dogs or cats or other animals. So uh, your point is very valid and that was taken into consideration in the drafting of the legislation. Okay, Senator Hester. Thank you. And a point well taken, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd um, like to thank uh, the Senator for the question. Just, I'm, I'm really trying to understand this. Um, so I understand what you just said, Senator, but then the biomedical research definition, it includes medical devices and it includes, does not include drugs, medical devices, or vaccines. So, so, so it just seems like we're, what is it, what is biomedical research include if it doesn't include all these things? Like, is this definition like a standard definition or am I just, I mean, I could be really tired. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so the reason why it's drafted that way is that there is a level of toxicity testing that happens for drugs and vaccines. So what this is saying is if there's an alternative that could be done to, to, to test for toxicity or efficacy for those products, that, that they should use the alternative. However, before you get to the stage of putting them through that toxicity testing, that's where the biomedical research would happen, where you're trying to understand how a disease starts. You're trying to understand um, you know, what might work. So that's kind of the distinction when it becomes like a product that is going through a toxicity testing process where the FDA is asking for specific data. Um, if they did approve an alternative, we would ask them to use that instead. Okay, I may have to circle back, but I mean, this definition of biomedical research, is this a standard definition? Like, does this coincide with what the US FDA is saying? I don't think the FDA has a definition for biomedical research. Okay, if somebody could get back to me maybe tomorrow morning and I'm sure. fresh and help me understand this, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really confused. Thanks. Okay, any additional uh, questions for this panel? Okay, seeing none, thank you to the panel and to Senator Kramer. We do have some virtual witnesses as part of Senator Kramer's uh, sponsor panel, and we're going to go next to uh, uh, Lindsay uh, Sofes. Is, is Ms. Sofes? There you go. Uh, Lindsay, you've got uh, two minutes, and you're signed up favorable. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Lindsay Sofes, and I'm testifying on behalf of Rise for Animals, a national nonprofit organization that champions the interests of both humans and animals by opposing animal experimentation. I thank you for the opportunity to be heard today. Rise for Animals strongly urges you to support Maryland Senate Bill 495. I would like to draw your attention to three of this bill's important provisions. 
Firstly, this bill would ban research and testing facilities from devocalizing dogs and cats, thereby protecting research animals from an invasive surgical procedure that serves no scientific benefit, is undertaken in the interests of human convenience, such as noise reduction, masks signs of poor well being, such as excessive barking, and is detrimental to both the animal's physical and emotional welfare. Secondly, this bill would ban animal research and testing facilities from obtaining research subjects from Class B dealers and animal shelters, thereby bolstering protections for Maryland's homeless companion animal population and paying homage to a primary motivation for federal legislation. Indeed, the Animal Welfare Act's original incarnation was motivated by societal opposition to the practices of Class B dealers and the practice of pound seizure. And thirdly, this bill would require research facilities using animals for biomedical research to provide justification to the state inspector for their use. It is generally agreed that increased regulatory oversight is a necessary precondition to the realization of human relevant research. And by providing for increased state oversight of animal research undertakings, this bill is poised to benefit both humans and animals by weakening the industry momentum and entrenchment of animal research practices that forestall the development, utilization, and acceptance of superior human relevant methodologies. Rise for Animals thanks the committee for its time and consideration and asks that you favor Maryland Senate Bill 495. Okay, any questions for uh, our witness there? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna next go, we'll go through the uh, virtual favorables and then we'll go to the panel of unfavorables. Next up, Monica Engbretson. Engbretson, Ms. Eng, yes, there you are, Monica. <laughs> I do see yeah, you, you're, you're signed up favorable, two minutes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is Monica Ingeretson on behalf of Cruelty Free International, and we urge your strong support of this bill. I will just touch on a few points of the bill since this is such a comprehensive bill. Um, regarding uh, the mandate mandated use of alternatives, the bill requires the use of alternatives that have been approved for use by regulatory agencies and validated by bodies such as the U.S. Interagency Coordinating Committee on the Validation of Alternatives or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which publishes international test guidelines relevant for safety testing. It might be commonly assumed that once a non-animal alternative test is available, that the, not, that the animal tests no longer occur. The reality is, is that such animal tests can persist and even increase long after the adoption of a suitable alternative. For example, Cruelty Free International has created a list of 10 regulatory animal tests that are still conducted in the U.S. despite having valid non-animal replacements. Such animal tests are long overdue for re replacement, and SB 495 will identify what, if any, of these outdated tests are still being used in Maryland and help to complete the replacement process once and for all for scientific and ethical reasons. Another key point of this bill is regarding improving the law that governs the post-research placement of dogs. Um, Cruelty Fear International conducted a, a review of the state laboratory laws and concluded without specific reporting requirements, um, it's real hard to enforce these laws or to measure their life-saving impact. SB 495 would address this issue by requiring that laboratories in the state report the number of dogs and cats that are adopted into homes after their time in research has ended. Once again, we thank you for your consideration of this bill and urge your support. Any questions for the witness? Seeing none, we're gonna next move to uh, uh, Meredith Blanchard, uh, virtual part of the sponsor panel. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you members of the committee for the chance to speak with you today. My name is Meredith Blanchard and I'm speaking on behalf of the National Anti-Vivisection Society and our supporters in Maryland. I'm going to keep my comments to just two sections of the bill, but please do know that we support the bill in its entirety. SB 495 would prohibit the use of dogs and cats to assess the safety of products such as pesticides and food additives when such tests are not required by federal regulation. Ending animal testing that's not federally mandated is common sense, compassionate legislation. Dogs that undergo toxicity testing are truly living in a horror movie, as we saw earlier. The process typically includes forced feeding or forced inhalation of drugs, pesticides, and other chemical substances over a prolonged period of time. As the, as the study progresses, the animals are observed for harmful effects, such as heart failure, signs of cancer, respiratory failure, and death. 
Animals that survive this treatment, and many don't, are usually killed after the testing period and so, so that their tissues and organs can be examined. In light of the cruelty, it may surprise you to hear that these tests provide only negligible insight into how chemicals will affect humans. Dogs simply are not a reliable model for predicting a human response to toxic substances. What's more, non-animal tests exist, exist that are based off of human biology and therefore better predict human response. These non-animal methods include in vitro testing that uses human cells and advanced computer modeling systems. SB 495 will also create the state inspector position and inspection requirement for research and testing facilities that use animals. While it's true that the USDA does already inspect these facilities, reports abound that highlight the USDA's inability to adequately protect animals in laboratories. The animals being used and killed in the pursuit of science can use all the help they can get to ensure they're well cared for while they're alive. And for that reason, we enthusiastically support this bill's effort to get more eyes on them. Thank you for your time and consideration today. Okay, thank you. Any questions for uh, Ms. Blanchard? Okay, seeing none, uh, we've got two more virtual witnesses. I'm going to start with Sue Leary, who's again designated part of a sponsor panel. Ms. Leary, uh, you've got two minutes. We got on mute. I got it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and all the members of the Senate Energy uh, Education, Energy, and Environment Committee for this opportunity to provide uh, oral testimony in support of SB 495. My name is Sue Leary and I am president of the Alternatives Research and Development Foundation, which has made grants totaling over $4 million to advance new approach research methods that do not use animals. Uh, these new methods are model systems based on human biology and comprise some of the most exciting, innovative research in testing and biomedical research. I'm happy to let you know that some of our funding has gone to cutting edge research labs and testing labs in Maryland. So I, I would refer you to some written testimony that was prepared by our affiliate organization, the American Anti-Vivisection Society, which does have expertise in the area of welfare of animals in laboratories and has many members in the state of Maryland. But in my brief time here, I would want to highlight the important provisions of SB 495 that require the use of accepted alternative test methods, which are available. Um, and I, I thought that the bill did a good job of very clearly defining these alternative test methods and how they are accepted and under what conditions. Uh, it's completely appropriate that they should be used instead of animals in toxicological testing. Uh, having been involved in this field for decades, I can tell you this just makes a lot of sense. Uh, there's no reason why an institution of research excellence should prefer to use animals when alternatives are available. Um, not only is it unnecessarily cruel, but there are exciting possibilities now of new uh, technologically advanced methods. So thank you very much uh, for helping to provide some incentives. Uh, we urge a favorable report. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Any question for the witness? Okay, seeing none. So our final witness on the favorable uh, panel is Kimberly Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton, um, there you go, uh, you've got two minutes. Good afternoon. I am Kim Fullerton. I am vice chair of the American Bar Association Animal Law Committee. And I'm here today to represent the Maryland State Bar Association Animal Law Section. I think we've covered many of the points fairly in depth. So I will just go straight to the crux of what the issue really is to vote yes on this bill. And that's should Maryland limit unnecessary animal testing? Obviously that answer is yes. The issue before you is not about, will this impede acceleration? It is not about what methods are necessary versus unnecessary. And it's not about autonomy of the facilities. When we think about should Maryland limit unnecessary animal testing, there's actually quite a bit of common ground here. So I just wanna identify some of those points. I hope that we can all agree that we should source animals used in testing, at least dogs and cats, responsibly. Don't use the family pet. For dogs and cats that are exiting research, 
You should give them a chance to become a family pet or they should be euthanized responsibly. Another common ground point, if animal testing is unnecessary, we shouldn't be doing it. There's no reason to be doing it. When there's a widely accepted alternative method that would provide similar results with higher accuracy. We pride ourselves on our commitment to technology in Maryland, and we should hold ourselves to those standards. Another common ground point is that human health must be a top priority. This bill does not eliminate all animal testing. It eliminates unnecessary testing on cats and dogs. And as S Senator Kramer said, if animal testing is viable, then do it. This bill does not interfere with that. It does not impede biomedical research, safety, grade, or acceleration. So in voting, I hope you consider those points. Thank you, and I urge a fair report. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none. Um, that's the uh, favorables. We're going to go to a panel of unfavorables. I'm going to call up uh, Michelle Masucci, um, Eric Hutchinson, and Joseph Mankowski. Panel of three. Um, let's see, four people coming up. Uh, I think Brandon Kanig had signed up. Okay, you're not going to be testifying. Okay. Um, okay, whoever, whatever sequence you want to uh, go with, uh, each of you has two minutes. I'm happy to go first. Do I need to push this? Okay. Mike, a little closer, we're streaming this out, and then... Can everyone uh, hear me? Yes, and tell us your name, and then you get two minutes. Good afternoon, Chair Feldman, Vice Chair Kagan, and committee members. My name is Michelle Masucci, Vice Chancellor for Research at the University System of Maryland. Thank you for the opportunity to share our position on SB 495. We, we agree with the sponsor and his efforts to reduce animal testing and are supportive of developing alternatives for that. However, the video shown does not bear resemblance to our use and care of animal facilities and programs in our institutions. And apparently, as noted earlier, the system did work to stop the atrocities that were depicted. USM institutions conduct animal research in conjunction with federal research grants and contracts. We adhere to all federal regulations, are inspected once a year, subjected to unannounced inspections by federal agencies, have internal protocol measures and oversights in place, and provide an annual report to the USDA as a registered research facility. We also have accreditation by an independent outside entity to ensure our facilities are well managed and our animals are well cared for. All laboratory animal work at USM institutions must be approved by their institutional animal care and use committees in accordance with the Animal Welfare Act, the Guide for the Care and Use of an Laboratory Animals, and other federal regulations in conjunction with the accreditation standards. When researchers conduct animal studies, they must gain approval by their IACUC for their work and need to specify whether alternative methods are available. The bill is ambiguous with respect to animals covered, and that is be concerning because of the large scope of animal populations and species. It also creates a new licensing inspection and reporting requirement for dogs and cats, all of which are duplicative to the USDA requirements. Federal reporting would trigger state inspections, which in turn may be outsourced to contractors who are not held to the same inspecting standards as federal agency requirements. We embrace our ethical and moral responsibility to provide quality, compassionate, and humane treatment of all of our animals, which is why we have adoption policies in place for dogs and cats in compliance with Maryland law. Thank you, and respectfully, we ask for an unfavorable report on Bill SB 495. Okay, whoever wants to go next, uh, there you go. Tell us your name. Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to testify. My name is Dr. Eric Hutchinson. I serve as the attending veterinarian and um, the director of research animal resources at Johns Hopkins, as well as being an assistant professor of molecular and comparative pathobiology in the School of Medicine. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, say that Johns Hopkins University and School of Medicine oppose SB 495. As a veterinarian and recognized expert in animal behavior management, I take very seriously our dedication and responsibility to the welfare of the animals in our care. Simply put, my job is to take care of the animals. I am their advocate. Um, as an initial matter, I can assure you that uh, like the University of Maryland, none of what you saw in that video bears any resemblance to what you would see in a Johns Hopkins facility. 
Um, this bill does, however, have the potential to chill research in Maryland through its ambiguous reporting and unnecessary licensing requirements and other provisions that are duplicative of the federal requirements. The use of alternatives is already mandated and already used wherever possible. We already support their use, so much so that we are actually in favor of a bill sponsored by the Humane Society on, uh, in another committee to support an alternatives fund. I already spend about 10% of my time dealing with existing oversight and inspections. Um, oversight is very important, but that is time that I can't spend directly caring for animals. This bill would mean even less of my time gets spent with the animals, less time focusing on creating quality environments, less time maintaining their normal behavior, less time caring for their mental well-being, and more time dealing with paperwork. Given the strong oversight already in place for institutions like Hopkins and the University of Maryland and the continued critical need for animals and research, I respectfully urge the committee to uh, issue an unfavorable report on SB 495. Okay, thank you, sir. Go next. Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Joseph Mankowski. I'm a veterinarian and a scientist, professor and chair of the Department of Molecular and Comparative Pathobiology at Johns Hopkins. I also serve as the Associate Vice Provost for Animal Research at Johns Hopkins. Almost every medical advance, COVID-19 vaccines, insulin therapy for diabetes, cancer treatment, organ transplants, um, is the direct result of research performed in animals. Simply put, modern medicine as we understand it would not exist without research performed in animals, and this stands true today. For the reasons detailed in the Hopkins submitted rested, written testimony, the proposed bill will place unacceptable restrictive limits on our ability to perform groundbreaking biomedical research, research that has an essential and integral animal component. A prime example is the rapid development of COVID-19 vaccines in a time of great need across the world. Testing vaccines in animal models was essential to provide the world with effective prevention that limited the spread of SARS-CoV-2 and reduced disease severity. Much vaccine work was performed in Maryland at research centers, including Hopkins and University of Maryland, and by partners in the private sector as well. Ongoing work targeting next generation vaccines to improve our ability to prevent COVID-19 spread and future pandemics using well-designed animal models really align with our current three R principles. Our goal is to reduce animal models and research the best that we can. We're not at that point yet. There are numerous existing oversights in place that are mandated by federal guidelines for animal research. These are rigorous and they're not cursory. There's uh, no way to describe them as ineffectual. As mandated by federal guidelines, all research and teaching proposals that require use of animals at Hopkins are reviewed by the Animal Care and Use Committee, and they're also overseen by uh, the federal authorities, including the USDA. With that background, I thank you for, for the opportunity to testify in opposition to SB 495. Okay, thank you to the panel for your testimony. Uh, Senator Gowding. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, from the original testimony from the bill sponsor, it's kind of the gist of it to me was that the federal oversight is, is too light and you need more inspectors, state inspectors to come in there. Uh, so can you kind of dig in and let us know about those inspections? Like, you know, when's the last time you had somebody out to do an inspection and what, what it did, did it look like? Uh, so we are actually undergoing a USDA inspection right now. Um, I'm here in lieu of being there for the inspectors. Uh, luckily, I have a good team taking care of it. Um, but we are visited by the USDA at least every nine months. And it takes them a week um, during their time. Uh, sometimes they come more frequently than that. It depends on uh, whether they decide to do a SNAP inspection. So um, they're, they visit as frequently as they want to, um, but no less than every nine months. They're just one of the regulatory bodies that come visit us as well. Okay, let's go to Vice Chair Kagan, then we'll go to Senator Karen Lewis-Young and then to Senator Watson. So, Thank Chair. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for being here. Um, I think it's hard to, I mean, I had to leave. I, I think it's hard to think about abusing um, sweet animals who are trusting us. Um, and yet, as Senator Watson so beautifully shared, um, we need the research done. I have two questions for you. One is the description of the inspections and the precautions and the forms and all that that you all um, uh, are doing now. How recently has that been implemented? Have there been sort of improvement over the years um, that sort of we've stepped up and we do it better now is question one. And question two is Senator Kramer's bill has a lot of components. 
is there are there pieces in there that you say this could be good or this is helpful this is clarifying um you know that we're the good guys but there might be someone in the state who's not living up to this standard so i know that's a multi-pronged question if any or all of you can answer briefly um and address those i'd, I'd be really interested Um, I'm going to start with the second part of the question. I, this is not to sound flip. The devocalization part of the bill sounds great to me. We would never devocalize a dog for any purpose, period, honestly. Um, so to me, that's uh, that part sounds great. Um, and I am going to apologize that I, what was the, the first question is, are things getting better? Yes. In what in what period of time have have all of these protections been implemented? Is this the last few years? Is this an evolving so the animal, process? The Animal Welfare Act was in 1965, and then the regulations that required that every institution have an animal care and use committee, the body that actually oversees within the institution the work, that was in the 80s. Um, those regulations are under constant change and improvement. In fact, a new rule is just being issued by the USDA um, this year to cover birds. Um, so those those regulations are constantly changing um, and increasing increasing oversight. Meanwhile, the NIH um, adheres to the public health service policy, which also adheres to the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. I know that's a lot of words, but what it means is there's a book that's rev that's reviewed and renewed every 10 years or so that sets out what the current um, cutting edge standards are for animal care. And the NIH insists that you adhere to that guide. So at least every 10 years, all of that, all of the standards are getting rewritten. As you mentioned, are federal, whether that's NIH or regs or whatever. It sounded like, or maybe I discerned it incorrectly, uh, that both Hopkins and Maryland USM were, it sounded like you were doing a little bit above and beyond. If so I, speak to that, I would love to hear you. Thank you. Yeah, in my former role as vice president for research at Temple University, I was also the institutional official um, responsible for implementing regulations, not only surrounding animal care, but other types of regulations around research. And one of the things I think needs to be understood, excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. <laughs> um, one of the things I think that needs to be understood is that there's also a great deal of work that happens within the institution to ensure that uh, the protocols that are put in place um, receive the proper review, both for the scientific merit of the of those particular um, protocols, as well as the way in which the attending vet oversees the efficacy of that particular um, protocol. So you can't actually get your research approved without having an IACUC review it, without having an attending vet review it. And that is above and beyond the already existing approval for your research from your external funding agency. So there's multiple layers that go in place. It takes a very long time to write protocols. It takes an even longer time to get them approved. And then they're renewed uh, with attention to what might be changing in the science on a regular basis. So I think it's important to understand that there's a scientific community that is also at play here, constantly looking at doing whatever would be the best practice. I, I agree about the anti-vocalization uh, component in answer to your other question. And just I just to want to suggest that's where listening to this bill that you treat the frog in your throat humanely. Yeah. <laughs> it was a class A frog. Uh, <laughs> the, I, I would also want to add that both the University of Maryland uh, system and Johns Hopkins are ALAC international accredited. So that is a voluntary body that we actually pay to come in and inspect us every three years from top to bottom. Um, and that is a pro an auditing process that's much more extensive than any of the federal regulations. And again, holds us to a standard that is, um, their standard is essentially that you have to be uh, standing out among your peers in order to remain accredited. So I'm sorry, just one last question. Thank you. So you guys are the good guys, okay? Are there bad guys that this legislation would address? Are there folks who are slipping through the cracks who aren't paying extra, who aren't inspected every nine months and top to bottom every three years and stuff that we need to address through legislation? of some sort. Bless you. I think it was brought out earlier that 
you know, in fact, the oversight that did exist did in fact bring accountability to the egregious conditions that we saw represented in the video that I don't think a single person in this room would actually um, want to see replicated. It's certainly not the condition that you would find a university animal facility uh, uh, structured around, again, going to ALAC accreditation. I don't know how to explain to you just how um, uh, specific an ALAC accreditation requirement is in terms of the quality of the animal care facility, in terms of everything from the type of food that animals eat to the amount of recreation time that they get to the oversight and so forth. As was already mentioned by my colleagues, they, you know, the veterinary staff in universities are extremely dedicated to making sure that animals' welfare and safety is adhered to while simultaneously pursuing, you know, our needs as a society to gain research understanding from them in their use. Just as a matter of, of okay. you're going to get the last word because we still got a lot of work tonight. Oh, I can stop. Okay. No, you could go. No, I was just going to say as a matter of, of fact to answer it, in order to not be regulated by one of those federal bodies, you in the state of Maryland, you would have to be doing research using something other. You can't be a dog or a cat. It would have to be like a mouse or a rat. And you'd have to be doing something that was not federally funded in any way. And under those circumstances, you might not be federally inspected. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Senator Lewis Young, and then we'll um, bring some closure by Senator Watson. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your testimony. If, in fact, none of the institutions you represent are doing anything close to the video that we saw, I'm not sure I understand why you're so resistant to being licensed and regulated by the Department of Agriculture, which regulates all the veterinarians in the state, as well as our shelters. I don't understand why you would be different. And the second part of my question is, while you testified um, about the conditions of your particular facilities, can you also testify that the roughly 12 private labs in the state are following the same protocols that you are? Um, so the those labs, those private labs are subject to federal, the same federal regulations that we are. So they are being inspected by the USDA um, on the same every nine month basis. Um, do you want to answer the first part? I can. I mean, I, our, our opposition to this bill is um, based on a number of the stipulations in it. One is the duplicitous nature of, of the provisions for oversight, they are, um, it's double and double and double on what we already are subjected to. In addition to that, it's um, definitions of biomedical versus testing are seemingly very vague. And so the regulations against testing seem like they could apply to almost any biomedical research facility. Um, and that is that. Um, uncertainty is is pretty concerning. If I could follow up, I'm still not hearing quite why, if you're so compliant and you have such best practices, why you're resistant to licensing and inspection by the Department of Agriculture as all other entities that deal with animals are. Again, it sets up a duplicative system that adds another layer of the same exact inspections. It does not even call for its own employees, but would outsource the inspection to others because there is no infrastructure to actually implement the law as written. And I think that, as Eric mentioned before, um, USDA is on site now at Hopkins, and that's a team of inspectors over multiple days. And so it's an incredibly complicated and uh, intense review as well. So uh, the recapitulating the depth of that existing um, review by USDA would be very uh, challenging to do. I would also like to add that uh, part of what we have not talked about here is the ongoing everyday back and forth reporting that takes place to OLA as well as to USDA when institutions find that a protocol hasn't been adhered to in the way that it's supposed to. 
those in and of themselves can provoke yet another inspection. And the way this law is written, the idea behind it is to use the USDA platform as a basis for driving inspection in the state. So it is just really a convoluted way in which to add that uh, additional protection that you seek. Thank you. I think you've made a good case why technology would be more cost effective. Okay, Senator Watson. Uh, just, just one thing. The, um, I think the sensitivity of dogs and cats is we treat them like family members. How much of the research occurs at your facility that uses dogs and cats? Because I'm, I'm more, you know, comfortable and knowing about mice, rats, monkeys, but I've, I've actually never seen experiments done on dogs and cats. I can answer for USM. We, yeah. uh, we have very little dog and cat research that's going on. We do not do any class B research. Um, and I think uh, one of the things to understand is that when you're talking about animal research, class B um, are those that are uh, sourced from um, possibly your shelter and things like that. So we don't use pets in research. That's just not a thing uh, at the USM. There's my understanding, no uh, protocols at UMB and one um, behavioral study that's going on at uh, the University of Maryland College Park, which does not involve testing of animals right. in any way. And, and from a university's perspective, I mean, you understand when you're when you're doing your trials, it's all about sample size and peer reviewed stuff. You already have uh, procedures in place that minimize the use. You don't use Correct. more, you know, animals than you possibly need to be able to to have some kind of of confidence level in your your results, right? Correct. Okay. And that. You know, using 100 beagles in a study, as we heard earlier, um, I mean, that would be incredibly difficult to do and expensive. And again, uh, to reduce the number of animals in research is it's driven by so many factors um, that that's that's really a key initiative, too. OK, seeing no further questions, that concludes the bill hearing on uh, Senate Bill 495. We're going to next move to Senator Elfrith. She's got the final two bills. Uh, we're going to start with Senate Bill 508, and you've got, um, I'm going to call up uh, your two in-person sponsor panelists, Andrew uh, Garrison and Rachel Jones. So Mr. Garrison and Ms. Jones, and um, I believe you, no, I think you have the videos, I think oh, the next bill. Oh, right? That's for the next bill. Thank you, Lamar. Yeah. Mr. Okay. Chair, and Ms. Jones is I believe uh, she's watching the Secretary of Agriculture be sworn in at the moment. Okay, well, okay. If she shows up. Uh, she's on. So you've got uh, all the time you need to present uh, <laughs> Senate Bill 508. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Senator Sarah Elfrith presenting Senate Bill 508, Hemp Farming Program, Use of Hemp and Hemp Products and Consumable Products. Mr. Chair, let me just start off by saying that I owe Senator Zucker a box of donuts because any um, issue we had with the bill prior to the hearing, we just worked out in the hallway. So while waiting uh, on that last bill. So that's the good news. Um, I will be the first to admit that this is a new issue area for me. Um, I care about it simply because my constituents care about it. I represent a lot of farmland, a number of hemp farmers. Right now, the industry, as this committee knows, is, is incredibly unregulated. And this bill seeks to help uh, put some parameters around licensing and regulations. Um, keeping in mind that we hope that this bill moves together with the larger cannabis bill and so that nothing really falls through the cracks in terms of keeping our communities safe and uh, uh, emerging industry thriving. So Mr. Chair, with that, I'm just going to speak to kind of the framework of the bill. Um, and I'm going to let Mr. Garrison speak to the details that he knows better than anybody. So our goals here are really, um, we're going to present some amendments to this committee to create a licensing structure for those farmers who engage in this. Um, so a producer license that allows a person to plant, cultivate, grow, harvest, and dry hemp, a research license that allows a person to explore medical and public health benefits of hemp, and an industrial license that allows a person to utilize hemp as an agricultural crop for grain fiber content and bioproducts. Um, and the, the amendments will lay out those, those licensing structures as well. Um, and then we the contention here was on percentage and weights and things like that. I'm going to let Mr. Garrison explain that better than I, than I could. But overall, the goal here is to ensure that our farmers who are really get, just starting in this emerging industry have the ability um, to thrive in a way that's going to keep our communities safe. Again, we've been working very closely with MMCC. Sorry, Andrew. Okay. 
and Department of Ag, um, who's been working with USDA so that this bill, uh, after the committee uh, and its wisdom work through the details, is going to create, again, this structure and uh, uh, support an industry that really deserves, after a couple of years of kicking the can down the road, deserves some regulation. And with that, Mr. Chair, um, we will get the committee the um, agreed upon amendments once they are uh, in our hands. And I respectfully request a favorable committee report with those amendments. Okay, Mr. Garrison, welcome. You want those? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to briefly preview the amendments that that, that we've spoke about and, and kind of where, where our concern and position is here is to make sure that um, any restrictions that are placed on finished products make sense with the other regulations that exist elsewhere in the state, particularly with um, cannabis uh, as it's being contemplated through legalization as what's currently available in the medical marketplace, um, and then keeping any sort of restrictions from a plant basis uh, to a percent basis, which is used by USDA um, and the Maryland Department of Agriculture using that for plants and then using a milligram limit on finished products. And with that, it is consistent with uh, you know, best practices with a report that uh, my office submitted to the General Assembly this interim, um, as well as the um, the the federal farm or the federal hemp program as well, um, and uh, those recommendations. And then I'm here for any uh, questions or to work with the committee uh, on making sure those amendments uh, make sure that these pieces of legislation can talk to each other. Okay. Any questions for Senator Elfrith or for Mr. Garrison, uh, Senator Carozza? Thank you. And uh, this, too, is a new area uh, as well. So I'm just trying to understand what the bill actually does. Is this putting um, new licensing in place uh, for anybody that is going to produce hemp that ends up being consumed, question mark? And, you know, is this... Um, I guess how how does it fit into all the other work that's being done by the other committee in this area? So I just I'm really coming at it that I don't understand at this point what the bill does. No, I completely understand. And the bill is presented. There are pieces that we absolutely want to keep. The biggest issue, as I mentioned, is this weight and milligram and percentage issue that is complicated, but we're relying on um, Andrew and MMCC to get us an amendment that makes sure that whatever we produce in this bill is not going to be in violation of USDA and that, that, that we don't have because yeah. but I'm still trying to understand what the bill what you're amending okay sure so we're trying to regulate hemp farmers what they can grow and what they can use that product to produce because right now it's incredibly unregulated uh, in the state, there's some regulations, from my understanding, from the 2018 Farm Bill, but Maryland itself, um, we're kind of flying blind, um, especially when it comes to um, testing, transportation, and what those the the plant can go to produce. So this is trying to put some regulation behind that, um, and and that's the overarching goal here. Okay. Okay, hey, Senator Hester, and then Senator Washington. So MMCC. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, Maryland Medical Campus Commission. I see. Okay. And so I, I know that MDA was doing some work on this probably with MMCC. Have they been involved in the development of this bill? Yes. And have you seen their letter, which suggests a number of changes? Yes. So that's been a part of bringing everybody together in the miracle we just performed in the hallway. But, but yes, they're stuck in a bit of a, a pickle because of the federal farm bill and USDA regula FDA regulations. A little bit of both. A little bit of both. So that's the confusion. Um, so yes, uh, their biggest contention right now is on transportation and testing, and that's what we're still going to try to work through with them. But they've been, we've been working with them the whole time, and whatever I hope this committee produces will uh, take that into consideration. Okay, Senator Washington. Thank you. Um, are there are there licenses related to hemp farmers, or do we have any limits on licensing and things like we do with cannabis um so there's a hemp farming program that exists that registers hemp farmers with the department of agriculture um and that is where a lot of the farm growing occurs presently and what this bill is looking at um creating uh, or expanding that framework and um and what where we're interested in is making sure that that framework or path to market doesn't conflict with anything that's happening on the cannabis side of it right. because ultimately these are the same if not similar plants in a lot of instances and making sure that if it's farmed in accordance with this hemp farming program 
as long as the finished product doesn't conflict with the Canvas products, mm -hmm. um, then they have authorization through AG, um, but otherwise staying in the Canvas framework. And um, I almost hate it when people ask me this, but you always have to have an ans answer. So why, why, is this, why is the bill coming and why do we need it? Yeah. Um, the, the, um, the, the hemp farming program as it's currently existed and as it's been worked on on the federal level leaves a fair amount of ambiguity in terms of what is authorized at the federal level. And that's something that um, our office has struggled with and have written some reports on to that effect. Um, and so I think the intent here is to provide some clarity for um, legitimate hemp farming and allowing a path to market for legitimate hemp farming and hemp products and stuff that doesn't fall into a separate category of something that's more intoxicating, um, which can still be viewed if you're using the federal lens in this framework. Um, and that's really where kind of our concern is in making sure that that this piece of legislation, again, talks with the um, Senate Bill 516, uh, which will be coming in front of, of the Senate uh, next week. And then, so it's in our committee because it's in, it's hemp is in the agriculture code. Yes. yes. Right now. So you're saying this, and then, this is rather fluid because they're going to have to, as Andrew said, talk to each other. Right. And they're right. very related in many ways from the, the plant itself to a degree and percentage of the, the product, but we're still trying to create this, this industrial industry and everything kind of below what is intoxicating. We're trying to create that market for that. Are, are we anticipating a, a growth in this hemp market? Uh, is it growing? Are we trying to increase the number of farmers that are that are doing this? I, I believe it is growing. And I think uh, Ag, Department of Ag might have put some numbers in their testimony, but it is it is emerging. Yes. Is there, okay, just a little context, because this yeah. was in the purview of the Finance Committee. Um, we had legislation dealing with like a hemp, a, a derivative, if you will, of, of a product hemp. Delta 8 is what it's called. And I put in legislation last year. This is a product that's sold in convenience stores. We didn't have age limits. We actually last session put age limits on that product and it completely unregulated, untested. And that resulted in a study by the Cannabis Commission. In fact, Andrew was very much like a 130 page study during the interim that just got, um, yeah, he's looking at. So this is the genesis of this whole discussion about what's cannabis, what's intoxicating hemp. You know, we're regulating cannabis in this commission. But this hemp product that uh, can be intoxicating, um, you know, is, is subject to no licensing. And so it's that tension. And that's what we're trying to get a handle on. And 516 is uh, the Cannabis Legalization Bill, which I'm the sponsor of. I'll be presenting next <laughs> week. So obviously I'm in the middle of, of, of all this. Uh, but that started that conversation. I had never even heard about this Delta 8 product. But the Cannabis Commission asked me to put in a bill last year to uh, put some guardrails on it. So you might want to take a look at that 132 page <laughs> report that the uh, commission gave us in December of 2022. Yeah, I'll do that tonight. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I guess what, why I, I mm -hmm. ask, and it's not this bill, mm -hmm. but since we're doing this and we're talking about crosswalks and I was talking about the market, this would be another committee and not our committee. But if there is a market, you know, we've been really careful to make sure that uh, it's equitable development that, you know, the business side of it. So we're not really, so I, I just, that's why I was asking, yeah. are there hemp farmers? Where are they? You know, is there any, uh, yeah, yeah. So if there's similar issues, yeah. you know, in the production of hemp as that we're trying to make sure when we're looking at cannabis. That's right. No, I, Senator, I couldn't agree with you more. And yeah. certainly the new secretary of agriculture, his entire yeah. thing shtick is this value added agriculture and that's right. very much what this bill is trying to achieve right right okay and so hemp doesn't have thc in it or it only has like a <laughs> um it's complicated <laughs> the hemp plants and the cannabis plants are the same plants and how it is defined is by how much thc appears in that plant so you can grow the same plant with a relatively low amount of thc um, and it would be hemp under the federal definition of that, that that's a 0.3 limit that is being talked about. Um, and then once it's above that, it would be considered a cannabis plant. And it's a, it's a weird distinction. Uh, I know. Um, and, um, so the, the, because of the plant similarities using, I think the, using a, a plant intended framework for these products, because yes, the product space then changes pretty drastically as well. Um, is different, but you can make a a product with a hemp plant 
that would have a trace amount of THC that wouldn't fall above this threshold that we're contemplating as intoxicating right. that we've worked on studying. Um, and that's where uh, the proposed amendment that we're discussing of having a, a milligram limit on THC rather than measuring it in like a plant matter um, because we're, when we're talking about finished product, we should be talking about how, what's in that product, not what's in the plant that it came from necessarily. So do, uh, do are there pro, okay. So one of the first sort of products was rope. Right? Sure. Yes. Um, and, but now, you know, whatever century. Yeah. So later there's, are, are there products that are consumed or so put the, in your as you know, the list I have or the list I have is is home insulation, fabrics, cosmetics, vegan dairy products, eco-friendly technology, sustainable plastics. So it's oh, so it's not there, so no, no consumables. There are there's lotions that uh, you could use, and then um, the uh, based on the okay. amendments. Sorry. Yeah, I, I think I got my main <laughs> okay. question answered. Okay. okay, thank you, um, <laughs> Andrew. You got to get your mic, the mic, put the mic. Next. Um, no, and I think with the when a consumable product is being produced, that is when we want to be using this hard THC milligram limit because a a vegan protein powder could use hemp seed in it, right? That's an excellent source of protein. If that has 0.3% of THC in it, it would really ruin your workout um, because that's a lot of THC um, or it would make it less productive at least perhaps. Um, and so, so having a, a hard milligram limit on a consumable product and then anything that's above that then again gets kicked into this cannabis space. Okay, any uh, additional questions uh, for uh, the sponsor or for Mr. Garrison? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Uh, we have one uh, live witness and then two virtual witnesses, all favor with amendments. Abigail Deal, we're going to call Ms. Deal up, and uh, all the witnesses get two minutes, okay? So, Ms. Deal, um, tell us your, well, your name, restate your name, and then you've got two minutes to see testimony. Thank you very much. I appreciate all of you for being here. Um, my name is Abigail Deal. I was born and raised in Maryland. Um, I am a serial entrepreneur. I have a produce market that I've worked with Maryland farmers for my entire life. We have a family business in Toronto Park for 52 years working with Maryland farmers. Um, I've been working in the medical cannabis industry since uh, inception, application processed in 2015. I work with hemp farmers, uh, cannabis farmers all around. Um, you guys keep asking about the intent of this bill. The original intent of this bill, which I'm hoping stays intact, um, is the fact that uh, the cannabis industry started uh, starting allowing edibles last year or so, and uh, we're allowed to put THC, CBD, all these different cannabinoids into consumable products under the cannabis industry, which is fantastic. However, we are not allowed to, at the moment, take CBD from hemp and put that into any consumable products that's illegal, which doesn't make any sense at all for us to not be able to put CBD, which is non-intoxicating, into a consumable product when we have intoxicating cannabinoids in consumable products available in, in Maryland. So... This originally was supposed to help our, our real hemp farmers that were growing quality hemp that wanted to be able to make products that would that they would be able to make products and be able to sell um, not intoxicating cannabinoids like Delta 8. So Delta 8 is, is kind of a um, has come about from these hemp farmers not having another avenue. Um, so this this uh, bill is supposed to give them a remediation program to turn any, especially um, last year when we got rid of our pilot program here in Maryland um, that made, that took out, like, which is why we used to have a couple, I want to say over hundred hemp farmers here in Maryland. Now, last year we had six only because the, the new regulation made it impossible to grow anything without it turning hot, which hot means that it's over 0.3% THC. Um, you'd have to harvest at five weeks instead of 15 weeks. I'm getting into a conversation that doesn't make sense, but basically the, the new regulation starting last year made it impossible to grow any hemp that made sense, which is where D8 came on board because they didn't have any other avenue. I do not support D8. I do not support any intoxicating cannabinoids at all on the hemp side. I'm here fighting for strictly CBD and, and the non-intoxicating cannabinoids. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, do we have uh, questions for Ms. Steele? Uh, Senator Washington. Are you saying our regulations incentivized a um, black market, you know, an alternative market um, for that the hemp farmers engaged in a informal, okay, we'll use that, an informal market uh, uh, because, because of the constrictions that, the, that, that we're currently operating under? Is yes, that? well, most of them haven't been able to dive in at all. So we're not, you're not seeing um, CBD brownies or CBD uh, right. fresh pressed juices, which is one thing that I'd love to do with my produce stand. But uh, right. um, you're not finding CBD legal, like in food, in food products 
people are finding um like so as we saw in maryland uh you can have a, a chewable tylenol so you can have your medication in chewable forms so you've seen some chewable like some some medicated chews on the market um which you know and is, is that hemp i guess i'm trying to understand is that hemp yes but because it's hot so is that hot hemp no or, no no that's, that's not, not hot, hemp. hot hemp. no no not hot hemp. Okay. like the basically Two years ago, we were allowed to grow um, under the pilot program. We were allowed to grow up to 0.3% total Delta 9, which gave um, an avenue and a little bit of flexibility for them to be able to grow a quality product that was legal. Okay. Um, that changed to, instead of 0.3% Delta 9, it changed to 0.3% total THC, which is um, includes uh, THCA and it includes non-activated and non-intoxicating um, THC as well. And it um, and it also includes delta eight and delta nine, all the different cannabinoids. But that so there's different kinds of THC. There are, yes. and so now, so so before we were just measuring one kind of THC. We were, and now we're measuring all the different types. And so they're saying that all together, it can't be more of the point three. Yes, is that right? Okay. Yes. And okay. So now, as d d this bill would do what? So if the original intent, which right. I, I'm hoping that it stays intact, because again, I, th I think there's been some changes and, and I want to double check that, but the original intent was going to allow if, a, so say a hemp farmer, they were growing and it, instead of it testing at 0.3, it tested at 0.4. Okay. At that point, that farm would have to destroy their entire product, their entire crop. Um, these hemp farmers are not wealthy um, people. They're not making a bunch of money to destroy your entire crop after working for six months on it and spending all the money and the time and the labor to destroy it because of a point you know 0 0.1 percent difference of something that does not does not is not intoxicating in any way but just happened to go hot which can happen with a a better weather day compared like there's so many um, acts of mother nature that yeah. can create that um they'd have to destroy their entire crop so, so what, what this did was give them an avenue saying okay if it tests at point four instead of destroying your entire crop you can then remediate it and to put it into a legal consumable products where it's legal at the final stage before it goes to the consumer okay so that's where we're going to take that that hemp and, uh, you know but also you could take any hemp at that point because right now you can even you can't even take 0.3 percent hemp and put that into a into a food source according to so that's one a consumable product at the moment you cannot do so which we're trying to fix that as well we were hoping that the usda would step up and and change that i think it was a couple of weeks ago they did not which they is did. why maryland so then we need maryland to do that maryland has decided okay. they're like we need to move forward with this on a state level since okay. the federal level is not Okay. Um, taking action. That was really helpful. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. I'm I'm happy to help in any way. I'm I'm here as a resource for all the questions, and I hope I can help in any way I can. I really appreciate you guys with us. Thank you. Any additional uh, questions for Ms. Steele? Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Thank We're going to next move to uh, Colby Ferguson, virtually from the uh, Maryland Farm Bureau. Uh, Col there you are, Colby. Mr. Ferguson, you've got two minutes. Table with amendments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Colby Ferguson on behalf of Maryland Farm Bureau. Um, <clears throat> I haven't seen the the amendments that um, the, the uh, sponsor was talking about, but I'm I'm thinking they're similar, if not the same amendments that uh, we are offering. Um, hemp is break can basically bro be broken into two two factors. You have the flower side, which is typically goes to the CBD, the cannabinoids. Or you go into the industrial hemp, which is the fiber and the the grain side of it, which is this bill, and particularly with the amendments, Amendment 1, Amendment 2, have to do with each one of those sides. So Amendment 1 was to address what was just talked about, to just explain about the hot crops and that a farmer uh, has a crop that um, used to be legal and then then they changed the regs and all of a sudden the exact same crop that we had built a market in a in a, uh, a program around now all of a sudden was not uh, legal to keep anymore and remediate and get it back down to the point three that it needed to be. And so our our option, uh, our amendment number one is to address those specific components and, and offer those for those farmers to uh, remediate that hot crop and get it to a uh, to the right right uh, place. We are working within the uh, federal landscape to address it in the farm bill to get back to that Delta 9 uh, category instead of it being a total THC. And I think that would uh, that would effectively fix the problem. But right now we're stuck at the total THC and that's where MDA's hang up is right now. And so that's why the amendment looks into working with the medical cannabis um, group. And so the amendment two is just to address the, the industrial hemp side to clean 
clean up some of the language and clarify what you can and can't do and and allow these uh, individuals to utilize that that system. So I'll take any questions. I know we have a farmer coming up next and he can answer some other stuff. Thank you. Any, any questions for Mr. Ferguson? OK, seeing none. Uh, next up, we've got Levi Sellers representing the Maryland Hemp Coalition. Um, Mr. Sellers, I see you. You've got uh, two minutes. All right. Thank you, Honorable Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. <clears throat> My name is Levi Sellers. I am the president of the Maryland Hemp Coalition, the hemp representative on the Maryland Ag Commission, and owner-operator of my family's licensed hemp farm located in Washington County. Um, I had prepared a um, verbal testimony um, based on the written SB 508, um, but it appears there were some amendments uh, made that I uh, was unaware of. Uh, I would hope that they would potentially reflect the amendments that I had suggested and the hemp industry has suggested um, in our written testimony. But what I would like to do with my remaining time um, is maybe clarify some of the confusion created by the um, opening of this bill. Um, there is no ambiguity in uh, the hemp farming regs. It is very clear that hemp producers can produce hemp up to 0.3% Delta 9 THC concentration. And according to the 2018 Farm Bill, that would also include all um, cannabinoids, derivatives, extracts, and isomers produced by the hemp plant. Um, the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018 also did remove all tetrahydrocannabinols from hemp from the control of the uh, Controlled Substance Act. Um, therefore, those tetrahydrocannabinols are legal by federal law, and that would include Delta-8. Delta-8 was not a product created because the hemp industry had nothing else to uh, focus on. It was actually um, innovation from the hemp industry that produced a product that is 55 to 75 percent less um, intoxicating than Delta-9 THC, and this def that those numbers are based off of the CDC's guidelines. Um, I do believe that uh, there's been a lot of confusion around whether we should limit these products based on milligrams, but according to federal law, the limit is set at 0.3% Delta 9 THC concentration for hemp-based products. And uh, the hemp industry would be favorable if it would remain that way, um, recognizing federal law. Um, again, I'm here for uh, other questions. Uh, feel free to ask. Thank you for your time and consideration. Okay, any questions for Mr. Sellers? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill 508, and which brings us to the final bill of the day, uh, back to Senator Elfrith on Senate Bill 526. And I'm gonna bring up uh, Senator, your sponsor panelists. I've got Anna Griffith, uh, Mark Hoffman, Eric uh, Fisher, Marissa Shevsky. Is Marissa here? Okay. Those are your designated uh, sponsor panelists. So we're going to start that way. You've got the time you need to present 526. I understand you have a video as well. <laughs> Almost there, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. It's a long day. <laughs> Don't tell me how long it's been. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, to, first of all, to Lamoria for accommodating this. It's a very visual bill, so I wanted to make sure that we had some type of visualization. I appreciate the late hour, Mr. Chair, and I wanted to open with a joke that maybe I'm not going to speak for the trees here like the Lorax, but I hope that this bill does. 
Um, also appreciate again that uh, Senator Kramer's bill taking up some time because we were able to work out a lot of differences amongst the stakeholders, um, moving to almost almost complete agreement. And you'll hear that today in many of the folks who testify. So here to present Senate Bill 526, Natural Resources, Forest Preservation and Retention, an issue this committee knows incredibly well. So let's start with uh, a fact we all know and this committee better than anybody, the environmental benefits of forest and tree canopy. This is one of my favorite graphics of all time. It speaks to the, the runoff uh, of just one inch of rain on a, a, a one acre forest versus runoff of one inch of rain on one acre of pavement, um, representing a, a bay, bay fronted district. Um, this is a, a fact that I know very well. And again, this committee knows very well. So the environmental benefits are clear. But let's talk about the public health benefits of forest and tree canopy. Again, something that this committee knows very well. Reduced heat island effect, protections against flooding, lower rates of asthma, tremendous uh, public health benefits. Well, let's talk about the current law that this bill is seeking to amend. Folks here, again, are very familiar with the Forest Conservation Act, first passed in 1991. I will not say where I was in 1991, but I certainly uh, don't understand this chart even today, but this is the math, the formula that our locals, our municipalities, our counties, our developers have to run through in any development pro project that impacts uh, a forested area. This math, this formula, and I, I wanted to simplify it as much as I could for you, so let's take one acres of forested property. This is just one scenario trying to use whole numbers here. So you have 100 acres of forested property. If you're lucky enough to represent a district with this type of forest, that's wonderful. Um, we'll get to the problem we're seeing across the state today in a second. Let's take this one acres of a project. Okay, we want to develop this project. Under current law, a developer can buy this 100 acres. They can develop 60 acres, keep 40 acres of that 100 acres forested, and under the formula that I just showed you, they don't have to plant, they don't have to have any mitigation. They don't need to plant the extra 60 that they developed. They don't need to buy uh, forest mitigation bank credits. They don't need to pay a fee in lieu um, because they kept 40 of the 60 forested. That's it. So that's a net loss of 60% of our forest in just this one scenario. Again, I tried to simplify it for the committee or else we'd be here even later tonight. So what has that meant um, for our communities since 1991? Um, you heard earlier today from the Hughes Center that uh, this committee uh, uh, had the wisdom of, of giving the, the study to that we passed, oh gosh, when I first got here in 2019, that study was finally completed this last fall. And the Hughes Center found the following outcomes of the 1991 law. Although the rate of forest loss has slowed in recent years, we're gonna, we continue to see lose acres of forest each year. The rate of forest loss is uneven across the state with jurisdictions in the central part of Maryland experiencing much higher rates of forest and tree canopy loss than the statewide average. And I'm going to call out my county here for a second. Anne Arundel County was the third worst actor uh, in the five-year period the Hughes Center studied. So we lost just under 2,000 acres of forested land in five years, and that's just to development. Here's the chart. Uh, that the Hughes Center put together across the board. So you'll see uh, where we've lost the, the most acres of forested land from left to right. Again, everybody in the scenario is guilty because our current Forest Conservation Act really doesn't prevent forest loss. It tries its best to mitigate it, but it's over 30 years old at this point. So we're, we're seeing the impacts of that. So that's the problem, set, set the groundwork. Here's, here's our solution here. Senate Bill 526 updates the goals of our our forest our forest goals, but in in the same token expands uh, flexibility for our local partners. So it gives locals uh, increased flexibility in meeting the requirements under this FCA, and it gives counties two options to meet this. Um, number one, a county can move from that convoluted chart I showed you before to an opt-in of the new state replanning ratios of one to one. Uh, or two to one when it comes to high priority forest. And it has to do that on a project by project basis. I can't emphasize this enough. Under the current law, everything is calculated on a project by project basis. What this bill does, if a county or municipality chooses to not have their, their own unique forest plan, they can opt into the state, which is a no net loss of forest. So that's kind of an easy path forward. Or if they want greater flexibility, what they can do, and I'm gonna shift down if I can, what they can do is create their own alternative of afforestation, reforestation, and preservation requirements countywide. So it results 
Uh, so long as it results in the total no net loss of forest countywide and is approved by DNR. And I'm sorry, the PowerPoint kind of cuts off right there. Uh, but this is really going to give, if counties, municipalities opt into option two, they have much, much greater flexibility in meeting the overall no net loss goal because they don't have to assign the goals project by project. So you can prioritize. Let's say in Montgomery County, you want to prioritize around the metro or Prince George's, you want to prioritize around the, the Blue Line corridor. You can prioritize those, those TOD projects and, and figure out where else in the county it's more appropriate to preserve and replant forest. So that flexibility is going to be countywide instead of project by project. So we think that this is a great option for our locals. 526 importantly updates replanting ratios, like I said, but only if the county does not create their own plans. Um, and it then better defines priority forest land to further protect the most important forests. This committee knows that not all forests are created equal, right? Forests that are within watersheds, forests that are old growth, forests that are important to particular habitats and species have more value than other forests. So it, it defines that priority forest. Really importantly, um, the, uh, the, our now Supreme Court struck down uh, a, a mitigation tool we had previously used called a forest mitigation bank. And again, this committee knows this very well, but uh, starting next year, you'll no longer be able to buy credits in a forest mitigation bank. So that's really putting our locals and our developers in a real bind here. Um, this, if we do nothing, they can't use those banks anymore. This bill is gonna, again, provide greater flexibility to our locals and the developers because it's going to, uh, it reauthorizes the use of these forest mitigation banks that became unauthorized again in 2020. Um, without the bill, counties will be unable to utilize forest mitigation banks. And SB 526 will provide local governments with that flexibility to employ other mitigation effort options, such as improving the health of an existing deteriorated forest when space to replant is tight. This is particularly important in our more urban areas where we have significantly degraded forests. And I know we all have them in our districts that um, are amok with invasive species. So this is gonna give uh, developers in our counties the opportunity to reinvest in those deteriorated forests so that we actually have overall forest health improvement. Okay, next SB 526 narrows the current exemption from the FCA for energy generating systems. And in doing so, the transmission lines of those generating systems themselves will still be exempt, but the energy generating structure itself would not. Mm -hmm. Now, I know this is a policy shift from where we are, and particularly at this moment when we're talking about increased solar, um, particularly community solar, it's something I'm very passionate about, have a bill on myself. This is trying to resolve an issue that we're seeing in Virginia, where they are clear cutting thousands of acres of forest to put up solar farms. So you're having this trade-off uh, in other states that we're gonna try to prevent here with this bill. I believe that's counterintuitive. So it does, it, the bill doesn't say you can't, it just was gonna count against your forest, your forest loss if you choose to tear down a forest uh, for to build a solar farm, let's say. Okay, almost done, Mr. Chair. 526 provides important tax incentives to private homeowners home who wish to enter into a forest management program by DNR and because it lowers the minimum acreage required to enter the program from five acres to two acres. Um, this actually was an idea that came to me from a constituent. Here in Anne Arundel County, we have a lot of smaller forests, um, but uh, really no tax incentive for those landowners to keep that forested. Um, we currently have a program, if you have five acres or more of a property, you can enter into this forest management program with DNR and get the lowest tax assessment, which is the ag assessment. So that's a tax incentive for keeping something undeveloped. But as I said, Senator Simon Aaron and I don't have a lot of five acre forests left that are privately owned. So instead, we're going to lower that to two acres, which still have value and still provide those private la homeowner or landowners with a, a tax incentive to keep it forested and not sell to development if they so choose. And overall, this is going to help counties meet their overall forest goals. Okay, so this is the interesting part. Um, I don't think, Mr. Chair, I've met with so many stakeholders on a single bill uh, in my five years in the Senate. I have spent time individually with and, and the team here with the big seven counties, some of whom multiple times. Um, we've met with MACO multiple times who and, and the representatives of all our counties um, were on uh, a number of calls with us working through this bill. So everybody's districts here were represented. We've worked with MML, we've worked with DNR, we've worked with the builders to come up with a number of amendments in which we are all moving towards the middle on. So here are a couple that we're gonna be proposing to you. 
On the mitigation banking issue, we're going to expand the criteria for existing forests to be included in mitigation banks by allowing local jurisdictions to designate priority forests for conservation that can then be used for mitigation and require the approval of DNR. But we want to make sure we're capping this. We don't want to make sure that we are tearing down a forest over here and preserving a forest that was never going to be torn down or at risk of being torn down over here. There has to be a balance. So we're going to suggest to this committee that that balance, we're giving counties and giving the developers back the option to, to use these mitigation banks, but it has to be balanced. So we're going to suggest to the committee that we, we limit that to 50%. And Eric Fisher is going to explain that in greater detail on the panel. On the variance requirements, this bill uh, unintentionally um, created a situation where almost any project, project would require a variance. That was not our intention. Um, so in, in light of feedback from Mako and Prince George's County and the builders, um, our amendments will move additions to the, uh, to the actions that would require a variance to allow administrative approval instead, but in addition require notification and written finding provisions so that our constituents have an opportunity to publicly weigh in if we're going to tear down a forest. And I know each and every one of us has heard about this one project or another in our community. So this is going to allow for greater public input put. It then up uh, the amendments will make sure we update the FCA manual and program outreach that convoluted formula chart I showed you before. Um, I believe that's from 1997. So we should be updating that guidance to our locals um, now and every five years thereafter. I will say, Mr. Chair, that you're going to hear from DNR. I've had many conversations with DNR and they assure me that they have the staff and ability to, to execute this effectively. We, in the amendments, um, want to uh, taking a, a, a suggestion from Baltimore City on rest restoration of degraded forests. We want to clarify that the restoration of degraded forests is already encumbered by a conservation easement, and two is off-site a recount uh, for meeting mitigation requirements, so providing that greater flexibility for our more um, urbanized, developed communities. Um, we want to move back the implementation date. This was a suggestion by everyone. The bill, as it's written, has a pretty aggressive implementation date. So we want to make sure that, that our local partners can actually achieve this. So uh, we're going to suggest to this committee, of course, it's up to you, to have a, an implementation date of July 1st, 2024. If we go too far out in an implementation date, what's going to happen, and again, I know you've heard about this in your own communities, is we're going to have a lot of developers try to grandfather in projects that we're going to be then dealing with for the next 20 years. So we we want to be fair, but we also uh, don't want to give away the forest. And lastly, we want to use the Forest Conservation Fund. Um, this is a, a nod, a uh, request of Frederick County to extend provisions related to the mandatory use of Forest Conservation Fund dollars from two years to three and the growing season from five to six. Um, and the, uh, what I will lovingly refer to, Mr. Chair, as the amendments that we agreed to in the foyer on the wait before we got in here, um, you're going to hear from DNR today, every one of their amendments um, is reasonable to us, so we'd like to accept those as well. Um, we want to, in a nod to hopefully getting to being the next home of the FBI, we want to exempt out major federal projects from this program, we don't want to in any way inhibit that growth. Um, uh, again, working with Prince George's County, who you'll hear from today, I'm really happy that we're going to move closer together on that TOD or transit oriented development project. So we're not, again, mitigating development where it makes the most sense. So we're going to bring you an amendment on that. Our locals also asked us for more state funding um, to deal with invasives, um, which I know you spent a lot of time hearing about today. So we'd like to provide that support to our locals. And then lastly, um, we would like to include an amendment to study incentivizing reforestation, which we just didn't really get to in this bill, but I think is important as we move on. It's not just about preserving forests. It's also about being aggressive in finding opportunities to reforest, um, and that's going to truly get us to a known net loss of forest. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for uh, the flexibility in explaining a complicated bill, and I greatly appreciate the committee's time. We started today with a tree canopy briefing of a half okay. hour, so, so you know it's kind of kind of was a good foundation for. Okay. Uh, do you have a sequence of witnesses, Senator, that you prefer? Um, I'm going to have wanna, Eric go first, if that's okay. Okay, why don't you do that, and then you know, just hand it around uh, as you see fit. Everybody gets two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Feldman and members of the committee. Eric Fisher, I'm the interim executive director for the Maryland office at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I'm also a certified urban planner with 20 years of experience in the built environment. Uh, we're here to support House Bill 7, or excuse me, Senate Bill 526. That's the cross file you may see later. Um, with many of the amendments that were presented today, um, this results in more, conser more conservation, more flexibility, and more tools over the existing law. 
As the Senator said, two thirds of a site can currently be cleared if it's fully forested with no replanting at all. This bill allows local jurisdictions the flexibility to offset every acre in the way that works best for that jurisdiction. There are many paths forward. And under this bill, those paths are expanding. We, they will be able to restore degraded forests, remove those invasives, restore that understory, expand their stormwater management efforts above the minimum required, preserve existing forest in banks. And this I wanted to mention, uh, it's important that there are guardrails on that in this bill. Um, preservation is a noble goal, but when we use it to offset clearing, we are not replacing that clearing. This body um, ended that practice a few years ago because there were no guardrails. Uh, so we are hopeful that we can bring that back with appropriate safeguards to make sure that we're balancing the preservation effort and the planting effort. In that regard, this bill is focused on outcomes, as are the partners at this table. Um, and we believe there are multiple pathways to achieve those. We look forward to working with you all and the stakeholders uh, to move those outcomes forward. Thank you. Okay, hand it to whoever you want to hand it to. Good uh, afternoon. Mark Hoffman, uh, Maryland Director of the Chesapeake Bay Commission. Thank you. I'll be brief. I was just a month ago, I was here uh, giving you an update on the status of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, I hope my message was positive. We made tremendous progress, but we still have a lot of work to do, both within our state and, and throughout the watershed. That said, forest conservation and the provisions of this legislation will really help us move the needle related to our Chesapeake restoration efforts. I want to just talk briefly on this bill kind of has two parts. Part one of it is about a page or half a page. It should be very simple. It's about what is our statewide goal for forest conservation. Currently, the way it's written is very confusing. It says our goal is no net lo loss of forest, but then the actual definition of that refers to tree canopy. As you heard today, forest and tree canopy are really kind of two different things. You have tree canopy includes street trees, trees in an urban landscape, et cetera. So what the Hughes Center, what's important that the Hughes Center study told us is that with the right policy tools, we can not, we, can, we don't have a, no net loss of forest, we can have net gain of forest. So that's the very first part of that bill codifies that, that our goal as a state is to have a net gain of both forest and tree canopy, particularly in urban environments. That's a short part of the bill. It sometimes trip, trips people up, but it's important. So thank you for your time. Okay, thank committee. you, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, Eric, why don't you pass it on? Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Anna Mudd Griffith, and I'm the Senior Director of Policy for Potomac Conservancy, an organization with over 30,000 supporters dedicated to conservation and policy initiatives that restore and protect the Potomac watershed. Today, I'm also representing nearly 40 organizations from around Maryland that have come together in support of Senate Bill 526. In addition to statewide groups like the NAACP, the Sierra Club, and Audubon Mid-Atlantic, we also have representation from smaller groups in Baltimore City, Anne Arundel, Charles, Prince George's, Frederick, and Montgomery counties, and several organizations signing on from the Eastern Shore and Western Maryland. For the past six years, many of these small volunteer-led groups have fought to strengthen forest conservation laws locally and have been able to celebrate significant progress in Anne Arundel, Howard, and Frederick counties. However, with the recent release of the Hughes study, we all recognize the critical need for an updated and improved Forest Conservation Act in Maryland. Maryland has made a commitment to increase forest land both under the Chesapeake Bay TMDL and the Bay Agreement yet we continue to suffer devastating net losses because of a weak Forest Conservation Act. If the state has any chance of retaining and increasing forest land, the act must be updated before it's too late. We believe this bill does just that by raising the standard for forest conservation while still giving local governments and developers the tools they need to succeed in meeting these new goals. Our coalition respectfully requests a favorable report for Senate Bill 526. Thank you. Okay, clean up. All right. Hi all, for the record, I am Marissa Olszewski. I represent Maryland League of Conservation Voters as their environmental policy manager. And um, I have one message from Kim Koval who said, make sure they know that we've been working on this for years and we're really excited that this bill is finally here. Uh, so we're really excited. And um, I also wanted to say that in a previous uh, professional life, I um, thought a lot about sustainability. And when I thought about what I was gonna say about this bill, I just wanted to say that there's a tenant in the world of sustainability um, that is it's not enough anymore to do less harm. And our previous 
work in forest conservation in Maryland in forest conservation policy was no net loss, just don't do too much harm. Um, but what we need to do now, what we recognize going forward for the livability of the state, for the sustainability of our environment is to actually do more good. And so what we're trying to achieve here is actually a net gain. As you heard from the Hughes Center study, that's possible. Um, if you heard, hear from your Bay advocates, that's necessary. Um, and we really hope that we can move this bill forward to achieve net gain of forest in Maryland once again. Uh, and with that, I will yield my time. Thank you. Hey, uh, Can I just correct myself because sure. I made an error. I, I incorrectly cited the Supreme Court. I meant the Attorney General's opinion eliminated the ability to, for mitigate, to use mitigation banks. And so without this bill or action, um, again, we're putting our counties and our developers in a real bind. So this is trying to provide flexibility back, uh, back to both of those groups. Okay, with that, uh, any questions for the sponsor, Senator Elfrith, or the four panelists, uh, Senator... Simon Air, you look like you're trying to get your button. <laughs> okay. And then Senator Washington after that. Thank you for this thought. It seems like you put a lot of work in this. So um, there was a lot of information. Yeah. So one, I thought I heard you say that this is pretty much a consensus bill. Is that where we are today? We have been working uh with as many stakeholders as possible. I think you're gonna hear from the panels after me. Um, I don't want to speak for them, but we are very, I mean, we are 95% percent there. Um, I re I'm so grateful. Everybody gave us their, their suggestions and not just kind of their complaints. They, and, and we're taking almost every single one of them. And we actually brainstormed a couple new good ones together out in the hallway. Okay. And then as you're well aware in Anne Arundel County, I've seen those animated pictures in Northern Anne Arundel County, what it used to look like 50 years ago, mm -hmm. what it looks like now, and the forest are just being depleted. The re report we heard to start today they were saying it's localized. There's some counties that do the majority of the deforestation or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking, this bill, you have the balance of we need more houses. People are just coming into the state and you see that growth. Right. Is this bill going to deal with the localization of it or is it still a statewide policy and just how's that work? It's a great question. So we have the two options. So if a county decides... Um, they don't want to do anything new. They can just adopt this new statewide standard, which is a one-to-one -one, uh, of replanting, so a no net loss, but a two-to-one if it's a priority forest that we've defined in the bill. Uh, if they don't want to opt into the state standard, they can craft their own as long as countywide uh, they have that no net loss of forest. So for Anne Arundel, for instance, our county executive wants to develop more around our TOD in Odenton, the Mark Train. Um, and that's great. And, and if Anne Arundel chooses its own path forward, it can choose to not uh, handle every development around that Mark Train stop individually, they can say, we want to develop in Odenton, but we want to mitigate and save forests in South County or in parts of your district. So it's giving them that flexibility. And I think that's what's been missing in every conversation we've had. And I think we've been having this conversation for at least the five years I've been here is that flexibility. That was the direction we we asked of the advocates. And I, I think they delivered above and beyond um, what we could have imagined in that we're going to ask counties and developers to do more, but we're going to give them the tools to develop where it mo and develop and mitigate where it most makes sense. Okay. Any additional questions? Uh, Sarah Washington, you still have a question? I have a few. First, um, are you able to sell uh, forest conservation mitigation? Because you can do it in stormwater. I'm sorry, I'm very familiar with the uh, selling stormwater mitigation credits. So I guess that's why it's written to the tax code and, and all that. So I guess that's my question is that. Uh, Eric, is there a mark? In other words, if, yeah, we, yeah, if, we, yeah, yeah, yes. if we reintroduce this, are we creating a, a market for the sale of forest conservation? Yes, Senator. Okay, so I don't know if we want to do that. Um, the, the other, my other question is, um, did you, we're, we're writing this to the, uh, to the um, natural resource code, and then there's some to the tax code, mm -hmm. right? And that's where we've been doing a lot of this. Has the sponsor considered looking at the, our, our land use code? Um, when I look at the, and because I've been doing that a lot and trying to sort of 
wrestle with this local statewide authority. And so we do, as the state, um, you know, have and have set forth the land use, right, article. And in that land use article is where we provide, we give the authority to locals to use the land and we set forth some expectations, which when, as I look at them, I'm not sure we've done a good job of holding folks accountable to those expectations to protect the health and welfare, uh, the public health first and welfare of, of, of Marylanders. So, you know, in the land use code, it looks like there, came, there was a time. So if you go into that code, we did create, it looks like there's Title VIII, which has to do with uh, historic preservation. Mm -hmm. So I just would like to look, let's take a look at that. So that's this bill. But I think in terms of getting the more sort of sustainable, uh, sort of long-term, uh, what are our, what are really our beliefs and desire, you know, what do we really want mm -hmm. to happen when it comes to planning and zoning and development? That when it comes to historic preservation, that's all been very successful, very right. well thought out. And it looks like there might be some mechanisms there. Um, and then, yeah, I guess okay. I should ask, that's my question. Okay. So one, have you ever, have you contemplated the looking at land use, mm -hmm. right? And the the goal, the public purpose mm -hmm. of land use in our Maryland code and in our, right. no, it's not in our constitution, but in our Maryland code. Yes, uh, Eric's gonna dive into detail of how he crafted or suggested the crafting of this bill, but I couldn't agree with you more. It has to be that balance between livability but sustainability at the same time. And that's the balance we're seeking here um, and trying to get at it in different ways and not, I don't ever want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. But again, I think this is with the amendments we'll present to this committee early next week, I think strikes that balance in which everybody's a little happy, everybody's a little mad and uh, is probably the best product at the end of the day. But Eric's looked at the land use code. Sure. Thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, there are a number of elements in the land use article that touch on force. I don't know that it is as comprehensive a look as the natural resources article. We have the sensitive areas element. We have the water resources element. So there are pieces of that in there. And what the Forest Conservation Act should do is pull those things together. So once we have a development plan, we understand how the impacts to those forests are going to be offset. Really looks like that you've read it as closely as I've read. I've spent a lot of time with the land use code. Um, and so, as you say, it has, so we've got, you know, we've got stuff in water, et cetera. But I guess what I'm saying is that it, it does, I, I do think you should explore in this course. And if, are there, when we look at land use, just sort of setting and pulling out, it's called a sensitive area, but not really explained, it's not you know, people weren't really thinking about it when we when that got put in there. However, there is this whole separate article around historic preservation, and it seems like perhaps we're at a time where we need to pull out forest conservation mm -hmm. as its own, you know, its own um, issue and drive and value. Mm -hmm. That's a great suggestion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that's more commentary than a question, it sounds like. <laughs> okay. Uh, Senator Hester. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for all your hard work on the on the bill. Um, I'm I'm curious if there's anything in here that requires the upkeep of the replanted areas, mm. because I've seen time and time again people cut something down, they put in a tree, the deer eat it, it's not watered, blah blah blah. I mean, a new tree is not the same value as an old tree. So where are the teeth in this bill to make sure that these trees actually grow? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, there is an, an existing provision in law that governs a period of maintenance associated with a mitigation planting. And that period varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but it is a period of years. And in many cases, the developer must post a financial surety associated with that planting. Um, so as long as the issues are corrected within that period of time, there is a structure for that. Um, that structure has an end point. Um, and so one of the things that this bill intends to do is add additional mechanisms for forest upgrading and maintenance, including credit for restoring degraded areas, removing those invasives and those kinds of things. 
So the existing structure is not in the bill. It's in a separate section of the same law uh, because we're not changing that. But the, the piece that provides the credit for that um, is along with the, the tools for um, offsetting that includes increased stormwater management, uh, preservation banking, and this restoration of degraded forest. And that is in the bill, and we'll get you the, the page number, but I think your overarching point, which is an existing tree, is has a much greater ecological value than planting a new forest, and that's really the heart of what we're trying to get at here and reverse really some negative consequences of like holding on to this 1991 law that has resulted in so much loss and particularly loss of, of, of old growth and contiguous. You heard today from the Hugh Center, a lot of the challenge here is the fragmentation of our forests, and that has its own ecological challenge that it creates. So to your point, we're really trying to save the trees without having to replant, but we can. <laughs> Curious, you said it's not in here because it's based on the older law. I mean, is it like a year? Is it like two years? Like, I mean, I think we should actually look at the maintenance and make sure that we're updating that too if it needs to be updated. We'll get that to you. Yep. Okay, any additional uh, questions for this panel? Uh, seeing none, we're going to go to another panel of uh, favorable witnesses for favorable with amendment. I'm going to call them up. Uh, Gary Allen, Mr. Allen here. I've got David Goshorn, a DNR. Um, Andrea Crooms and uh, Dominic Butchko from MAKO. And then we're going to go some in-person unfavorables. Then we've got some virtuals. So that's going to be the sequence. So, um, sir, why don't you, sir, why don't you lead off on the left and we'll go down the... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is everybody Gary Allen. Two, everybody gets two minutes. Pardon? Two minutes. You'll see the Thank clock. you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Gary Allen. I'm the president of the Maryland Forestry Foundation. And likely I'm one of the very few people you hear from who was actually part of the passage of the 1991 Act. At that time, I was an elected official in uh, Prince George's County, the mayor of Bowie, Maryland, and served on the Maryland Municipal League um, Legislative Committee at that time and was responsible for advocating for this particular law for Maryland's municipalities to support it at that time. That bill, was designed to slow the loss of forests, which we'd been experiencing in the 1980s, which had approached over a thousand acres a month. And we were quite incensed about the impact it was having on our communities. And we wanted to slow it down. But as you know, it did not result in no net loss. And so two decades later, when Governor O'Malley appointed me the chairman of the Sustainable Forestry Council, we proposed a no net loss goal for the state. You accepted that as our thing. Our goals changed. But the tools we had available to achieve it were still inadequate. The bill before you today updates that tool. It makes the Forest Conservation Act an active commitment to helping not only reduce forest loss, which was talked about in the presentation made earlier by the Hughes Center, but actually achieved no net loss in the next several years as this bill is fully implemented. The guardrails it sets, the tools it provided, the new clarification it provides, I think is worthy of your support. And so on behalf of the foundation, and frankly, I think a great many other uh, supporters of the thing, we certainly want to advocate for a favorable report for Senate Bill 526. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Okay, pass that along. It's uh, everybody's got two minutes. Tell us your name. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dave Goshorn, Senior Bay Restoration Coordinator and also Acting Assistant Secretary for Aquatic Resources with the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, the department supports this bill with some amendments. Uh, we appreciate the work of the Hughes Center that you heard from earlier in advancing the science of increasing forests in Maryland. Uh, we greatly appreciate the efforts of Senator Elfrith and our co-sponsors at taking that science and applying it to this bill that pivots us from a goal of no net loss to a goal of net increase of our critical forest lands. Um, we had some amendments, but as the Senator mentioned, we worked them out in the hallway, all but the details. So I'm not gonna go through them other than to say that uh, we're in good shape from the department's perspective, and we urge your favorable report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. 
Good evening. My name is Andrea Crooms. I'm the director of the Department of Environment in Prince George's County. Um, and, uh, you know, just to kind of echo that we are really close on amendments. Um, and we've been, it's been wonderful how great it's been to work with the sponsor on the Senate side and the sponsor on the House side. We're really moving forward. But I do want to you know, I'm going to actually tell a story that's going to address the question about monetizing um, these easements uh, that the one senator asked, but um, I'm an owner of a piece of property in Prince George's County, um, and my property in Prince George's County is a farm that is in Upper Marlboro. I own 20 acres. I grew up, my parents didn't go to high school. There is no multi-generational wealth in my family. I was not going to buy a multi-million dollar property. Um, but because of forest conservation, because of mitigation banking, I was able to buy a piece of property where someone had already sold that piece of the bundle of sticks um, that is, you know, the mitigation bank off of the property. So I bought 20 acres for $136,000, right? Making me a farmer in Prince George's County, spouse of an African-American farmer in Prince George's County, which would not have happened if there wasn't the ability to monetize the environmental benefits of uh, of nature and, you know, the take the different environmental values and different values of property and not just think about highest as best use as one use of a property, but think about all those externalities that we can internalize through this. And so that, you know, our overall arching things were that you heard the Hughes Center say Prince George's County did an effective job of maintaining qualified conservation banks. And we think we're going to get to the point where we can figure out a way that we can use the qualified conservation banks um, in our discussions with, with the senator. And then the other big thing for us is environmental justice. 64% African-American community, uh, poorest of the jurisdictions in the, in the DMV COG, um, really emburdened by systemic choices to not invest in our community. We want to invest in our community. And so we want to make sure that we are protecting our TODs and protecting where we want the FBI building to go. Um, and so we believe that we're going to find an amendment to be able to do that as well. Okay, Dominic. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Dominic Butchko with the Maryland Association of Counties. Um, I really have to thank the sponsor, both in the Senate and in the House, for their Herculean efforts in working with MAKO and the 24 jurisdictions. Um, we are not at a consensus bill yet, but can I tell you, we are pretty damn close. Um, there are a few things. When we are doing forest conservation policy, we have to make sure that we balance conservation, um, we balance growth and development, and we balance public health. Um, when this bill was first introduced, we were we were kind of far from getting all three of those right. But I can tell you that we are very, very close. Um, there are a few issues with the, with the date certain, um, smoothing out some stuff around forest banking, um, some resources for invasive species and the tax issue. Um, like Prince George has mentioned, we do want to make sure when major projects like the FBI and others come to Maryland that they, that they can make this a home. Um, but that being said, I mean, the, the sponsor and the advocates have been phenomenal with working with us. We remain committed to making this is a workable bill, and I think we can do that. So we urge a favorable report with amendments. Thank you. Okay, any uh, questions for the panel? Senator Washington. Thank you. I, I, th I guess I want to cl cl clarify what I mean by, so a mit mitigation bank, okay, mm -hmm. so, you, but you're, I, I'm talking about are there, cre are you, could you sell, because uh, what has happened, I, I think what has happened and slowed um, our mitigation in, in a, a, a impacting uh, stormwater mitigation is that one could buy somebody else like, you know, so I want to chop down all these trees, right? But I can't because I have to mitigate, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I can buy your mitigation credits and then apply it and still chop down all my trees. So there, there or, or, or even it becomes a commodity and people just buy and trade and sell it. So I, I think I, I don't know who can answer me. So our mitigation credits, the ones that are set to expire, and it is in Maryland law that we're not going to do it past June, June 30th, 2024. Are those able to be sold, traded, I suppose, mm -hmm. is the issue. Yeah. So it's less about your, it, it's yeah. your situation fine once you're, you're actually acquiring a probably etc but trading it as a commodity that that i have a concern about yeah so that's what happened on this land so this 20 acres of land right. the last owner sold the mitigation bank as a commodity meaning that a piece of land that let's say the, the land for, for round numbers had a value of five hundred thousand dollars well he was arguably able to sell that mitigation bank to a developer for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. 
-hmm. Now I can't cut down those trees. I'm responsible to take care of all the invasive species, et cetera, because I'm the, the owner and the responsible party. But because he had already sold some of the value off that land, those trees are going to stay there forever. And I can afford to farm on the open acre and a half of land and to produce value-added products inside of that forest. So that forest is now, you know, not only are the mitigation credits being used to offset somewhere else in the same watershed that someone built something. But in addition to that, you know, those qualified conservation credits, the forest now has like a dual use and it enables a person who otherwise wouldn't be able to get onto land and farm because it didn't have multi-generational wealth. 78% of farmers in America inherited their farms. Um, that can you know produce additional value off of that property. Now every landowner is not going to be me, and I know that there's like concerns with that. But um, yeah, I mean the whole idea is that you create these banks, and these banks are tradable. So what you're doing is you're taking the environmental attributes of land, and mm -hmm. you're paying people for them because right. this piece of land may not have become because of where it is may not have become you know a mega development with seven thousand houses. But what it could have become was be completely cleared and be a, be a traditional mm -hmm. farm, or it could have been completely cleared and it could have been a bunch of solar panels. And so we're still able to retain the value of those trees and we're able to make it feasible for landowners then to retain the trees because they can still get an economic value out of it. So a retired person could sell their forest into the market. It's going to stay in as a forest forever, but they're able to stay on their land yep. because they were able to monetize that environmental attribute. Yep. Mr. J, my, my, my question just is where does that mitigate my, I'm just that credit. Um, so the trees are, you know, stayed. And so some, I buy $500,000 worth of credit for $350,000. How do, where does the credit get applied? In a place, so a developer who was unable to replant the trees on the same site, oh, they the then used it to offset that site. And the requirements, I believe in the whole Forest Conservation Act, but certainly within right. Prince George's County, is that it remain in the same watershed. Right. So, you know, so that the work is done in the, you know, so it's still protecting a development in the same watershed. So, you know, so he wanted to build a bunch of houses okay. on a property okay. that was subdividable and couldn't replant the forest there. He purchased the forest somewhere else and that, you know, retained a forest it, somewhere. Okay. That's, that's what I thought it was. So you get to buy the ability to cut down trees someplace else by buying somebody else's trees. They which is still what we up. want for but, transit oriented development, well, but not I don't, necessarily I, everywhere. Which I, is just, they want I just think we have to be careful about that. So mm -hmm. I think whatever amendments, if we're going to do this bank again, I would strongly let's, there needs to be caps. We put caps on other things. Um, it, yeah. we. Any, any additional questions for this panel? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna call up a panel of unfavorables. Um, Tom Ballantyne, Pleased to meet you. To Matthew Wessel, Bob Eden, Angelica Bailey, Lori Graff, Uh, okay, let's see what we got here. And then uh, Kevin Haynes can be sort of, is Kevin Haynes here? Come up here, you're, you'll be next up after these folks. So, okay, uh, yeah, who's gonna lead off? You, Mr. Eden? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, committee, Madam Vice Chairman. Uh, Robert Eden, on behalf of the Maryland uh, Building Industry Association, you have our written testimony. And this written testimony was drafted earlier in the week and things have changed somewhat uh, significantly. Uh, since then, uh, we had, uh, uh, as, as was noted, the fact that this was the last bill on the agenda ended up, I think, being a favorable outcome for everyone because we gave us time to have discussions with the bill sponsor and the advocates for the bill. And I think at least in, in principle, maybe we haven't seen any of the language yet. Uh, I do agree that we're, we're, we're close to to, to reaching a compromise on this bill, which would make it acceptable to the business, the uh, businesses that have a stake in this. So, you know, Ms. Graff is the CEO of the Maryland Building Industry uh, Association, appears in front of the committee regularly. Tom Ballantyne is the uh, CEO of NAOP. And so you have the residential home builders and you have 
the uh, uh, industrial office park builders at the table today are both s s impacted by this. And of course, our goal was to try to strike a balance uh, between achieving the uh, environmental goals that the proponents would seek, but at the same time, hoping to be able to uh, continue to build affordable housing throughout the state of Maryland, there's a desperate need for it, and to have uh, commercial properties that serve Maryland residents, Maryland consumers' needs. Uh, we hope that we've gained that progress. Uh, it's probably going to take us some time to you know, go through it. The devil's in the details always, but we are optimistic that things will get worked out. Thank you. Okay, pass the baton to whoever. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members of the committee, I know it's late, so I will be brief. Um, and we do have appreciate the sponsor working with us as well as um, other advocates. Um, we are optimistic that we can um, work forward. I'm gonna, we do have a couple of experts here that can talk a little bit more in detail about- What's your name? I'm sorry, Lori Graff, CEO of Maryland Building Industry Association. I apologize. Um, I do think that we can we can come to, to some consensus, but we do have some experts here that can talk a little bit more about the current Forest Conservation Act. Um, my concern, as always, when I'm before this committee is housing. We need to create more housing. I'm just going to give you a, a quick example. Um, as I was sitting here waiting today, I got a, a press release from Montgomery County um, stating that they need 41,000 more housing units by 2030. Um, last year, the permits was about 827 or something like that. Um, so we're far away from getting to our housing goals, um, and we, it shouldn't be a choice between housing and the environment. We should be able to do both, but we need to do it in a balanced approach. The way this bill was introduced, we had a lot of concerns about being able to do that. We really feel like it would have taken steps backwards in housing, and we wouldn't have been able to get to where we need to be on any of our housing goals. This bill, as introduced, superseded zoning in our belief. Um, however, again, we're, we're working through some amendments that we think will um, certainly improve the bill. Um, and I'll let some of our experts talk a little bit more about some of the details, just so you guys can understand. It's a complicated issue. It is not simple at all. Um, so um, with that, we, we hope we can come to some kind of conclusion in the next um, you know, couple of days. Thank you. Okay, why don't we go down to Mr. Valentine next? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tom Ballantyne. I'm Vice President for Policy at NIOP Maryland. We're a commercial real estate trade association. We have had some uh, promising conversations with the bill sponsor, and we certainly appreciate her energetic uh, engagement with us. Um, the reason that we needed that engagement is that this bill is introduced was caused a great deal of concern to us. The basic concept was that it changed the definition of priority forest, put very high administrative roadblocks into clearing priority forest for any reason, and then put very high uh, replanting ratios in place that very quickly either reduced building envelopes in high density zones or um, made the math so difficult that there wasn't space on site or um, to, to, uh, to compensate for, for clearing and the, the replanting ratios that could be two, three, four times um, the amount of forest cleared. The, the result would have made the presence of forest very influential, almost more influential than zoning in the kind of use and intensity of development parcels, especially in mixed use, transit oriented development um, and other high density kinds of zones. That's important. And the balance that, that we think we need to achieve is um, something that will, I think, take some work, but we think we're, we're, uh, we're, we're getting closer. Um, the Forest Conservation Act today uses a sliding scale, right? Um, that requires replanting and preservation. I'll just point out that the, the slide you saw in the, in the uh, presentation for the sponsor panel should be viewed in the context that other provisions in the act require two to one mitigation for clearing and also planting of forest where none exists today. The stormwater slide doesn't depict a modern, store, uh, modern development. Stormwater management regulations require us to bring a product to market that mimics the hydrology of woods in good condition, not the runoff that you saw on the slide. So there is, uh, I think, um, much progress has been made during today and some previous days, and we're, we look forward to trying to close those gaps. Thank you. Sir? 
Good evening. My name is Matthew Wessel. I'm a landscape architect with over 20 years of experience implementing the Forest Conservation Act in Maryland, and I'm here at the request of MBI and NAOC. Um, it sounds like we're getting close, but because this is sort of new to the committee, I just wanted to go over um, what some of our original concerns were, depending on how this works out. So just set the context, the Forest technical study you reviewed earlier shows that statewide uh, forest is sta forest loss is stabilizing, even though the population grew 17% during the time frame studied. This is even before planting the 5 million trees, which in the report is roughly the equivalent of 12,500 acres. The bill, this bill proposes that each jurisdiction be no net loss, not statewide. And it specifically regulates entities subject to the Forest Conservation Act, not entities that clear forests that aren't subject. Um, Specifically, our specific concerns on this bill was that it makes projects that can currently comply with the State Forest Conservation Act have to obtain a variance from the law to impact priority forests while also adding um, forest considered priority. That sounds like that's going to be worked out, but the priority forest is still being expanded. Second, the bill could be really punitive um, by significantly increasing mitigation requirements while limiting mitigation options. If growing jurisdictions with lots of existing forests can't consistently demonstrate no net loss. Uh, for example, my written testimony demonstrated that if you have a 100 acre site with 70 acres of existing forest and you clear down to a 25% uh, conservation threshold, it requires 105 acres of mitigation, more than the starting area of the site, even before you even do anything um, development wise on the site. So you would definitely need off site forest mitigation um, for that. Finally, the bill, as originally proposed, further limits where mitigation can occur, who can use it, and still phases out the use of uh, banks saving existing forests. Mitigation banking options are already extremely limited. There's no banking left in Montgomery County, for example. Um, so um, if the state does not fully reinstate banking but requires even more mitigation, the result will be more in lieu fee. We appreciate the opportunity to work with the sponsor on okay. this bill. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Clean up. Well, and we'll loop back to you, sir. All right, good evening, everyone. Angelica Bailey Kupari for the Maryland Municipal League. MML is currently opposed. That position was taken before we started these very productive discussions on amendments with the sponsor, which we greatly appreciate. So at this point, we are more closely aligned uh, in principle with MAKO. So I will echo Dom's earlier comments and say me too with one addition. Um, the reduction in property tax issue. The, so when you allow more folks to put their acreage into forest con management programs, they don't pay property taxes for at least 15 years. As you've heard me say before, municipal governments have very few um, resources and ways of generating revenue. Property taxes is the main one. So we would take a financial hit on that. I just want to raise that as a concern. Um, otherwise, we appreciate the intent here. We very much appreciate um, cooperation with the sponsor and her entire team. We look forward to um, continuing those conversations. Thank you. Okay, sir. Sure. And then we'll, we'll take Senator Washington after that. Great. Thank you. Good evening. Kevin Haynes. I'm a Maryland Department of Natural Resources qualified professional, which is a qualification that DNR gives to folks who have experience, experience implementing the Forest Conservation Act. I have implemented it throughout the state. SB 526 defines new priority retention areas within the Forest Conservation Act, which require increased mitigation as the law was proposed. The new priority retention areas are ambiguous and encompass large swaths of forest. Based on some preliminary GIS analysis, uh, we found that three proposed priority retention areas can encumber as much as 80% of the existing forest within priority funding areas within the state. Uh, these three priority retention areas are, I'm going to outline a few of them, uh, forest interior dwelling species and connected forest. Uh, this is we refer to it as FIDS habitat. DNR maps it uh, very generally throughout the state. It's a GIS layer. Um, we have ways of actually studying FIDS habitat and determining if FIDS exist. This law doesn't make a provision to do that. It just kind of refers back to that GIS layer. So it's very broad um, and encompasses many areas which probably do not uh, contain FIDS. Also, priority funding at another priority retention area is DNR targeted ecological areas, which are Again, a map GIS layer, which DNR uses to prioritize funding for programs such as Program Open Space and other organizations use it to prioritize their dollars for conservation efforts. The third priority retention area, which is troublesome, is contiguous forest. This priority retention area is defined so broadly within SB 526 that all forest on a site could be deemed contiguous regardless of its size or ecological value. Uh, within the Forest Conservation Act, currently, most priority retention areas are field mapped by experts such as myself or Mr. Wessel. 
and many other people throughout the state. So it's field confirmed conditions. And a lot of these PRAs, as we refer to them, are not. They're just GIS, broad layers. Thank you. Okay, Senator Washington. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much for sticking around with us. And this is a very interesting topic um, and problem and something to solve. But I have a question. Does MAKO or MLL, do you do you care about or, or the, the part of the bill that has to do with the, the mitigation banks? Is that something that you have you all have a particular interest in seeing re reinstated? Mitigation banking can be tricky for municipalities because we have so few places to put them. Right. Um, but it's a valuable tool. It's a valuable program. We appreciate any expansion and flexibility for local governments is always key. At this point, the conversation on that issue has changed so many times that I would be uncomfortable making a, a stronger position. Well, could I just ask you, just so I have to decide if I need to think about this anymore. <laughs> um, Same. Um, uh, so currently, under HB 991, which is two years ago, which is what generated all this, the Hughes study and all that. Um, the, the mitigation, we were instructed to, you were instructed to really look at mitigate, mitigation banks, but I, I don't really see a lot of that yet in this bill. Um, it's They are set to expire. No one's offering anymore on the 20, you know, in two years, yeah, in a year, next year. Is that a problem today for municipalities or MAKO? That's, uh, well, I'm not gonna speak for MAKO. Um, okay, for, sorry. <laughs> yeah, for MML. Um, that's not a concern that our members raised specifically when we were going through this yes, bill. Okay. They were more concerned with the credits that we would receive, yeah. um, but yeah. but the, the time limitation on mitigation banking was not raised. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Senator Carrozza. I'll be brief. Uh, to our DNR professional, forestry professional, okay. um, I understand that the Sustainable Forestry Council is one of DNR advisory bodies and that they um, are have a list of concerns. I didn't know if uh, that had been coordinated with you. In addition, I also understand one of the um, suggested am amendments from the Maryland Forest Association is about excluding commercial logging. So if I missed this in the hearing earlier. Just wanted to try to connect these different councils and DNR and their concerns. So I should probably just clarify, I, I'm not, I do not work with DNR. DNR has just certified me to, to be a consultant. So I, I I'm, I'm representing and I'm with the Maryland Building Industry Association. Sponsor then, I and i sorry, I didn't ask, the, ask this earlier. I was trying to figure out the Sustainable Forestry Council is an advisory body to DNR. Apparently they have a list of concerns. I don't know if in all this back and forth with the amendments being worked on, if those concerns have been factored in. And I also understand the Maryland Forest Association has an amendment um, to exclude commercial logging. So thank you, Senator. We did get the MFA amendment in advance, um, but I did not get the other amendment, so I haven't seen them until now, but I'm happy to to take the evening what's left of it and look through it and talk to the team and see what we can accept. But as I can't take an amendment I didn't see before this, but I will look at it tonight, I promise. I do have the one from the MFA. Yes. And thank just you. To, you know, just remind everybody, you can always carry this conversation offline after this hearing. So, I mean, that is a <laughs> option available to all members of the committee, right? Right, Senator Elfrith? You'll take questions offline. Okay, with that, um, additional questions for the panel, because we've got some virtual witnesses here. Um, <laughs> what's that? Okay. Uh, excited to hear from Yes. Um, okay. Senator, uh, uh, Senator Hester, I saw your light on. I don't want to cut you off. Okay. Yeah. My question was just in the interest of everybody's time, can we get a list of all the amendments and whose opposition they remove and signed off by both the proponents yeah. and the opponents? And that would just save us some time. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent suggestion. Okay. With that, thank you. Thank you, panel. We're going to go now to our virtual witnesses. Uh, we're going to start. Uh, well, let's see. I've got on my list Denise Guitara. Is she here? Guitara? Yes, okay. I'm here. Guitara, you're, you're first on our virtual list. You've got uh, two minutes. 
Good evening, Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Denise Guitarra, and I'm the Maryland Conservation Advocate for Nature Forward. We have advocated forest conservation since the passage of the original Forest Conservation Act in 1991. Nature Forward favorably supports SB 526 because the current forest conservation law results in nearly two thirds of forested sites having no replanting requirements. The current bill proposes to fix this. This bill will provide local county governments significant greater flexibility to, per, um, to pursue effective forest protections that meet our county's needs. For example, Nature Forward is part of the Montgomery County Forest Coalition that has been working side by side with council and planning staff to update the county's forest conservation law. Because of greater flexibility in the proposed SB 526, Montgomery County's proposed bill is expected to comply with and complement the updates to the state's Forest Conservation Act. SB 526 is an environmental justice bill. Nature Forward has heard firsthand from disfavored communities across Maryland that they want to see more forests for their families' health and well-being. Protecting our forests now will help to build healthy and climate-resilient communities in Mar Maryland's future. Lastly, this bill will update the forest conservation law to be in line with the latest scientific findings from the Hughes Center report. We respectfully urge this committee to favorably pass and report SB 526. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none. Next up, I've got Michael Wilkins, favorable with amendments. Mr. Wilkins, you on the line? Okay, Mr. Wilkins, you got uh, two minutes. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll try to be brief tonight. It sounds like there have been a lot of um, discussions of amendments to the bills, which uh, we, we appreciate all that hard work and effort and, and teamwork. Um, as noted in our written testimony, um, uh, we had uh, three primary changes we were looking for from Frederick County. Uh, one was uh, to take a look at the qualified conservation, i.e. the forest banking, and expand upon that. Uh, second was the deadlines for the use of fee and lieu funds. And third was the proposed uh, definitions of forest land. And uh, we were hoping to uh, have that definition uh, be a little bit more consistent with other definitions that are found in the Forest Conservation Act. Um, and finally, uh, we were looking to, to make sure that um, Christmas tree farms and orchards would, would not be included in the tree canopy definition. Um, I'm sorry, I, I feel like I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, Mike Wilkins, I'm the Director of Development Review and Planning for Frederick County. Um, and with that, I'd just like to thank you for your consideration of this bill. Um, and we urge you to give this a favorable report with amendments. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Mr. Wilkins? Okay, seeing none. Next up, Victoria Venable. Ms. Venable. Ms. Venable, there you are. Two minutes, Ms. Venable. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify on this bill. Um, my name is Victoria Venable and I am the legislative director of Fre uh, Frederick County Executive Jessica Fitzwater. I wanna first thank the sponsor for her incredible outreach efforts on this bill. We are coming in with a position of favorable with amendments, um, but after a lot of discussions with the sponsor and the advocates, um, I believe we're very close to reaching a fully favorable position. Um, improving state forest conservation programs is actually one of the top priorities of the county executive in this legislative um, session. And our local forest ordinance is actually one of the strongest in the state. And so we're excited to see the state moving forward um, towards that no net loss requirement and some stronger uh, state statewide forest conservation efforts. Um, my colleague, Michael, uh, just spoke about a couple of the amendments that we're looking for. I'll focus on some of the changes we believe should be made um, to the exemptions of qualified conservation or mitigation banking. Um, I understand that this that the bill sponsors and the advocates don't want um, land that is not at risk for development to be included in the forest banking program. We're um, completely understanding of that position. But with the current um, bill language, the protection of priority retention areas would be prohibited. And so we offered some amendments um, that would identify specific target areas that are included in the forest banking program um, as a way to prioritize conservation of high need habitat. Um, 
So this is a policy that Frederick County has adopted and it's been a very successful tool in maximizing the impact of our conservation efforts. And we hope to continue working with the sponsor and the advocates to get that incorporated. Very excited to continue working with them and thank you for your consideration of SB 526. Um, I urge the committee to, to support this bill and move it forward with a favorable report with our amendments. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, any questions for Ms. Venable? Okay, seeing none, we've got two final witnesses, both signed up for information purposes only. Uh, Christine, uh, Kristen uh, today, uh, there you go. Uh, and you've got two minutes, and then after that, Ms. Riser. Okay, so uh, Kristen, you've got two minutes. Thank you, good evening. I'm Kristen Taddy, and I manage the forest conservation programs for Montgomery Planning. Um, I'd like to focus my testimony this evening on three main points. First, as you heard earlier, I just wanna echo the importance that this bill reinstate the option for property owners to permanently protect their existing forest in forest mitigation banks. After the 2021 amendment, Montgomery County quickly sold out of all existing forest bank credits and currently has no credits available. This is because the only alternative planted forest banks are expensive and time consuming to establish. With fee and lieu as the only alternative, we estimate the cost of mitigation in these cases has almost doubled from an average of $33,000 per acre to over $56,000. Without the incentive to protect existing forest, property owners are seeking alternatives, including timber harvesting and development. Protection of existing forests is necessary to achieve no net loss. As the Hughes Center technical study concludes, protection benefits forest conservation and leads to forest expansion. Second, we are concerned that the we were concerned that the proposed additions to the variance section um, could be applied to all existing forests. Of course, requiring a variance anytime forest is impacted would be untenable for review staff. I have not seen the most recent amendments, but from what I understand, this proposed amendment has been removed, and we are grateful for that. Finally, and I believe this is still an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, it's unclear how alternative programs would be evaluated for the baseline level of forest and achieving no net loss. So this bill should make it clear that report data that's provided yearly to DNR, which includes acres planted, cleared, and protected by projects subject to the law, will be used to make these assessments. Local programs should be able to enact their own alternative programs, such as the one before the Montgomery County Council right now. And if it is not achieving no net loss of forest, DNR can rescind the program during the local jurisdiction's biennial review. Thank you. I appreciate your time and the opportunity to testify. Okay, Senator Washington. That's for the question. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask if, if she's there. Yes, <laughs> I'm here. Hello. Hi, hi hello. I, I just, I have a question. So the, the, Hugh, the Hugh study uh, is actually, it's suggesting that you create uh, newly planted forests rather than mitigation. Um, and it seems to, they suggest that it's actually better for water quality. So, um, so, but you're, you, I, I think I heard you say that you prefer not to, you prefer to have the mitigation banks, even though I, that's not right. I would, thank you for the question. No, yeah. that, that's a good question. I would say both are important. We need the incentives to plant forests and grow forest um, in Montgomery County and across the state. And we also need incentives to protect our existing mature forests because it takes a really long time for a planted forest to reach mature status where it's really providing all of those benefits. So I, I really do believe that both are very important, but without the incentives for property owners to protect the mature and healthy forests that we do have in the county, um, we are really restricting, um, you know, what the, we're, we're um, not leaving really any alternative for protecting those forests, and it leaves them vulnerable to other uses while property owners are trying to find economic value on their properties. Right. So, so fee and lieu that would not offer economic value to the to the landowners because the developers are simply paying for the. Those are. Uh, I would say that. Forest mitigation banking, at least in Montgomery County, and mm -hmm. Fee and Lou are separate programs. They both offer value to property owners, absolutely. Okay. Um, mitigation banking can offer it through either planted or protected existing forest banks. Fee and Lou in Montgomery County leads to planted forests, and many of those forests are on private properties. Great. Okay. Thank you. 
Of course. Okay. Thank you. Uh, go, going to our final witness on this bill, we've got uh, Megan Reiser or Reiser. Megan. Okay, you are the final witness on this bill, Senate Bill 526. All right. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Megan Reiser, and I'm a planner with the Prince George's County Planning Department. Uh, we would like to concur with the previous comments provided by Andrea Crooms uh, from our sister agency, the Department of the Environment. Uh, while she spoke on several topics within the bill, I would like to focus on forest banking. As I'm sure you're aware, 2021's House Bill 991 redefined forest banking and removed the option of establishing new banks using the preservation of existing forest for credit, even though twice the amount of existing forest is preserved in banks for the offsite credits required. While the current bill would again allow for the establishment of new preservation banks, it seeks to further restrict the banking to exclude the highest priority forests that the county seeks to protect in perpetuity. What the bill does not account for is that by taking preservation banking off the table for rural areas, landowners will seek other profitable options for use of their land, such as clearing for solar, timber harvesting, and mining. There's major concern with how restrictive this bill will be for establish establishment of new banks and the continued use of existing banks. In our county, securing offsite forest conservation credits from a bank is one of the last options in the development process prior to the issuance of a permit. If banking becomes so restrictive that this will no longer be a viable option, projects would not be able to develop. Such a bill would be a significant impediment to achieving the county's general plan goals for housing and economic development. We urge the sponsors of this bill to further reconsider the restrictions that would be placed on forest conservation banking and allow counties the flexibility needed to implement an effective banking program that will meet no net loss and work within the parameters established by local general plans area sector and master plans, and all environmental plans, such as our green infrastructure plan and our climate action plan. Local flexibility for forest banking is imperative for the balance of economic growth and development within designated areas while promoting environmental stewardship throughout the state. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Okay, th <clears throat> thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> Any questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill uh, 526 and our bill hearings for today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, 